of design. And for the female artifacts, uh, the nature was beyond a design problem to deal with. It was an element that must be protected, cared for, and incorporated into design. As a matter of fact, um, they were uh, inclined towards free forms of the nature in the forms of their produce. Readings that hold text suggest that the spatial context was also very important for the female artifacts. In particular, uh, reflective sociocultural value, values uh, in design, and accord accordingly, uh, strengthened the relationship between the city and the student, and reinforcing the uh, relations at the intersection of the city and society, where a uh, prior resides. Uh, consideration in the design efforts of the female artifacts. It was seen uh, in designs which emphasized cultural values and that patterns and uh, geog um, geometries uh, spe specific uh, to the relevant region, city or country were reflected by the form and occasionally direct forms produced with um, with uh, curvilinear uh, or uh, symmetrical axis and uh, monumental scales. In uh, one shaping their design, female artifacts were also uh, inspired uh, by the built environment. The data collected from the built environment surrounding the uh, construction area was an important resource uh, for artifacts in terms of uh, presenting an original design. The forms produced on the uh, basis of the data collected from, uh, uh, collected from uh, sources uh, seemed uh, to have either placed uh, uh, or uh, conflicted uh, with the environment. Um, a function of consideration, uh, including uh, spatial organization, uh, and providing uh, users with physical and sensory comfort were also attached importance by the selected female artifacts. The female artifacts frequently expressed certain concern, including responding to the uh, physical needs at the optimum level, uh, arousing uh, strong emotions um, in the users or offering uh, surprising spaces. In this context, female artifacts uh, since, uh, to have most uh, strive for creating rich and uh, unusual uh, spatial arrangements uh, and introducing interior organizations uh, that would refer to the minds of the users. In cases where uh, the function was taken as a starting point in the design, the female artifacts uh, mostly uh, resorted uh, to Euclidean forms. The results suggest that uh, female artifacts might, might make maximum um, use of technology in resolving buildings and construction related problems. Technology is an important component of architectural, like science um, and art, played an active role uh, in both the design and uh, production space of construction components such as uh, shells, structure, uh, and material of the selected female artifacts. Uh, in conclusion, it is reasonable to suggest that female artifacts of the 21st century identified nature, social, cultural, and social elements, and the uh, built environment as the prominent sources of design uh, shape their designs with the data from the uh, foregoing and uh, observe the balance between form and function. Uh, in that regards, uh, it should be noted that the uh, approach of female artifacts towards um, design were not dramatically different from that of uh, Frank Gehry, Norman Foster, and Luciano, Evan Colas, uh, and uh, dozens of other uh, male artifacts uh, who are frequently referred to uh, both in the public and academic circles. Therefore, as a conclusion, uh, being a female artifact or a male artifact, it might make any difference in shaping the architectural design in the 21st century with a, a quest for new forms.
think it's for this image. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, and now you are going to presentation for two, 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 two. To Melik. Melik, Melik, the impact of virtual environment in architectural design studio, contents of Turkey. Can you please share for me? Thank you. Here, Dr. Um, I think Melike is not around. That's why, Ms. Melike, we shall, in, the, in this regard, we will have 20 minutes round table. Uh, Professor Dr. Anna and Dr. Professor Dr. Menat, the floor is yours. So, to, have, to be able to handle these 20 minutes of round table, then we will be able to continue with the other articles. So, you, if you have any question from the authors, you okay, will... okay. So, uh, first, I ask to the who is uh, watching us and uh, hearing us if anyone wants to do some question to make some question. Anyone wants to do some question? Uh, so, I have two questions. I don't know if uh, you are hearing me, I don't know. I have one question for Professor Mana, and the, the question is, um, it's a very simple one. Um, congratulations for your paper and for your presentation. And how the community, uh, uh, or perhaps better, how the traditional community uh, deals with those contemporary, um, Con those contemporary design introducing in the mosques, in the traditional mosques. How does the community uh, react to those changes, to those contemporary changes in terms, in terms of architecture, of course, but how they deal with that? How, they, how those, um, those new designs can interfere with the relation of the community with uh, the religion itself or uh, how they react. Yes. Thank you, um, Dr. Anna Paula. It's my pleasure and thank you so much for the-, the pleasure is mine, the pleasure is mine. For the question, actually it's a very nice question and a very smart one because there's always uh, this tension between uh, uh, the, how the mosque is perceived um, for everyone. It, uh, it's, uh, um, it has a, a long minaret and uh, uh, the compilation of several domes. Uh, perhaps it's uh, this kind of uh, engagement with um, a visual image in itself uh, needs to be um, part of the contemporary architect's responsibility to change what is not really in the core of the identity and present new uh, contemporary modes, since actually architecture is about how we fulfill the needs of the current uh, era, not only yes. to regenerate yes, uh, yes. Uh, forms which are not well, either in the core of the religion or in the core of the culture of the people. Uh, that's why I selected the cases from Al uh, and Al um, uh, Mosque Awards, since uh, this uh, is an indicator of excellence. And uh, for the cases of the Al specifically, uh, there has been several layers of participation in the mosques I have analyzed. Um, uh, starting from um, the, uh, uh, the mosque in Mali, where uh, the community itself uses the local material to build and to replaster uh, the mosque uh, uh, every every year in a celebration which bonds the community together. And on another side, from the other side, and uh, for example, Basuna, uh, the interpretation actually uh, of the philosophical approach was not really very um, grasped by the layman. However, um, they felt 
when uh, they show several uh, scholars and architects and there's an international uh, awareness and international awareness of this plot, which is a very, very small and poor village, we sort of feeling that it has created a dynamic um, uh, a dynamic uh, motion in their village so they started appreciating and actually they did not resist on the content uh, on the co uh, contrary they felt that they have something which is new and unique and not like any other place uh, those of course are um, part of the limitations of my research that i cannot go everywhere and to examine the direct uh, impact of uh, the mosque on the com on the community however i think that this uh, type of award is a reflection of excellence and a reflection especially in Abakhain, that the uh, community is engaged in uh, in the typology and in the edition and in the architecture of so i hope i, I answered very good question. answer Thank very so good much. English and very good English. Thank uh, you. Very, so much. very, very good. Very good. Congratulations. Thank you, Thank Mana. You so Thank, Thank you, you, Mana. Thank you. My pleasure. I don't know if uh, uh, there is another. another uh, Isabella Mohammed is, uh, has uh, his uh, hands uh, raised. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Yes, I'm um, 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 Isa Mohammed from Nigeria. Uh, my question goes to Professor Minat again. Uh, uh, interesting topic. I was captivated by her by her presentation. I want to ask: um, in all the five case studies carried out, what is the convergence point? Is there any convergence in all the studies carried out? Is there any unique character that cut across all the five studies carried out? That's my question. Uh, yes, uh, uh, let me uh, check if I uh, understood the question right, uh, uh, Dr. Issa. Uh, uh, you mean that uh, what is the new edition that the cases have uh, expressed? No, I mean, um, you know, you said um, there were different approaches to the uh, design of the mocks and execution. But, you know, mocks, yes, is for Islamic worship. I wanted to find out, is there any one unique character that cut across all the five studies you carried out? Did you get uh, my question? Yeah, yes, uh, I think, no, there is no common uh, character between the five cases. The, the, the unique thing is that every case has uh, reacted in a different way to uh, provide a new uh, ideology. For example, uh, uh, Dar, um, uh, the mosque in Bangladesh, the Rauf, uh, uh, eliminated uh, the main features of the dome and the minaret, while in the Sunnah, they actually preserved this uh, kind of um, uh, feature. However, it was in reinterpreted uh, differently from what we in Egypt or in uh, our context, in the Egyptian context, are um, uh, um, familiar with, if I can express it this way, because it was it wasn't really a typical dome uh, like uh, what we are familiar with in mosques. So in, in Egypt, because actually the mosque, although it has a very strong visual image. However, the interpretations in uh, different nations has been um, different. Yani, for example, uh, in Egypt, uh, you can find the Mamluk era totally different from the Ottoman uh, era as in ratios and proportions. However, the elements are preserved. Um, for example, in uh, uh, the other uh, three uh, or the other two uh, mosques in Bosnia and in uh, Bangladesh uh, and in um, Sarajevo, actually uh, uh, the the form uh, was um, more brutal and the expressions of the domes were totally different with uh, a glass uh, skylight which is an eye shaped in one case in China 15 mosques for example and uh, the expressions were very 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 
different from uh, uh, the westernized, uh, again, identity of the mosque. So actually it was an exercise of how each architect can respond and preserve the identity without uh, repetition. And this was the main aim I wanted to uh, deliver that it's not really important uh, uh, how the mosque would look like or if it's a repetition or not, uh, as long as it provides the layers of spirituality which would help uh, the, the uh, Muslim community to uh, fulfill their uh, worship uh, in, an, in an adequate way. I hope I answered uh, the question. Yes, I, you, did, you did clearly. So it shows that um, our culture, in summary, can really influence the shape of the mosque and the functionality of the mosque. Yes. Uh, very interesting. Thank you very much for the elaborate uh, explanation. Thank you, so much. Thank you, Manat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, I don't know if there is any other questions. Yes, can I ask another question for, for another presenter? I want to ask um, uh, the presenter, Professor Eza Uka, where she uh, studied a study of female architects' approach to design in the first century. I was actually eagerly looking forward to seeing how the female architect think differently from the male architect. But towards the end, I saw that um, she said um, it doesn't make difference whether uh, the approach to design doesn't make much difference between the male and female. Yeah, I was wondering, I, I got deflated at the end when uh, that was mentioned. I don't know if she has more explanation. Uh, if I uh, understand uh, right uh, way, you, uh, you are asking, uh, is there any differences between men and women architects? Yes, yes. Yes, uh, actually there are no differences uh, who are men or women architects. Uh, actually, uh, this is important uh, that uh, how kind of uh, approaches uh, to the design. Uh, for example, Norman Foster, Ranzo, Piano, Rampolas, or Daniel Lebeskind. Uh, it doesn't matter, uh, Elizabeth Wheeler, Zaha Hadid, uh, or uh, Kimball uh, Dowell. Uh, this is important that uh, uh, how they uh, are focused. Uh, for example, uh, according to the uh, to our uh, data, uh, most of the women architects uh, looking at uh, the geography, biotic uh, factors, abiotic factors, uh, uh, or uh, maybe ge geography. Uh, they are also use the analogy uh, that come from the uh, geography or uh, nature. Uh, secondly, uh, they are uh, uh, using the uh, social factors, uh, their uh, valuables, their communities values, or something. <laughs> okay, what I mean was that, uh, there is no differences, uh, man or uh, woman. Uh, 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 the important uh, thing is that where architects uh, feed uh, their uh, emotions. That's all. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, anyone, more questions? Can I have a question, please? Uh, the, the title of, uh, of the mosque is very interesting. Uh, I wish that uh, we, uh, we reach a framework in the environment. Uh, can you speak a little bit? Uh, uh, Loud. Can you speak a little bit loud, please? I'm not hearing very, very well. Uh, about the, the, the ah, topic okay. of, the, of the mosque design. Can you hear me now? 
about the, the topic of the design of the mosque. I think we need to develop a framework uh, to increase environmental performance of the existing uh, mosque, conserve use of energy, especially uh, in cooling and ventilation, uh, which needs the global approach concerning the mitigation measures of climate change. This is, uh, is the first uh, uh, issue. The second issue, uh, uh, I think that um, there is a relationship between the design of the mosque, uh, in existing uh, contemporary mosque, and the primary phase of the design. So I want uh, Professor Benatalla uh, to can a little more specific about this topic. I'm I'm not hearing. Yeah. Uh, um, let me repeat the questions, uh, if I may, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, the first question was related to the uh, environmental role of the of the mosque design um, to respond to the uh, climate. Uh, Yes, is this clear? And, uh, and the other one uh, was related to the architect's signature. If, if I got your uh, um, question. Yes, the second, the, the, the cycle of design phase, and the life cycle of the, of the mosque as a whole. And it's the life cycle phase. of the mosque? Yes, especially the design phase and its impact on the footprint of Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. The design process itself. If this is um, this was the question, uh, uh, perhaps uh, yes. The climatic uh, responses are extremely important, especially in the area of sustainable uh, approaches in architecture. And uh, however, it was not really the focus of my paper uh, this time because if I would um, uh, analyze the climatic impacts, I need to go and uh, actually conduct uh, more uh, quantitative, a qualitative, uh, sorry, a quantitative uh, approach related to the um, um, how the um, mosque operates. And actually, uh, for Basuna Mosque, there is a, a study already uh, conducted on uh, this approach. Um, however, I, the, the, you know, this was not really uh, my my concern, uh, although it has been uh, already uh, uh, fulfilled in the cases uh, studied for uh, for Dora, also uh, the climatic, uh, because of the insulation of the mosques through the different layers of uh, bricks and uh, the thick walls, it was uh, actually fulfilled. In uh, the Western uh, uh, cases, uh, it was okay because actually needed more sunlight uh, for the climatic uh, considerations, and it was blended uh, the other cases, if you can read the paper, uh, it was blended uh, perfectly with nature. Uh, for the law, for the process of the design, um, I can send you uh, the uh, uh, what I have for uh, the five mosques because actually, yes, uh, it's very important that uh, the five cases have been uh, con uh, yeah, uh, really contextual uh, designs. Uh, there um, in Basuna, uh, the architect was inspired by uh, an old home in the city, on, oh, sorry, in the village. And this was the initial point of the start of reinterpreting the stalactites in uh, the dome and in uh, the member. Uh, for um, there's all, always one point of initiation of the idea. However, it, the main uh, gathering or the main uh, umbrella which conducted which uh, gathered all the five mosques was that uh, they wished to produce a different um, um, a different uh, contemporary approach rather than repeating the historicism and the some of uh, uh, the elements of uh, architecture which are not really rooted in uh, the communities or in the context they are located. So it's a very big story, yes, and we have, of course, some limitations and, you know, it's not really uh, always a floor, but I, I, I really agree with you that perhaps in the next uh, paper, we can shed light on this aspect as well. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. So thank you very much again. Uh, more questions? More questions to Manat. Manat, <laughs> you are. <laughs> more questions? So, uh, if there is no more questions. Yes, I think we can proceed to the second, to the other yes, uh, presentation. Uh, I, I, 
I am a little bit lost, Mana. Please help me because you are now. Yeah. I have you okay. now. Is the disclosing devices okay. or formal okay. organization? Disclosing devices. Uh, can you share for me? Yes. Uh, Dr. Karaj, <laughs> would you like me to share? Uh... If, if, if you can, I appreciate. Yes. Thank yes. you. Yes, so yes. it would be perfect if you could manage. Uh, is the screen shared already? Yes. Uh, sorry, but it's not the. Uh, ah, yes, thank you. I think there we can't hear Dr. Minat. There is no sound. Uh, if you could manage to play it again or Sinem Chima, Dr. Sinem Chima. I'm sorry? Uh, there is no sound uh, in the presentation. So, dear participants, my name is Sinem Chima. Uh, uh, there's no sound. So now, please share that screen. In this presentation, I will mainly discuss the contribution of architectural precedents on design thinking. I will yes. present different modes of learning from precedents within the axis of understanding and interpretation. And I will introduce a method of creating. So if you don't mind, I will share uh, the next one. Uh, yes. You can analysis that emphasizes the ability of analysis to relate to current design tasks. I will discuss the possibilities and capabilities of creative analysis through student work studied in a course conducted by me at Middle East Technical University Department of Architecture. Let us start with the basics. Precedent is defined as an earlier action, situation, or decision that is regarded as an example or guide to be considered in subsequent similar circumstances. Precedents are the preceding examples that can be models and references for further decisions. They constitute the very culture of a discipline as the expression of transformation and continuity of body of knowledge. For understanding the significance of precedence in a discipline, law is an ideal example. In law, precedent refers to a court decision that is considered as authority for deciding subsequent cases. If there is a precedent for an action or event, it has happened before, and this can be regard regarded as an argument for doing it again. Precedents are examined, their relation with current situation is found, and current, current decisions are made in relation to that precedent. Similar to law, the precedent has indispensable quality in chess game. Master chess players study old games and play the moves and add those moves into their repertoire. They use this knowledge to understand the rival's moves. As the master player has power on her or his repertoire, she or he can analyze the rival's moves in the soonest time and lead the game. 
When it comes to architecture, the contribution of the past to design practice becomes a critical issue. As the field of architecture is transformed through changing conditions, the connection between precedence and the contemporary design is becoming hard to articulate. The tools of the digitalization are transforming the design and construction process, and different construction techniques and materials are enabling new forms to emerge. The effort to adapt to ever-changing conditions seem to grow the gap between past and present and weaken the bond that architecture can constitute with precedence. This issue needs to be discussed, especially in architectural design education. On one hand, there is the accumulated knowledge that constitutes the architectural culture, a tradition which holds countless solutions, and on the other, the circumstances that seemingly making them irrelevant. How can we keep our relation with precedence alive within such dualistic circumstances? How can precedence contribute to the formation of design knowledge? It is not wrong to assert that our way of learning from the past is related to the way we perceive and study it. In this diagram, I introduce an axis created within the pose of understanding and interpreting precedence. Different modes of analysis oscillate between the aims of merely understanding and merely interpreting. On the left pole takes place the aim of understanding without an intention of interpreting it. This way of analysis is descriptive. It aims at discovering already existing reality coded in precedence. It studies certain aspects of the precedent without an aim to relate it with design. It includes analytical processes that emphasize program, site, and special organization. This way of analysis is commonly what we encounter in case studies that students present before the design process in design studios. On the right pole takes place the aim of interpreting or interpretation without an intention of understanding. This extreme mode of misreading of precedent is not about deciphering knowledge lying between the lying beneath the precedent. It denies causal links. It is interested in the generation of knowledge through endless interpretation. Here, the precedent is a tool, an instrument. Knowledge of the precedent is made rather than found. Both extremes have their positive and negative aspects. Aim of understanding is important. However, it can result as a passive or descriptive analysis, which lacks contribution to design thinking. This is the case where architecture students suffer from learning from past works, or they do not have thinking tools to create viable design principles from their analysis. An intention of interpreting precedents in a way to instrumentalize them may result in creative and innovative design ideas, yet it lacks the process of understanding and learning from the precedent. In between the axis of understanding and interpretation, an area can be defined which includes the aspects of both understanding and interpretation. This area, which I name as creative analysis of precedent, is concerned with approaching an architectural precedent with our own current questions. It includes the understanding of the precedent, yet it aims to discover or disclose design principles from that attempt. This mode of creative analysis aims to be operational rather than perceived and descriptive. At the same time, it respects the precedent and tries to, tries to avoid instrumentalization of the precedent, as we see in extreme misreading of the precedent. The possibilities and capabilities of creative analysis are discussed through student work studied in a course at Middle East Technical University Department of Architecture. The course discusses various levels of relationship inherent in architectural form and it focuses on analysis of design devices and strategies as practiced in architectural precedents. Questioning the potential and capacity of such analysis to apply to current design tasks, the course emphasizes the relevance of comprehending architectural precedents for contemporary formal explorations. 
Typical steps of creative analysis as performed in this course are described as step one, getting the proper information about the precedent. This step comprises a comprehensive investigation, including written text, documentaries, and previous analysis. It aims to understand the project in its context. Step two, analysis of the special organizational system. This step is concerned with the interpretation of program elements in terms of special qualities, and it discusses the qualities and performance of the special organizational system. These two steps constitute the understanding phase of analysis. Let us see the realization of these two steps of analysis in a student work. Project analyzed on this slide is Le Corbusier's Cruchet House. Step three, discussion of findings in terms of their capacities as design devices. The capacity of the design device to be applied to new design situations is questioned. This closed design device is given a name. This step actually forms a creative and interpretive part of the analysis. It aims at discovering or disclosing design principles that can be adapted to new design tasks. The design principles are given name such as diagonalization, curtaining, wrapping, coating, stretching, dualizing, binding dichotomies, plus and cluster organization. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for your interesting presentation. Sorry, uh, related to our presentation. Um, not. Shall we go to the third one, which is the last, and we will be able to continue How is, uh, the session? Um, Sir Helena, we ask, and Dr. Ahmad Kamal and Dr. Azar Hadi will present their paper with the title of uh, Determination Model of the Land Value in the Surrounding Area of HSR. Uh, let uh, me... Dr. Evering, right now? Mm -hmm. Architectural Design Studio, right? Uh, uh, the relation between the architecture, architecture and, and the biological. architecture of Universitas of Indonesia. Today, I will present my research literature with the title Literature Review Determinant Model of Land Value in the Surrounding Area of the HSR Karawang Station. The first thing I will explain the issue of my research when the urban agglomeration caused the regional economic growth, which has a broad impact on the spatial configuration of the city and has a potential change of urban price. In the additional, the construction of Kereta Cepat Jakarta Bandung, uh, connection of Jakarta Bandung in a short time. One of the stations located between Bekasi and Karawang Regencies will also impact the development of the Hirosh, surrounding sorry, area uh, and will be increase the, the length of the price. Sorry, it's not, uh, yes, it's not the presentation. The other one is reinventing the relation, uh, the relationship between architecture, biology, and human experience by Mur uh, Shana Madhuri. Yes. Uh, and I really apologize. I was not. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's, it's always confusing. So now it, it is uh, now you are going to see which presentation architectural uh, architectural design studio. Uh, I think this the more this one yes. Uh, uh, yes, in, this is the correct reinventing the relationship between architecture, biology, hello, and human experience. Perfect. Thank you. So this is Murchana Maturi, and the title of my research is uh, Reinventing the Relationship Between Architecture, Biology, and Human Experience. Biology. We all know it is the study of living organisms, their morphology, physiology, anatomy, origin, etc. Architecture, on the other hand, according to dictionary, means the art or science of building. It includes planning, designing, as well as construction. 
And finally, human experience refers to the impact of space on people's mood, comfort, behavior, and interactions. According to Lawrence and Lowe, people change their behavior to fit into the physical environment, which means human build shelters, which at the same time take part in employing their own behaviors. This is where former prime minister of UK, Winston Churchill's statement, we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us, come into use. Now, according to National Human Activity Pattern Survey, people spend 90% of their time indoors. On the other hand, UN predicts that 68% of the world population will live in urban settings by the year 2050. With these data, concerns regarding the built environment develops. Despite the consistency of technological su uh, success in the uh, field of architecture, there still exist uh, different overlooked areas. Though various studies focus on the building function, performance, and durability, human response to built environment is rarely analyzed in most cases. Uh, we have to understand that building facilitates the functional, aesthetic, and physiological growth of our body. So reaction and response of human body at, uh, in the build space should be brought into discussion to ensure logical design decision. So the aim of this research is to number one, to analyze the approach of uh, the symbiosis between biology, architecture, and human experience. And number two, explore the promising results of this integration uh, for ensuring uh, future well-being of people and uh, quality design. Turning now our attention to the research strategy, I focus on three main uh, points, human biology, biology to write design inspiration, and the integration of these two, which helped me develop the structure of the study. Starting with the theory of biological perspective and design, we proceed to the next theories, um, you know, existing theories, literature review, study of some scientific revelations to finally our discussion and analytical review. Let's move on to uh, biological perspective and uh, design to understand the human preferential bias. The habitat theory has been proved to be the most important one. It says uh, that humans have a bias on certain landscape, often uh, compared to savanna. Besides, in a study of 2018, it is stated that pattern recognition process takes place in a subconscious level and it forms the sense of beauty and uh, people's aesthetic perception. While for explaining the relationship between body and physical environment, research says that our sense of balance is controlled by our surrounding environments by a certain extent and slight environmental disruption can cause negative effect on our behavior. However, in this technological era, architects focus on ageless perfection in design without considering the relationship between the um, individual and the environment. But this assessment of biological inspired designs and biological functions of human is a must. If you now look at the prevailing bio-inspired design concepts, the most popular ones are biomimetic or biomimicry, bioonimetics, biomorphic, biophilic, and bionics. Besides this, zoomorphic, organic design, etc., are often appreciated as bio-inspired designs. Now, biophilia and bioonimetics uh, study nature and natural elements to find design solutions, whereas bionic studies the same with the purpose to analyze technical usability. Biophilic design, on the other hand, began long before uh, about 600 BCE. Uh, we all know about the concept of hanging gardens of Babylon. Uh, it aims the benefit of uh, human nature relationship. Last but not the least, uh, biomorphic uh, focuses uh, more on biological forms and symbols during the design process. However, we can see that bio design is now limited to uh, to uh, imitation, on imitation or following technical usability, though this uh, brings some solutions to the table, exclusion of human biological response uh, affects society to a great extent. So the question remains, what are the consequences of not considering spatial experience and biological response in design? To explain this, uh, we now move on to our literature survey. We see that industrial and post-industrial uh, design looks like machine houses with homogeneous characters. The big boxy buildings and the skyline of a developing country shows this. Also, the imposition of uh, ready-made uh, technical solution caused destruction of spatial identity of cities. Architects now replace real-world requirements with computer-based images to produce fabricative reality. 
all this self-imposed separation from building direct uh, from from biological directives is causing and will keep on causing irrational construction habits so what should be done to reduce such occurrence according to demchuk post industrial habitation uh, habitat uh, design should have uh, human freedom. For this, architects need to evaluate human biological needs considering their environmental interactions, behaviors, actions, emotion, emotional responses, and many more. Fortunately, um, various experimental studies observing brain activities and human behavior give us hope to measure uh, human built environmental relationship. This continuation of uh, such research is very important now. Scientific revelations about such research will be discussed now. Firstly, brain activity can now uh, measure okay, can be measured with uh, EEG, fMRI, PET, etc. There are branches like neuroaesthetics and uh, neuroarchitecture that studies brain activities within built structure. A recent study showing a brain's region amygdala's um, analysis, where it shows that uh, this fear processing unit remains more active for sharp objects than curved ones. Uh, besides, another a researcher found out that physical activity influences brain activity, ultimately affecting academic performance. Such findings have been found in case of human sensory perception too. Uh, form, geometry, position, distance, material, uh, surface, skin, etc., can create positive and negative sensations. It has been found in a research that music and scent in a gift shop can influence consumer sat satisfaction as well as visits to this place. Another example show uh, veterans memorials design. Uh, it shows that um, texture rich surface uh, experiences for uh, the human body can actually help them show their uh, emotions and um, their expression. Emotional uh, experience can now be uh, detected by EQ radio with the help of measuring breathing and heart rhythms. According to various research, facial and vocal expressions is used to detect emotion. This conscious and unconscious emotional experience of human beings need to be measured in different architectural environments to uh, assure human well-being. Moving on to behavioral reaction, we can see that psychologist Kurt Levin's formula, B equals to function PE, includes function of both individual and environment. Today, attention, stress, memory, et cetera, can be determined by EEG, APMG, e, uh, GSR, et cetera. Among the, um, among the few experiments conducted in this field, Mayor Levy's observation on how low ceiling rooms cause uh, concrete, uh, low ceiling rooms ca cause concrete uh, thinking and high uh, ceiling rooms can ca cause abstract thinking is remarkable. These experiments uh, should be conducted more often to analyze behavioral choice, judgments, and intentions of human beings. According to Bernard Shumi, body do, uh, bodies do not move in space, but uh, generate space produced by their movements. Mapping of human activities is essential to detect efficient uh, or unused spaces. This can help in furniture de uh, design, lighting design, and others as well. Circulation diagram can also be used to see the common spatial behavior of humans. Space syntax now observe system of uh, movement pattern while kinex focus on uh, human motion voice and facial uh, expression in this regard lastly circadian rhythm is used measured by uh, usually measured by um, actic raphi um, but is also evaluated through analyzing poor body temperature melatonin levels oxygen levels etc it has been found in experiments that grass textures can regulate circadian rhythm in a positive way. So walking barefoot on grass texture is good for health. Experiments also reveal reduced light levels at night, improved sleep and weight gain uh, for preterm uh, infants. Uh, besides uh, depression, sleep, etc., can be controlled by it. Among the other medical measurements, uh, heart rate, breathing rate, um, hormonal suppression, respiration, blood pressure, galvanic skin response has been found to be effective to measure human conditions in a given environment. Based on my findings, question arise how designers should respond to the emergency to recognize the diversity of this bodily needs. The observed ways or methods to minimize the existing issues are post-occupancy evolution, 
which has traditionally considered questionnaire, one-to-one -one interviews, field and photographic surveys, etc. Another method uh, of experimenting in control testing settings should be able to determine daylight, circulation problems, patial openness, accessibility, etc. Both building information modeling and virtual reality are now being uh, able to um, imitate and modify existing architectural settings. Besides other experiments discussed in the previous section, uh, such as um, GSR, AVMG, EEG, etc., can be used to measure bodily responses of people. So what should be done to mitigate this uh, building and body gap? Firstly, tested design processes should be implemented in design. Secondly, opportunities of uh, bio-inspired design should be uh, considered, uh, considered as well as expanded. Thirdly, impulsiveness should be allowed with overlooking uh, restrictions in design. Also, identification of the diversity of body uh, schemata is important. Together, they uh, conclude that designers should consider the holistic approach to span and combine the spheres of architecture, biology, and spatial experience. In conclusion, let me sum up my main points. Architectural misconducts implementing um, architectural misconducts uh, implementing build forms and isolated objects should be identified and discouraged. It is high time to expand the field of bioarchitecture uh, bio by re-examining -ex of the opportunities, combining spatial experience in the development of design regulations. Human experience and response um, allows a clear dialogue between architecture and biology, so a separate approach to assure architectural soundness and uh, human health should uh, integrate architecture, biology, and spatial experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Muchana. And uh, I think now it's uh, uh, the Green Mosque, right? Transition to sustainability, eco-friendly features. Dr. Osman, is that right? Yes, it's right. A little bit lost in the sequence. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, sorry, dear Dr. Anna. The, Dr. Raina will have live presentation. Then you will be able to have your own round table. So we have uh, enough time, uh, if you don't mind. Now the floor is uh, with Dr. Raina. After that, you will have uh, your own round table. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. So now it's. Uh, Dr. Osman, right? Exactly. Okay. And and after the four round tables, uh, okay. Uh, can you can you please share for me? <laughs> I think with Dr. Raina uh, shared. If she's available, she can start. Uh, okay. Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Rania Abdurrahman Osman. Uh, uh, I'm assistant professor at University of Bahri, uh, College of Engineering and Architecture, Department of Architecture in Sudan. Uh, I'm uh, presenting today a suggested renovation project for a mosque. And my paper titled The Green Mosque Transition to Sustainable Eco-Friendly Features. So my paper will present a case study of a suggested renovation project for a mosque in Khartoum, Sudan, built in 2009. And the aim of this study is to present the numerical prediction and validate those numerical prediction and evaluate the energy use and indoor climate for the building before and after the renovation. Uh, in addition to that, I'm giving a to integrate a solar photovoltaic system in the building envelope. So the, uh, uh, the a comprehensive measurement was uh, done for the building and uh, validation of the model result. Uh, and the, the main result of my research actually that um, suggested renovation project has resulted in 23% reduction in energy demand for the energy consumption in that mosque. And 38% uh, of uh, solar uh, 
of the energy consumption was covered by the solar energy. So at the beginning, as we all know, the building are a major source of demand. Uh, building consume over 40% of the total energy in, uh, as uh, we can see in literature review, 12% and 18% by commercial uh, buildings and the public buildings, and the, the rest is residential. Uh, consumption profile was varied, but uh, cooling, heating, and lighting are the major source of uh, uh, energy consumption in buildings. Uh, so in most lighting and space cooling in most in Sudan are the major elements of energy consumption. As we can see in this study in the literature review uh, done by the U.S. Department of Energy in collaboration with the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineering, we can see that the reducing energy consumption by 0.5 quadrillion BTU will give a reduction of uh, the carbon dioxide by 3% and give saving uh, of approximately $4 billion uh, per year back in the homeowner pocket. So the main objective of this study and the main goal is to re renovate that most to become one of the first development in Sudan to be low energy building. And to achieve this, the energy strategy used in my research, uh, it's used combination of energy efficiency in building as well as strategy to generate renewable energy by using photovoltaic panels integrated in the building envelope. Uh, so it has two main steps. Step number one is to increase the energy efficiency of the building itself by uh, using efficient building construction, efficient system and appliances and other process. Uh, step number two, address the remaining needs with on-site renewable energy generation. And as I said, it was integrated in the MOS envelope itself. So the methodology of my research and to reach the aim stated before the research apply a technique called generate and test. Uh, where I make the, the researcher make the idea under test to perform them using the Autodesk Ecotic Analysis software uh, as a simulation. I have a set of uh, parameters uh, to be tested. So I'm starting with the first parameter and then putting some option or proposal which most likely uh, reduce the energy consumption in that building. Uh, then I'm running the simulation, uh, uh, getting the simulation uh, report, the energy performance evaluation report. And then from that report, analyzing the data and uh, deny or approve the best, uh, the best proposal and deny the rest of the option. Uh, so after approving the, the best proposal, going to the, to the second parameter, doing the same, following the same process of getting some option proposal, simulation analysis, and then at the end, approving the best proposal in each parameter lead to the energy model or the best energy model of that most, and at the end, giving the recommendation. So the building energy simulation is starting with my existing situation of that uh, most, uh, giving all the uh, comprehensive measurement, uh, collecting the data, the measurements of that uh, most, and then building that 3D model in the software simulation, running the simulation process, getting the energy performance evaluation. So mainly it has four main steps to be followed. Uh, the existing situation and the parameters I tested in this uh, research, it uh, consists of the HVAC, uh, the heat uh, ventilation and air conditioning, the lighting of the most and integrating the solar energy. So the, the first column is giving me the design parameter tested in HVAC system on testing the thermal insulation of the walls and roofs in the moss. I'm um, also testing the U value of the glass used in that uh, moss. For the lighting, I'm, uh, I'm trying to, to replace the lights uh, used, uh, the, pulp, the pulp type. And the third one, the solar energy where I added uh, as I said before, some photovoltaic cells in the northern uh, elevation, the eastern elevation, and also I'm adding 200 square meter 
of solar photovoltaic cells uh, on the roof. So for the first uh, design parameter, the thermal in insulation, the existing situation has only one layer of insul thermal insulation. Um, uh, proposed uh, the two, two layers, and the second proposal were giving the two layers inside and one layer in the exterior walls with the nanotechnology insulation. The third option was having two layers in the exterior walls. The U value, um, uh, the, the, the percentage of opening to the solid walls is uh, 34%. So the U value for the existing glass is 0.85. I'm changing this U value and uh, fixing the percentage at 34% of opening with 0.45 U value at the option number one, 0.55 option number two, 0.65 option number three. And uh, the bulb type used now is halogen bulb and fluorescent. Uh, I'm replacing those with the fluorescent at the first option with compacted fluorescent second option and the last option is with the LED part. Uh, now I'm running the simulation after I'm building that uh, mosque in 3D model with all the specifications running the simulation and getting of course the, the result. So uh, in my result, the internal temperature in the interior space of that mosque uh, showed that the, the, or it was observed that the internal temperature in the warm period of the uh, di different direction at mi from midnight until 12 noon, where the difference between the temperature throughout the day does not exceed the Celsius uh, degree. Uh, and it was having the, the reaching the maximum temperature at 5 p.m. and the lowest temperature at 5 uh, a.m. Uh, and uh, second, the study of the energy production or energy efficiency of the solar energy system integrated to that most envelope. Uh, so this shows that the, the generation value of the solar rad radiation, that the percentage in each of the four orientation alternatives show that the optimal orientation uh, for obtaining the highest percentage of solar energy generation is the northern direction of the building. And the eastern orientation follows by 3% difference, uh, followed by the western orientation, while the south orientation has the lowest generation rate, uh, which represents 5% only. So uh, also one of my results in the simulation process that the effectiveness of the natural lighting in the mosque uh, which is uh, in different orientation show the amount of uh, lighting inside the space. And um, it actually shows that 34% of the opening is low and there's still the, the, the lighting amount inside the building is not uh, of optimal uh, use. The uh, one of the, the also the simulation result for the second design parameter, which is the ther thermal in insulation. Uh, the researcher noticed that the second alternative was the lowest temperature in the warm season with a slight difference of only one degree Celsius, while the worst was option number two with the, the uh, one layer of uh, thermal insulation. The third design parameter, which is the U value for the glass of the opening. Um, uh, as we all uh, know, one of the most important component of the building envelope is the opening. So the designer have to consider the use of glass with good thermal property. This is determined by the U value and other factor of the glass itself and using single glass or double glass. So we are testing the U value and showing that the option which uh, has the U value of point three, five was the best for the for this research. And the, the fourth design parameter, which is the bulb type, uh, we replaced, as I said before, we have a halogen bulb, we replaced it with the fluorescent first, and then we replaced it with a compacted one, and we replaced it with the LED, which shows that uh, in uh, this table, show the energy consumption for each of the options. Um, re, uh, in comparison with the existing situation. The existing situation, we have 252 uh, watt per hour consumed by the lighting system. And uh, we can see that the third option was having the less with the LED part. So fourth design parameter, also we have some solution for solar energy. 
Uh, there are additional solutions worthy to experimentation, including additional solar cells to the roof, where we have 900 square meters available. We added in this research 200 square meters of the photovoltaic solar system. Uh, the expected uh, power to be added is uh, 22 kilowatts. And yes, uh, finally, the recommendation to modify the current situation to improve the energy consumption will be given in this table. Uh, in each of uh, one of my design parameters I tested, we have uh, the first column, the existing situation, the specification of the existing situation. And the last column, we have the modified ideal model specification according to the result. So the approved, the, uh, the approved option, uh, as I explained before, was uh, uh, approved as to be implemented to the mosque. So for the HVAC system, we have the insulation of uh, the thermal, uh, two layers of thermal insulation in the interior wall and using the nanotechnology in the exterior wall. The, the second design parameter, the U value with 0.35 was approved the bulb type with the LED, the additional option for the solar, integrating the solar cells, uh, the first option of uh, 56 meters square for the northern elevation, in addition to that, the 200 square meter on the, on the roof. So to conclude my, uh, my paper, uh, this uh, solar energy and building integration technology has a broad application prospect. Uh, using simulation program will play a significant role in applying uh, the use of solar energy in an efficient way. In the case shown for uh, the mosque as I uh, represented in Sudan, the researcher was able to achieve, as I said before, 38% uh, of energy con consumption to be covered by solar energy and a reduction or reduce the current energy consumption by 23%. Uh, so, as we said, finding an accurate and efficient way to model and simulate the building to evaluate the energy consumption uh, uh, is uh, of optimist importance. And uh, of course, many uh, future area can be taken with this model. Uh, use of the real data should be used to refine the assumptions made and parameters calculation performed. Uh, yes, thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you uh, very much, Muchana. I don't know. Are you, I think you are seeing you, you are still seeing you. Okay. Um, I think you have now our four round uh, table, four round table. I don't know if you want to make any question about the last previous presentations. No? I still, I'm still visualizing the, the screen of Rania, Osman, Rania, is that so? Rania, yes, Rania. Rania. Ah, sorry, 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 Rania. But what's happening? I don't know because you are seeing, you are still seeing your, ah, okay. I think it's okay now. So uh, I don't know if you have any questions uh, for all the participants in this uh, fantastic section session. If you have any questions, please. No, nope. so uh, I, I, I have just a, 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 a one question to Dr. Professor Sinem about education. Um, I don't know if you are listening to me. Yes, I think. Oh, hello, I am here. Hello, hello, hello. When, when it's, it's, a, it's just a curious, uh, it's just a curiosity. When you, you, you speak about the presidents, uh, you take them for granted, or, or, or I mean, 
there is any, they are, they are um, a stable question, they are questionable, or they are already a settlement, they are the precedents. Or you or they or they are you consider or the students consider to evaluate the precedents themselves, or they are fixed, they are taking take for granted. Uh, I'm, think, not, I'm not sure if you understand. I think that I got your question. Uh, yes, this was the actually core of my presentation. The precedent can be taken as it is, and it, it there can be a, just an aim for just understanding it within its context. Or there can be another attitude which aims just to interpret it or just to use it as a tool for design purposes. Actually, my point was to um, focus on a, uh, to define a position in between them, trying to understand them. I mean, within a, we can call it an hermeneutic uh, understanding uh, process. First, we try to understand it, but then we will try to disclose some viable current design principles from then. So there is a process of interpretation, evaluation, as you mean it, but there is an aim of understanding it as well. Very so well. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sinem. Thank you very Thank much. You. And uh, just uh, not a question, but just a, a small comment uh, uh, to Muchana and uh, concerning biology. I have uh, I, I, I have a lot of uh, students doing their uh, doctoral thesis and they, they like uh, this, uh, this kind of subjects. And uh, I, there is something that, that I'm, I'm always saying to them, be careful because when, you make, when we make comparisons between uh, biology or biology and architecture, cinema and architecture, theater and architecture, dancing and architecture, you have to be aware that you have to have a, 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 a consistent knowledge of that previous uh, discipline, right? to speak about. And biology is uh, it's very complex. It's, very, it's a complex area, so sometimes it's difficult to compare or to make uh, comparisons between something so scientific, so so scientific like biology, and our our discipline. I don't know if uh, it's not a question. It's a it's a comment. It's a comment. So if uh, um, I don't know if there is any any other questions. Well Can I ask our announcement? Yes, sure. Yes, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Alkama. Professor, uh, yes. Alkama from Algeria. Can I ask uh, Rania uh, Osman one question from the renovation of the Green Mosque in Sudan? Yes, go ahead, please, Professor Ockham. Ah, still, still, <laughs> still, still not. I'm, I'm very sorry to, to interrupt you, but uh, perhaps I have, I have to leave. I have to leave. I have, a, I have a, a compromise now, and uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, just before you, you answer. Please let me, let me conclude with you. And because I have really to leave, I have, I have really to leave. And I just want to thank you. Thank you very, very much for your participation. And it's, it was a, a tomorrow, I, a, a, tomorrow I will be here again watching the other sessions, but now I really have to leave. Um, I want to thank you very much, Professor Urask. I, I don't know if you say, it's Urask, you say Urask, Urask, Urask. And Professor Nemat, Menat for the uh, precious help that you give me, gave me here with the links. 
<laughs> and and uh, thank you so and much. Stream sharing. Thank you. It's and, my pleasure. And really to 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 congratulate um, all the participants with their representations. Um, that we hope. All of we hope then they can contribute behind. Sorry, 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 sorry. That they can they can contribute they can contribute even even a little bit for uh, doing and understanding better uh, architecture and uh, education. So I'm really very thankful for you all, and I have to go. I have to go. Thank you, thank you, Professor Anna, you and, and uh, it's a pleasure sharing this uh, uh, session with you and hearing all uh, the presentations and listening to the very, very interesting uh, uh, topics and uh, ideas. If you would uh, allow me to um, uh, let uh, the Professor Alkama uh, uh, proceed with the, um, with his question, and I appreciate. We have, I appreciate. I appreciate. Yes, we have five minutes for left for this uh, final roundtable, and then we can um, leave, and um, the next session can start. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. And see you, see you soon. Thank you very much for you all. Bye. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you very much. Professor Akama? Yes. yes. I want to ask, I want to ask uh, uh, Professor Osman if we can uh, uh, just uh, uh, discuss uh, 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 his paper for uh, when we, when we uh, uh, provide the uh, renovation with the uh, Playing a, a green space and uh, uh, water uh, with a system cooling in this uh, green mosque. What, what the uh, result? If uh, if uh, she can uh, uh, tell us, uh, we can uh, adjust the green space and the uh, system cooling water. My question is. Okay, Professor, if I got your question, uh, you are asking if we can use the same uh, strategy, the same process of simulation yes. uh, yes. to test the, uh, also the thermal uh, or the, the thermal you mean for the green area? Yes. Yes, of course, yes, we can use the same, same strategy, generate the, the methodology of generate and test and testing th those options uh, in uh, ecotech analysis software and getting the 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 and, and the system water cooling the water cooling also yes yes thanks Welcome. thank you everyone and it was a pleasure having you uh, i will leave uh, the floor to professor muhammad uh, for the next session and uh, all my best wishes for everyone
Tak. No. Just realized that the session uh, we are waiting for Dr. Islam. Uh, Dr. Islam El Kunaymi for Dr. Selma Saruri, if she's available. Session A for session okay. Dr. Sorry, dear Professor Dr. Mehmet Dikinci, um, I apologize for the questions. The, the floor is your floor is yours. You may uh, start your session, and if it is finished, you, you please uh, you will be able to transfer uh, to the other session chairs. In, in case if it was not around, it would be perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on time. Uh, there is one minute. We are waiting. Ah, we have one minute. Sorry. Exactly. Yes, hello, hello everyone. Uh, all of us are here. Uh, I'll check. And Cengiz Ipek, Dr. Cengiz Ipek is here. And Dr. Bayram Er Berna Yıldız. And Sezgi, dear Sezgi Haleloğlu. Yes, I'm here. Uh, thank you. Uh, Maryam Ahmed. Maryam Ahmed is here, I uh, see. And uh, Mohammed Said. Mohammed Said isn't here. First of all, I uh, heard uh, two uh, participants and uh, But we can start. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I am from uh, Malatya, and but uh, I live in Alanya. Uh, I am uh, Alanya Alaaddin Kekubet University. My department is civil uh, engineering, and uh, uh, my study area are uh, extreme events, flood and uh, drought. Uh, both of them are, are related to uh, water, uh, excessive water, shortage water, uh, as you know, and related to uh, last one uh, presentation in uh, uh, our tables, five tables, there are five tables uh, and today. Uh, so I see Genghis uh, teacher, dear Genghis, uh, Associated Professor, uh, hello, uh, welcome to our uh, conference. Hello, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you give us opportunity to uh, give a session and presentation. Also, we can load it uh, YouTube, uh, and also we can see how it's going on. Uh, uh, I can start. Uh with your presentation. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. My presentation will be on this investigation 
of wind induced pressure distribution and various rule forms using numerical methods. My presentation contents will be introduction, material methods, study area, design procedure and instruction, computational fluid dynamics method, general information of CFD code, model setup result, conclusion references. Introduction, climate change is more severe global problem humanity faces in our age and will affect the future of humanity. The increase in extreme climate in resulting from the climate change is now configurable in our daily experiences. Observations and research community replies that will become increasingly dramatic. The potential risk and priority hazards of climate change are regional. Alanya, which is located in Antalya in Turkey, is vulnerable to sea level rise, drought, moon, and storm hazards due to its climate region location. Considering the storm wind consideration of Alanya region, three roof types in different forms, like barrel, curve, hip roof, were studied. Computational fluid dynamics was used method to calculate velocity patterns and pressure distribution around and all buildings. And we can see figure 2A and B from 2000 and 2018. The land cover classification of map Alanya is presented this, this uh, history, figure 2A and 2, 2B respectively. Land coverage data, data was downloaded from the Cori satellite database. Red pixels identify urban, urban nice zone as shown in legend figure T. The amount of the river ice area increased from 7.5 kilometers squared to 15.8 kilometer squares at center of the city from 2000 to 2018. And also, statical climate research showed that the 15 years return period to wind, wind velocity is higher than 40 meters or second. Design procedure and assumption. We, have, we choose like three types of uh, buildings. One type is the barrel one, second one is curve one, and third one hip one. And also the width will be 31.5 meters, and width will be 14.4 meters, and height will be 16.6 .6 meters, and also ratio eight of the width ratio, 0 0.285 for type one and type two, like the more uh, barrel like curve one, and the uh, 0. Uh, 1624 type 3, and also shown in figure 3. And also, computational fly fluid dynamics methods and general information CFT code, and also the shown in equation 1 and equation 2. Equation 1 shows mass continuity, equation 2 for momentum, and UV, uh, W, fluid velocity component. Rho is fluid density, GS, gravitational acceleration, and, and FX, FY, FZ, viscous acceleration, AX, XY, AZ represents similar air fractions in other two relevant directions. And model start, setup. Uh, and as you see, we, we choose the three types of the uh, building and also the general use in, in, in this area is uh, in uh, Alanya, the model flow domain with the 250 meter length, 100 meter width, and 50 meter height for represented in figure 4A. And also uh, the frequency was selected for this point as uh, 100, 100 hertz to make precise calculation with time. And results, results will be for three types of uh, uh, buildings. One uh, for uh, uh, a barrel one, second one for uh, 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 curved one, 
and the uh, third one for for fifth one and for fifth one for, for a better one in this scenario the shear strength magnitude was calculated as three seven point five times higher at the center than the corners of the roof in other words the roof was exposed a suction pressure figures 5c and 5f 5g and shown in figure five for second one uh, uh, shown in figure six, six maximum negative pressure was calculated center of the upstream side of the roof the suction zone was narrower than in previous scenario figures 5g and 6g but the area ratio of the highest negative pressure values area occupied a more significant portion 7.5 times higher shear stress values were determined and type of the surveys and also the, the third one and fig, shown in figure seven in this model a negative pressure zone dominates the minimum area compared to others the width of the vortex downstream side of the structure was limited according to the curve and the barrel type roofs and also dimensionless pressure with the time uh, shown for type one and type two and type three and all uh, results shown in uh, figure eight conclusion this numerical investigation focus on three common roof types barrel curl and hip types roof as type one and type two and type three respectively aerodynamic condition pressure and shear stress distribution were calculated and compared on the roof of type the following outcomes can be summarized from the result of the study hip roofs are more aerodynamic that the curve and the barrel type roofs curve type roof like type 2 was the most disruptive for wind flow and generated high suction zone and shear stress according to these results damage may occur non-structure elements such as coatings and roof mountain installation solar wall like solar wall heaters satellite dishes chimneys cfd calculation has in the state the storm cause effects on the building adoption is essential for changing climate condition especially more investigation is necessary to detect destructive effects of climate in south of turkey some references given here and thank you for watching me thank you for your passion have a nice day Uh, thank you. Uh, I apologize uh, regarding the quality of the presentation uh, since it, it has been shared by screen. Uh, that's why we have this problem. I will try to share the videos with you after, for sure uh, within a week after the conference. And I would like to uh, request uh, Dr. Uh, Cengiz uh, to be able to uh, increase the quality. It would be perfect. Uh, to stop sharing and just uh, share from the Internet Explorer by the time that uh, you are hitting the green screen button. So if you stop the sharing and then open the YouTube file and then start to share the uh, Internet Explorer, not directly from the screen. So in, and make sure to hit the buttons of sound from the computer which has been down left side by the time that you are sharing thank you thank you thank you dear dr chengi this was professional area of studies and methodology that you developed we really appreciate that so it has been discussed uh, it will be discussed uh, with the colleagues regarding the technology and the approach that you developed for sure but the floor yeah. is yours dear professor dr yeah, thank you. Uh, and next time, uh, the effects of using shear walls on architectural design and project cost. Uh, unfortunately, there is no, uh, there is, there isn't here. Uh, I can see before. So uh, next 
an approach to control the illuminance distribution on vertical display surfaces. Uh, dear, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Uh, you can help the uh, moderator, dear moderator. Uh, I cannot uh, share. Welcome, this is Yazid Kaleloğlu and I'm here to present our paper entitled An Approach to Control the Illuminance Distribution on Vertical Display Services, prepared by Professor Dr. Leyla Dr. Öztürk and myself. Services. Museums preserve and display works of art and valuable objects. The illuminance on the display surface should not exceed the loft illuminance according to the sensitivity class of the object. Illuminance uniformity is a further important aspect of lighting design. The perceived colors of the artifact may differ from the original work if the illumination isn't homogeneous. The relevant literature offers general knowledge, and this regards the luminous intensity diagram, distribution diagram of the luminary, and the luminary spacing. This study aims to identify the optimal conditions to acquire the target illuminous uniformity using minimal energy consumption, considering luminous intensity distribution, and luminary spacing. Control of the luminous distribution depends on the type, the luminous intensity distribution, the position of the luminaire, the size and location of the exhibition area, and the dimensions of the exhibition hall. Uh, in order to identify the optimal conditions to acquire the targeted luminous uniformity, a study of six steps is conducted. In this research, four luminaires are selected. A and B are small, C and D are linear. A and C has symmetrical, B and D has asymmetrical light distributions. Luminaries of similar luminous intensity distributions to the theoretical one are selected. The theoretical distribution produces the same illumines on every point of the illuminated space surface. For example, this figure shows the needed light distribution according to the size and the position of the display surface and the location of the light source. The accepted eye level was 1.6 meter and the vision of field was minus and plus uh, 30 degrees. When defining the size of the display uh, surfaces, three different distances for the visitor to the display surface are uh, defined, are uh, considered, and thus the display surface size are defined as listed here. The fourth display surface for circumstances the exhibited object covers the entire wall starts half meter above the floor and half meter and half meter below the ceiling. To monitor the influence of, influence of ceiling height on the outcomes, four options of uh, ceiling height take, are taken. The reflected light is distributed uniformly, distributed uniformly on interior surfaces. Thus, this study is first carried out in a black room to determine the luminary spacing and angle inclination. Following that, calculations are repeated in the gray rooms. Various conditions for the exhibited are created. 
is this the next slide? Uh, a total of 320 uh, rooms are modeled by Dilux Evil Lighting Program. The distance between the luminaire and the wall is calculated considering the eye level and the ceiling height, as listed here. On the surface of non-matte objects or the works displayed in a glass frame, glare by reflection may occur. 16 conditions, 4 ceiling heights and 4 display surface heights are analyzed. As in this table, the shortest possible distance that a visitor can come close to the display surface without being reflect, affected by reflected glare is calculated for each situation. If this distance is smaller than the distance between the luminaire and the wall, the latter should be taken as the minimum distance. The control of vertical illumination differs depending on the number of luminaires used. When using a single luminaire, the luminaire shall be located according to the ceiling height, the tilt angle shall be arranged to obtain the desired uniformity. When using multiple luminaires, as in the study, the luminaire shall be located according to the ceiling height, the tilt angle, the spacing of luminaires shall be analyzed simultaneously. The decision on the optimum outcome of a specific condition is based on a two-phase evaluation. In the first phase the E and U values are taken into consideration. In general, when E increases, U decreases and vice versa. The desired U value was yielded with different luminaire spacings and tilt angles, so there were several positive results. In the second phase of the study, the optimum one among these positive results was inquired. For this purpose, two additional uh, criteria are uh, considered. Total luminous flux required for 200 lux illuminance P, and the proportion of this luminous flux received by this space surface PDS. Providing the considered criteria, the energy efficiency is taken into account in determining the optimum result. For each display surface, the results of four luminaires are compared and rated. Luminaires ranking from the most positive to the least is based on uh, phi, PDS, and U values. As in the example case in this table, E delivers the most positive and D the least positive result. B and C provided higher U values. Among these two luminaires, whose uniformity is close to each other, C provided a C required a higher flux, so B is more economical. The ranking for luminaires A and D is based on the same reasoning. Rankings for a pair display surface are presented on the table left. Four is the most positive, one is the least. The U values of uh, black rooms are on the right table. U value generally decreases when the ceiling height decreases and when the display uh, surface height increases. The uniformity increases approximately 5% in gray rooms. The results can be evaluated as, considering all cases, the small luminary B with a symmetrical luminous intensity distribution received the highest score, followed by luminaries C, A, and D. The two small luminaries delivered better results for smaller display surfaces. B and C were more successful for the larger display surfaces. The results provided by B and A in high rooms were more, most satisfactory. On the contrary, B and C supplied better results at lower ceiling heights. Today, energy scarcity and carbon emissions are significant issues for many countries, and lighting accounts for a large part of the energy consumption of buildings. Therefore, lighting and energy savings in all sectors are essential. Total uh, flux required for the AMD luminous is considered to compare the results in terms of energy consumption. Among the mentioned 320 situations, the case with highest flux was determined and accordingly the required flux for the rest of the situations is found separately in percentage. As in this example case shown in the table, the flux required to provide the AMT luminous on the display surface is minimum in A and maximum in C. In other words, luminaire A is the most economical one, followed by D, B, and C. By contrast, in terms of U value, B provides the most uniform luminous, followed by luminary C, A, and D. The energy consumption of four luminaries is compared on the scale of the display surface. The luminary that requires the lowest flux has the best score, four points, while the luminary with highest flux has the worst score, one point. This table presents the ranking in energy consumption for each display surface. As the ceiling height increases, the energy consumption required increases. 
the larger the displaced surface, the more energy consumption. Lowest energy consumption to the highest is A, D, B, and C. Highest to lowest average uniformity of elements is B, C, D, and A. So the energy consumption and the uniformity of elements change in the opposite direction. A common use specification relates to the angle of the luminaire. However, in 64 cases examined, only one positive result was with an angle of 30 degrees. Thus, U value not only depends on the inclination, but also on the luminous intensity distribution. By determining the tilt angle and non-luminary spacing consequently, the desired uniformity could not be acquired. This reveals the importance of simultaneous consideration of the angle and spacing. Using the theoretical luminous intensity distribution as a reference in luminar selection and adjusting the tilt angle speeds up the lighting design process and enables positive results. It's a general opinion that an asymmetrical luminous intensity distribution provides positive results for uniform illumination. However, asymmetric luminous intensity distribution alone is not enough for a competent result. In this study, both the best and the worst results were with luminaries of asymmetrical light distribution. The uniformity of illumines and the energy consumption contradict each other. The goal of lighting design should be to offer visual comfort with the lowest possible energy consumption. Interior, light, interior lighting and exhibition design in museums should be conducted simultaneously. If this is not the case, it is inevitable to compromise at least one of the subjects, namely the preservation of the objects, the provision of visual comfort and energy efficiency. The acquired results revealed that a single luminaire does not deliver positive results in all 16 cases. The choice of the luminaire shall regard the geometry of the room and the properties of the presentation area. Assessing any luminaire using this approach presented uh, in this study will provide optimal results in many respects. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to uh, next. Unfortunately. Uh, can you help, uh, dear moderator? Of course, dear Professor Dr. Mohamed, uh, I'm going to share the uh, our four presenters. Um, yeah, Mar Maryam, uh, Maryam Ahmed, please. Yes, Maryam Ahmed. Yeah. Uh, their study is about designing strategies for facade integrated yes. with technologies. Of course, of course, thank you. Seems very interesting. Let's... Hello, everyone. I am Maryam Ahmed from Jangle Media Sangli. It doesn't. I know. Uh, before starting, uh, I would like to ask uh, Professor Dr. Alkama, Dejmal Alkama. Dear Professor Dr. Alkama, we are now in session A, and uh, you will be the session chair. Uh, yes, 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 uh, I'm uh, Alkama. Uh, yes. Can you uh, uh, can you me how to pass in in the other uh, section? Exactly. If you uh, move to top of the program, there is a button here uh, to the left side uh, on the second one. Let me share my screen of the program. Yeah. There, if you move uh, to top, you will see session base, this one, session, session B's uh, button. So if you click on Indeed. that session B's button, so your session will start within 10 minutes, hopefully. Just here. Thank you. Thank you. If I can uh, do that, I, I, I want to, to, to pass to the section B. So yeah, another session, B. What, uh, so I will, you may quit this meeting. So uh, then, or if you just automatically click on the bottom of session B, you will be able to enter by leaving session A. Or I will help you uh, to quit from this session, so you will be able to enter to the other session. Yeah. Uh, Maryam Ahmed. 
Okay, here, here, Professor Dr. Mohamed. So let's continue with our uh, next presenter. Yeah, please, Maria Mohamed. <laughs> it's your I see her. University, New Delhi, India. I am going to present on the topic design strategies for facade integrated photovoltaic technology. With increased pace of urbanization in urban areas, the energy consumption has also increased. Construction sector is a major energy consumer in metro cities, with building stock at the center of this energy demand. Present times require an energy efficient alternative. Government has stepped forward in meeting this requirement. It has provided a number of financial and non-financial incentives to adopt new and renewable sources of energy, especially the photovoltaic technology. In spite of incentivization and awareness, the adoption of the technology is still very limited. Majorly adopted as add-on components on the facade or freestanding structures on the roofs. The idea of photovoltaic system forming the building skin has not been exploited to its full potential. This paper aims to propose a design strategy and a framework to generate a photovoltaic facade which is architecturally integrated and forms the building skin, replacing the conventional building materials. With high energy consumption, the pressure on existing fossil fuels has also increased, with the threat of their complete exhaustion. Building stocks, especially the commercial type with integrated high-end technology is a major energy customer. There has been a change in the perspective of buildings. They are being targeted as mediums of saving and at the same time generating energy with the incorporation of new technology. Renewable energy system is one of these innovative techniques which has the ability to transform buildings into energy generators and achieve the target of net zero energy buildings. Photovoltaic system is a renewable energy system with the highest feasibility of building integration. Photovoltaic technology is not new, but its use is still limited as freestanding rooftop panels or added on facade components. The concept of facade integrated photovoltaic system is not explored enough due to its complexity in design process. This complexity arises because of the dual function as building skin and energy generator, which needs to be performed simultaneously and without causing conflict. In spite of the complexity, the idea of facade integrated photovoltaic system is very efficient for a simple reason that it helps to save the roof spaces, which could generate economic benefits, and it makes use of the multi-storied unobstructed facade surfaces. The complexity of applying the photovoltaic system as building facade can be attributed to barriers in the adoption and dual functioning conflict. The adopted photovoltaic system should be able to act as a building skin and at the same time generate energy efficiently. Thus, the paper aims to identify and provide solutions to barriers in the design process and attempts to propose a design strategy to mitigate the conflict in dual functioning. Barriers are basically inhibitors, issues and concerns. Inhibitors can be defined as the problems in the photovoltaic product, system, or designing process. They are the ones responsible for restricting the adoption of the technology. Issues and concerns describe the apprehensions of the stakeholders. Previous studies have classified barriers into three categories. Now, it is very important to assess and categorize the barriers because it would help in learning and adopting the technology which is the first step towards technology acceptance. Barriers have been classified as category one, two, and three. Category one barriers are identified in the photovoltaic product and the system. They include the problems such as selection of the appropriate photovoltaic technology, availability of the suitable product, reduction in the efficiency of the system, its visual and optical properties, and availability of the design tools. 
Category 2 barriers are in the photovoltaic facade designing process. It has identified problems such as insufficient knowledge of the designer coupled with the absence of guidelines to integrate photovoltaic system with the building pilots. It also includes the impact caused by visual and optical properties of the facade and its structural, mechanical and climatic responsiveness. Also identified in this category of barrier is the problem of lack of skill labor. Category 3 barriers addresses the apprehension of the stakeholders involved, the apprehension of lack of clients' interest in the adopting the technology, the economic feasibility, its operating and maintenance cost, along with the impact of visual properties of the photovoltaic facade. In order to propose solutions to mitigate or minimize the barriers, it is important to identify the ones with direct impact on the design process. Following are the barriers having direct impact. The selected photovoltaic technology is going to determine the transparency of the design facade. Knowledge of the designer affects the design process. Without proper regulatory codes, the integration of photovoltaic products in the building becomes very difficult. Without facade compatible photovoltaic products, the optical and visual properties of the facade cannot be controlled. The climatic response of the photo facade integrated photovoltaic system will affect the occupant's comfort. Without the skilled manpower, execution of facade integrated photovoltaic system will be quite difficult. Therefore, we need a strategy to, for generating a photovoltaic facade. Design strategy would be a three-pronged approach, identifying issues, concerns and apprehensions, providing solutions to remove or reduce the problems and managing conflict. Conflict management is very important to achieve an energy efficient sustainable solution. The conflict management would ensure that the photovoltaic system performs as building skin by providing connection of the building interior and exterior, daylighting, thermal comfort along with structural integrity. Also, it will ensure that the energy generation efficiency is not compromised due to its tilt angle and diffuse daylighting. So, design strategy was proposed, which is a sequential process comprising of four steps, starting with the identification of building typology classified as curtain glaze facade, floor to floor glaze facade, having cladding of aluminum composite paneling or exposed brickwork. Second step in the process would be to define the level of integration, integrating the technology within the building facade, either to create a new vocabulary, new appearance or without any change. Third step is the identification of the facade component which would be used to integrate the photovoltaic product. And the last step would be the selection of the type of photovoltaic technology. So the first step is identifying the building typology. Previous studies have classified buildings based on the facade types into three typologies. Typology 1 are the buildings having curtain glaze facade. Typology 2 and 3 are buildings with floor-to-floor -floor finish with exposed brickwork and aluminium composite panel, respectively. The typology of the building is a determinant of the facade component identified for integration. Step 2, that is the identification of the level of integration to be achieved. First level is the generation of new architectural vocabulary with the use of solar glass panels having different color and texture or combining conventional materials with solar glass panels. Second level of integration would create a new appearance though the architectural vocabulary remains the same. In this case, the adopted photovoltaic glass will be of the same color texture used along with exposed brickwork or aluminum composite panel. The third level would lead to generation of facade which is intended to be without any change. For achieving this, the solar glass or panel used would be on the fenestrations, cladding having the same color and texture. Step 3 is identifying the component for integration. For replacing the curtain glazing, translucent photovoltaic panel would be used. Similarly, for replacing cladding on wall surfaces, opaque panels would be used. Sometimes, depending on the facade geometry, combination of opaque TV panels with transparent glasses can be provided on the windows. Transparent facade components with the highest feasibility of integration are glasses of windows, curtain glazing, floor-to-floor glazing, spandrel areas, panels between railing and balustrades. 
Opaque components with greater feasibility of integration are dead walls of the lift cores and stairwell panels between glazing. The component should be selected with respect to the type of photovoltaic technology being used for adoption. For example, in case of amorphous silicon technology, transparent or translucent facade component can be selected. If cadmium, indium, gallium, diselenite technology is being used, then opaque components of the facade are selected. Fourth step decides the photovoltaic technology to be adopted. Different thin film technology available in the market are amorphous silicon technology, cadmium, indium, gallium, diselenite technology, cadmium, telluride, thin film modules. They are available in standard, non-standard sizes in varied colors. Also, amorphous silicon technology performs well in diffuse daylighting and is available in varying transparencies. The selection of the technology will depend upon the facade component. For transparent translucent facade component, amorphous silicon would be adopted. In case of opaque component, cadmium, indium, gallium, diselenide, cadmium, telluride would be used. The customization potential of the thin film technology is also very important. The size, shape should be rectangular to increase the probability of customization and color and texture should be similar to the conventional building material. Adoption of the photovoltaic panel or glass should be parallel to the building facade. The PV panels can be installed on the facade as seamless glass-to-glass -glass joining or with aluminium mullions and transoms. The opaque panels can be installed with the help of brackets, screws and rails. Important aspects while deciding the photovoltaic panel glass to be adopted is that it should not reduce the leasable space within the building. Hence, its impact on the building footprint should be minimum. Now coming on to the methodology or the framework of design. It is a methodology for designing a photovoltaic facade and achieving architectural integration. It is a process comprising of three interconnected sequential processes. Step one is the identification selection of three commercial building typologies. Step two is the development or design oriented strategies. Step three is generating buildings with photovoltaic facade. Step one, that is the identification and selection of commercial buildings of the three building typologies. This identifies the typology of the commercial building for which the facade integrated photovoltaic system has to be designed. Step two has very critical two aspects, identification and assessment of barriers and selection of type of photovoltaic glass or panel. Identification of barriers would help in establishing the guidelines for preparing design strategies and minimizing the barriers. Selection of the solar glass panel would be based on the type of technology and its ability to perform dual function efficiently. Selection of the solar glass type is also dependent upon its ability to perform well in diffuse lighting and at tilt angle of 90 degrees. Thin film technology has the ability to perform at an efficiency of 20% in diffuse daylighting and also its efficiency is not impacted by increase in the temperature. Moreover, the lightweight of the thin film technology increases its structural and mechanical integration. Step 3 is the generation of photo facade integrated photovoltaic system. This includes designing the facade using strategies in step 2 and simulating them. The simulation software can be according to the availability of the skill set and time. But PV Syst and Red Screen are simulation softwares with user-friendly interface. They can be used efficiently. The simulation softwares helps in making decision of selecting the highest performing alternatives in terms of economic parameters, energy generation and consumption parameters. Now coming on to the conclusion. For designing a photovoltaic facade functioning optimally and efficiently, it is important to understand architectural integration and the process of designing and achieving it. The study attempts to systematically identify the barriers and their impacts on the design process, followed by the development of a framework to enable the adoption of facade integrated photovoltaic system on the commercial building. The developed framework can be used to simulate several design options 
using PVC, red screen, PV sol, depending upon the available skill set. Enabling the designer to take decisions based on parameters like energy generation, visual aspects, aesthetics, and economic implication. The impact of this framework and design strategy can be assessed from the fact that, with, that it will enable the architects and the facade designers to incorporate the renewable energy system within the building envelope and create an energy efficient, sustainable building system. The proposed framework holds the potential to fulfill the world's move towards having more of net zero energy buildings. Thank you. Thank you, dear valuable authors. Uh, I would like to ask Mohamed Yikinci, we have the last one, yes, uh, for your session. What is the title? Uh, the last one, yeah. So the, the, the title will be the Eastern Japan. The Eastern Japan earthquake and tsunami, its effects after my lessons learned. Perfect. So within there are lots of interesting uh, titles, but I'm sure that you will have lots of questions from the authors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, related to our uh, studies area, especially. Yeah. Yes, we have. I have small questions for Mohammed uh, after the presentation. I'm so thank you. I'm going to share it now. Hello everyone, my name is Mohammed Zayat. I am a master's student at Ankara Yildirim Beyazit University. Today I'll be talking to you about the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami, its effects, aftermath, and lessons learned. The outline of the study would include the overview, methodology, literature review, case study, global impact of the event, applied approach for the disaster response, suggested improvements, as well as ongoing studies. So now let's get into the overview. First, I would like you to get familiarized with the problem. So at, uh, in uh, March 11, 2011, at uh, 2.46 p.m., uh, an earthquake that had the magnitude of nine on the Richter scale hit the east coast of Japan. It lasted for about six minutes and it generated huge tsunami waves that uh, soon after hit the east coast of Japan. Several cities eastern of Japan were severely affected, but we'll be focusing mostly on one specific area, on the Fukushima province. The city of Fukushima was faced with tsunami waves as high as 30 meters. Those tsunami waves went inland, destroying everything in their way 10 kilometers deep. That's a lot of area to cover. The methodology of this study includes first a literature review, starting with literature review on concepts such as current disaster response, preparedness for different kinds of disasters, and the application of both in a wide scale globally. The research framework and base material, will, material were built on this information. Defining parameters, providing the base information to analyze the selected case study, including response timers, affected areas and facilities, applied procedures, level of preparedness, life losses, material losses, etc. Criteria. Here we'll be setting criteria to decrease loss of life as well as the economical losses. After that, we'll get to the case studies. We'll be analyzing the data by comparing it to other case studies and understanding why there was a difference between the Daiichi and Daini power plants disaster outcomes. Hajam, I think this uh, issue is uh, YouTube related. Uh, dear moderator, can you hear? So I'm trying to solve the problem. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Our think... tool is uh, technology and architecture, but technology doesn't work sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Exactly. Actually, actually, there's a problem. Oh, with... Maybe if you refresh the page. Uh, 
Hello, everyone. Uh, the That's outcomes were much less severe. Finally, we'll be analyzing and improving, dictating the recommendations, the main obstacles and opportunities for the optimal preparedness and response model possible. Okay, now let's get into the literature review. Actually, here we had two overlapping disasters, first of which is the earthquake and the tsunami that uh, followed it. And second of them is the nuclear power plants and the problems we had uh, related to them. Both of them had uh, big impacts on different aspects. I'll be discussing. Uh, I'll be discussing them. First of those aspects is human lives. Uh, the, these tsunami waves took about 15,890 people's lives and left the rest in case of trauma, either from losing their properties and many who lost family members or friends. I'll be talking about industry and economy together because I think there are intersecting areas. This uh, disaster costed about 360 billion U uh, United US, US dollars, being the most expensive natural disaster to ever take place. Forced more, it forced more than 600 companies in 2012 to declare bankruptcy. Many of the cars manufacturers in Japan had to stop producing their products because of the disaster. And energy-wise, this disaster was uh, had a very big impact on Japan as this uh, the Fukushima nuclear power plant had 1.6 percent of Japan's total energy uh, generating power. Here I would like to discuss the reasoning behind the uh, human life losses being very big and most of it is the communication problem that happened. So whenever disaster happened the government wants to let the people know there is a disaster and they use sirens but in this specific case the sirens had a problem. What, what, what it was is uh, that it was found in uh, previous studies that uh, even the sirens were not sounded correctly, which led to many delays in delivery of the warning. Elderly people death rate is higher. It was higher because of many factors represented in delaying evacuation and some not knowing there was one due to ineffective delivery methods. Gender had a role as well. Actually, this uh, surprised me and I imagine it will uh, surprise you too. Number of deaths amongst uh, women were more than men. Men were responsive, were more responsive to an evacuation alarm than women, but that changes in cases of families. So when women have uh, children to look after for, they were more responsive uh, to evacuation alarms than men. So our main issue is the Fukushima Daiichi power plant. Uh, this nuclear power plant took a severe hit when uh, that threatened all Japan at the time. It is one of many reasons that made this disaster extremely expensive, 360 billion US dollars. Problems because of contamination. I'll be showing you the, contamina the contaminated Pacific Ocean that is still going on until our time. The loss of electric power generating capacity. As I said, this uh, power plant had 1.6 of Japan's total at the time and 6.5 of Japan's total nuclear uh, power. Of course, right after the earthquake, the country lost electric power. Starting after 20 minutes up to one hour, the first tsunami wave hit the shore, therefore the plant. Even though right after the earthquake, the three running reactors, one, two, three, were immediately shut down but it's not an easy nor fast process to shut down a nuclear reactor. It takes no less than 24 hours to get the reactor to a cold shutdown state. So we need to know that in a nuclear reactor, uh, keeping the core cooled is always a crucial step that needs to be accounted for. So after that first tsunami, uh, hit the plant, all the diesel backup generators were damaged and were unable to provide the electricity needed for the water pumps to keep cooling the water recycle going inside the reactors, which eventually led to a meltdown in three of the four reactors, causing a level seven nuclear event, which is a major accident. Even though the fourth reactor core wasn't uh, loaded, it shared its, uh, third it, shared, it shared its exhaust channel with the third reactor which caused the fourth reactor core to heat up and with its cooling systems being also damaged, the pressure inside the core caused the reactor's room to blow up due to lack of ventilation. 
Fukushima Daini almost faced a close fate, but it had more luck with the, which made it come through with minimal damage. Okay, now let's talk about the Fukushima Daini power plant. This power plant had four of its reactors fully operating at the time of the disaster, similarly at what happened in the Daiichi station. But unlike Daiichi, this power plant had better luck having some more backup generators that were undamaged, but also unwired, so they had to wire them manually. About 5.2 kilometers distance of thick wiring had to be used. Eventually, the Daini station made it through without any of its reactors melting down. Even though its reactors were intact, TEPCO, which is a Tokyo Energy, pa Energy Power Company, decided to not relaunch any of them again. And the mentioned uh, contam contamination impact can be traced up until our current day in the Pacific Ocean. But as you can see with me here, after one year of the disaster, this is the uh, radioactive material in the Pacific Ocean. This is uh, after three years and this is after five years. And the traces are still uh, traceable up until our current day. So the approach is taken with minimal time to make decisions, strategies and methodologies. A mix of faced and an umbrella strategies were taken. The immediate response to try to prevent the meltdown with no matter how limited the resources were available at the time was the main approach. They even poured seawater inside the reactors to try to prevent the meltdown. Unfortunately, it was not enough. Worries reached that there might be a possibility that they might have to evacuate Tokyo, 9 million people. The umbrella part comes later with the water filters installed all around the power plant, making the most expensive water filtering system in the world. So Tokyo is 250 kilometers away, and when they wanted to get the diesel generators, they had to come in from Tokyo, and that caused a problem. And there were uh, the problem here that they had only two backup plan two plans. Uh, this system should be fail-proof, so two plans were not enough. Uh, most of Fukushima's population was relocated. After 11 years, uh, reconstruction processes are still happening, and most of the people of Fukushima was relocated in the rest of Japan. Uh, when we look at the matter and take a holistic look, we realize that there have been many mistakes and many things that could have been done better had the local municipalities, municipalities were prepared. Uh, unfortunately, they were understaffed and they, they were lacking experience in these fields, so they couldn't uh, deal with an event at this scale. After this accident, Japan was forced to go uh, through a transition of power source. They, uh, their options varied from solar panels to wind turbines. Uh, they could have used wind power because it's much cheaper and it could be integrated with the photovoltaics solar panels. Uh, because they are produced locally in a huge amounts, in year 2000, Japan had about 50% of their production share globally. And I would like to thank you all for your time. Thanks Thank you. Thank you for uh, your presentation, dear uh, guest. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, uh, I must say something uh, about this uh, conference, uh, fifth uh, symposium uh, uh, are releasing uh, these days. Uh, and before uh, four uh, conferences uh, were very uh, beneficial and very uh, contribution uh, contribution uh, to uh, for uh, literature architecture and urbanism uh, and uh, in fact uh, I uh, study civil engineering about civil engineering but holist uh, holistic aspects uh, is uh, good for every uh, studies you as you know uh, so uh, only uh, last one, uh, only just one, Mohammed Said's uh, present presentation related to uh, our study. But uh, I have uh, small questions uh, for uh, every uh, participant. Uh, firstly, uh, the approach to control the luminous distribution of uh, vertical display surfaces. Uh, about this, uh, dear Sezgi Kaleloğlu. Uh, you uh, mentioned about your uh, presentation. Uh, you want to control the elements uh, distribution, uh, as I uh, as I understood. And uh, have you ever uh, researched uh, old and big uh, large uh, areas? For example, 
uh, big mosque uh, and uh, historic uh, mosque, for example, Mimar Sinan, uh, how uh, how was uh, used uh, how was used this uh, uh, to control the illuminous distribution? Have we ever uh, researched? Uh, first uh, question. No, oh, in fact, this uh, the scope of this uh, study was just the museums. And uh, for the museums, I have uh, researched for the height of the displaced surfaces, and I took some general height uh, values for only four types for the scope of this study. Uh, it depends on surface uh, shape of uh, surfaces, for example, uh, concave, uh, convex, or flat. Uh, is there any difference? Uh, uh, maybe, uh, but we did not include that in this study because in the museums, it's generally it's just uh, plain surfaces. So this was our scope. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, another uh, dear uh, Maryam Mohammed. Uh, Design strategies for facade integrated photo uh, photovoltaic technology, and uh, you mentioned about uh, first step and another step to uh, to uh, determine the strategies strategies for state and integrated integrated uh, photovoltaic. Uh, first step, uh, you said identify building technology uh, building. Uh, typology, sorry, building typology. Uh, can you clarify this? Uh, what does it mean, uh, typology building? Of, uh, uh, hmm. Okay, uh, so here the concept was that we were proposing to uh, replace the conventional building facade or the building skin, so to say, with the photovoltaic products, the solar glasses, as you may call them. So uh, we chose commercial buildings because in literature we had found out that the commercial buildings are the ones which have the highest visibility of integration. And I've also mentioned uh, in one of the slides that the, uh, the, the literature has defined that the commercial buildings can majorly be classified into three categories based on the type of facade that they have. So the, the first typology basically has, uh, elaborated the type of buildings with curtain glazing, the, the ones that have fully glazed uh, curtain walls. Second had the concept that the glazing was not curtain glazed, but was floor to floor glazing with the cladding of maybe aluminum composite panels or maybe uh, exposed brickwork. So these typologies were basically based on the type of facade materials used, conventional building facade materials used, and based on the typology of the building, the uh, integration process was defined. Thank you, thank you very much. And last one, uh, especially uh, my uh, study area related uh, to your uh, study, your presentation, Mohammed. Mohammed, Yıldırım Beyazıt University. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you uh, do you uh, meet uh, our uh, professor uh, Ahmet Pınarbaşı, Professor Doctor uh, Ahmet Pınarbaşı, uh, ex rector, our ex rector, uh, Alaaddin Kekubat University, and. Uh, uh, no, Hojam, I don't believe I have met him. Uh, yeah, well, okay. we, we, I worked with Dr. Abdullah Dilsiz, though. I think yeah, you know. Okay, him. okay. Uh, we worked, uh, we worked uh, with uh, uh, our uh, dear uh, uh, associated professor, Cengiz Ipek, and uh, you, uh, you watch uh, us. <laughs> you wonder, uh, you wonder uh, what, uh, what question for you. Uh, you wonder, I'm... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm, uh, I, I agree. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to tsunami, you mentioned about to tsunami. Uh, sorry, uh, so uh, you related to water, uh, excessive water, you know. And uh, which uh, program, model program, uh, did you uh, have you used this uh, determine the uh, effects of uh, to tsunami? For, ex uh, for example, uh, three, uh, three. Uh, 30, 30 meters, uh, 30 30 meters, meters yeah. you, you mentioned about it yeah uh, have you ever uh, have you ever used 
uh, any uh, model program. For example, flat 3D uh, uh, avances or uh, another uh, modeling program. Hajam, I used ANSYS and I used any logic, but uh, in in another uh, like unrelated in, to this study. For this study, I actually did not uh, run uh, simulations. Yeah, uh, my friend, uh, dear uh, Murat uh, Axel, Murat Axel, as a professor, uh, we work we work uh, we together in Alanya Alanya Alatikekbat University, and he's uh, good at uh, especially. A modeling program and cost uh, coastal engineering, especially mm -hmm. he research he uh, he has a lot of research. Uh, oh, Jim, that would have been very beneficial actually for my study if I knew about it. Yeah. Unfortunately, I didn't get to it. Yeah, yeah, I advise uh, I advise entirely. Uh, so thank you, uh, and uh, we are living in Alaya, uh, and you are living in uh, Ankara. Uh, Jing yeah. is, dear Jing is, uh, yes. <laughs> is living in uh, Kojeli. Uh, Alanya is uh, one of the most beautiful cities in the world, you know. Uh, you can visit every time. Uh, Inshallah, Hocam. Don't tell us, uh, you can visit every time as a tourist. Uh, we, we are waiting for uh, all of you. And uh, any uh, question? Is there any question? Thanks a lot, Mehmet Hocam. Thank you. Uh, another uh, guest, uh, dear participant, uh, any questions? Yeah. Uh, the second one, uh, in fact, the effect of using shear walls on uh, architectural design and project cost. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't uh, see. Uh, because uh, there wasn't uh, here. Uh, actually, I had a question for Adam, uh, and they uh, they missed. <laughs> uh, dear dear uh, moderator, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, dear Dr. Mohamed. I'm now, I'm now with you. Sorry, I was in the other session checking the... Okay. Issue, but now I'm with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, your organization. And uh, you know, uh, I uh, had a, a, a problem uh, with network, and you <laughs> you uh, helped me. Thank you for all uh, things. Thank you, dear Dr. Mohammed. It was indeed the Presentation was good, they were good, and the questions that you asked also technical, interesting. Thank you. Even the yeah. quality of the presentation was good in the YouTube, so I will share with the authors, so uh, and hopefully they will have, uh, if they have any other extra questions uh, from the uh, authors, you may have a contact with each other, so this is a platform yeah. Uh, to get familiar with each other. Actually, today there was interesting uh, occasion that appeared uh, five years ago in our first uh, in, uh, international of ICC AUA. There was an attendee uh, that we met, but today uh, there was Erasmus program in our university. And by chance, I saw that uh, I told him that I know you from somewhere. Have you been in Cyprus? Uh, uh, he told that, yes, I, I was in the conference. And I told that who was the session chair of that conference, the chairman of that conference. And <laughs> then he was look at me. Yes, I thought that, yes, it is me. That's why this is one of those miracles of academic, let's say, platform to be to have connection with each other. I'm happy to meet you, dear uh, uh, Dr. Mehmet. Uh, Bikinji and dear Dr. Cengiz Ipek, I really appreciate that. I will come you. to uh, your university to meet you. It, was, it would be a great pleasure for thank me. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's have, uh, let's keep our contact here, uh, authors. You have uh, our email address and your colleagues' email address. If you have any question regarding uh, your title, since the area are, of the speciality of yours, in this session are the same. So you, it would be a good platform to start our academic 
basic uh, contribution for the future and hope to meet you in our next session, uh, next year's conference. It would be great. I hope. Future. I hope. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. And you deserve to live in Alanya. <laughs> you <deserve. laughs> Thank you. That's very kind of you. Actually, as you may know, Alanya, I love the uh, climate, atmosphere, the touristic uh, era, and the quality of the living, uh, considering the air condition and environmental and geography. I love it. And we are still thinking, and my wife is also uh, here, uh, uh, living, uh, working in this uh, uh, university, the Faculty of Architecture. She's our colleague. And we are doing our best. So uh, I hope you uh, you will uh, you enjoy this platform. And looking forward to meet you very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very so. much. Thank you. Thank you. All of you. Thank you so much. Great pleasure. Uh, exactly. We we are on time. We have five minutes to start the other session. Uh, I'm trying to. Find right now, Professor Dr. Islam. If afternoon, I am here. Oh, perfect, <laughs> dear Professor uh, Dr. Islam. Uh, I'm happy uh, to uh, meet you and to see that you are here. I would like to thank uh, you uh, for accepting our invitation to be the session chair, and I would like to again thanks Professor Dr. Mehmet Dikinji for my, uh, uh, chairing this session, uh, the previous session. So, uh, dear Professor Dr. Islam, within uh, two minutes, the platform will be yours. And I will, since you are one of our the pillars of the conference, since beginning from 2018 that we start in Cyprus, I, it was a great pleasure uh, that we had with the, uh, and also you also contribute uh, with the competition of Moscow design. You are one of the, uh, the uh, directors of international competition of Moscow design. So if you ha also have any uh, introduction uh, for that Moscow design, in case if some, our, some of our colleagues would like to participate for our, your future competition, it would be perfect. And now, uh, dear Professor Dr. Madrigal also uh, have just point is in our, our Another pillar that we start with each other to organize since beginning to write aim and objectives of the conference and those area that we have discussed with developing the web design. So uh, I'm happy. So I'm giving the platform to you, dear Professor Dr. Islam and Professor Dr. Madrigal, and I'm leaving. Uh, yes, uh, let me correct something. Just one point, I would like to correct it because you have to say that I had the honor to be with you in the last five years because it was my great pleasure to be with you and uh, Dr. Ofsana and uh, the respecting colleague. It's really a great pleasure to be with you and the wonderful teamwork and the amazing effort you did to enhance and develop the career for most of the researchers now and researchers now in the urban uh, design uh, field. Uh, Professor uh, Jose, uh, my pleasure to see you again. And the last time it was in Cairo, but I hope it, it come again. <laughs> yes. You are, you are entirely right. Please uh, go ahead, please. It, it, it was a very short meeting, by the way, you know, uh, but, but okay, at least it was a, a meeting. Thank you. Please go ahead. Go ahead with your comment. We'll start now because it's uh, still five minutes, I believe, right? Or Yes, yes, please. <clears throat> okay. Uh, just a second, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you in this uh, uh, wonderful session in the uh, respecting conference of the, uh, the uh, fifth international conference of the contemporary architecture and uh, urbanism. Uh, today we have uh, wonderful speakers and when uh, I went to uh, the uh, presentation really I inspired it is very interesting uh, uh, papers and researches and let me the honor to uh, introduce the first paper which is the development of uh, relief sections it centered on the attendance of tomorrow's national museum uh, in the uh, Mujahid museum of uh, Bijeha 
in Algeria, as I saw in the presentation. And uh, it will be uh, shared by three of the uh, researchers, Dr. Selma, Dr. Abdel Ghani, and Dr. Aziduddin. I will uh, start sharing with you the presentation, just a please, uh, second. <clears throat> Um, I wonder if the screen is there. Yes. Yeah. So it is, but I would like to hide. Uh, uh, yes. How can I hide this one? Yes. You mean to enlarge? Yeah, yeah to enlarge it. Yes, that's it. Okay. Okay. Now, please uh, enjoy the presentation with dearest colleague, please. Hi, Dr. Alganayi. Sound. We don't receive the sound. Sorry? Uh, we don't receive the sound. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know why it's not sharing the sound. Uh, how it shares with sound, please, uh, Professor Hussein? Yes. Can you can you please check if, before if, if you have in a high level of uh, the sound, yes, on the on the on the on the left. Uh, let us see because I cannot do that. No, 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 no. I mean in in the in the YouTube you have in your in your screen. Yes, YouTube here. Yes, it is. It's, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe now. Let us let us see now. Can you hear the voice? No, not yet. Maybe in the way of sharing, maybe there is, uh, I will stop sharing. Exactly. Yes, please. If yes, you, please. By the I time that sharing. you are sharing the screen, don't share the screen on the second page. There's another Internet Explorer icon, including specific page. So, you, so it means that you may need to open your the, the YouTube link, then start to share your screen. But it, yeah. I open now the web link as, the, as it is there in YouTube. Should I start sharing now? Uh, yes, I think. Can you hear the voice? No. So by the time that you are sharing your screen, it's on the down left side of the screen. It it will ask that you have to tick to two boxes. Uh, One more thing, Doctor Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. If you are not able to do that, uh, Narmin has uh, told us uh, a recommendation. Uh, re uh, this person recommended us to, to do the YouTube with Google Chrome. But please go um, ahead with your. I can I can share the screen if you. Can you hear now? Yes. Yes. type of art exhibition by the general public. The museums have involved from sight, and with the use of scenography and museography, we not only expose the works, but we also expose the museum architectural space, offering to the visitor one of the most beautiful sensorial adventures that will greatly impact the visitor's mind. Algeria, like all nations of the world, has several museums located in various areas of the territory. Most museums date from the French colonial era, or were designed after architectural competitions initiated by the government in the post-independence period. With the current health situation related to COVID-19, museums like all public buildings work with restrictions, which tend to work when the attendance is low, just mark stickers on the floor, the distance is also managed in this way, and the number of visitors through filters. But if the flow is important, what are we going to do? 
the time allocated to the visit cannot in this case be controlled. To answer this question and to solve this problem, we started with the conceptual research, which we summarize in two points. The museum rooms as a tool for presence and learning. And the second point is the appropriation of the museum space by the typical visitor. The Museum of Al Mujahid in the Algerian city of Bijaya is an example of a very interesting study. We observed malfunctions related to the spatial structure before the pandemic, and these observations still are relevant. The museum closed its door during the pandemic, and everyone needs to open for events. The restrictions imposed by COVID 19 exacerbate the spot dysfunctionalities. What are the possible methods for controlling the flows? accomplishing the museum roads and thus the visit while following the COVID-19 recommendations. The goal of this research is to provide solutions for the execution. Then, to determine if these solutions are more appropriate to the pandemic period or not. So, which museum and which museum roads for tomorrow museum in Algeria? So, we will approach on this slide the methodology and the case study of this research. For the case study, the Al Mujahid Museum in the city of Vijaya is Museum of the History of the Algerian Revolution. It was built like all Algerian museums after a competition launched by the Ministry of Al Mujahideen, and the winner was the Study Office of Architecture, Urbanism, and Design Parade in 1998. For the methodology, we will uh, uh, have three great steps. The first one is in situ observation and collection of visitor opinions. The special composition uh, genesis one will use the placement syntax for the evaluation of the special composition. And the last step is uh, studying the condition of sanctuary uh, situation and the proposal. The ground floor level has the main entrance and reception area, which is connected to a long corridor called the exhibition corridor. In the level dedicated to the permanent exhibition, we will find a large exhibition room where the exhibition cabinet creates arrangements according to the exhibition. It should be noted there are three elements of exhibition in the museum world. First, the dominant elements on all walls are the wall wraps, then the vertical and horizontal cabinets that tend to be the elements used for the layout of space. Let's move on to the results. We first observe the conditions of visits for several people walking alone without public, then the three groups of about 30 people together without the guide visit. The objective was to observe the behavior of the visitors and to conclude whether the road, if the road offered good special orientation to the visitor. This observation had been made in the period before COVID-19 and during COVID-19. We present our remarks as follow in these diagrams. The visitor sometimes stays at the same point and turns to see the exhibit, which distracts him from the direction of the road. This situation worries with the large flow. As for the group, we noted that 25% of the road was not visited. The average time spent at the exhibition is uh, 75 minutes. However, most visitors in the absence of the tower, it passed through the same point more than once and never passed through another point. On the ground floor and at the beginning of the visit, for a visitor who walks along in the road, the element that captures the attention of most are the rams exposed on the wall. In 70% of the answers, while for the rest of the corpus visitors, looks with their eyes for the rest of the museum rooms. For the level dedicated to the exhibition, 
The attention of the visitors increased as time passed toward the farms at the world level. At the end of the visit, 30% of the visitors are interested in the farms. For the exhibition cabinets, the attention decreased and increased according to the position of the visitor in the road. Otherwise, for the attention that the visitor gives to the museum rows, it varies from 40 to 30 percent toward uh, the end. According to the analysis of the vision graph, the two levels of the exhibition present very high values of visual connectivity. The most connected part presents two-thirds of the ground floor. For the visual integration, we have price very low rate at the level of the ground floor. The most integrated part is in the center of the spatial composition. If we compare the agent simulation and the observed road, we notice that the ground floor is more or less compatible with the spatial configuration, but on the exhibition floor, the choices are completely different. So according to the, this first reading, we proposed a new special configuration. Then we have compared between the visual integration values in the existing and new proposal. And we can see that for the new proposal with the elimination of the airship space, we have created second core of visual integration. And with the arrangement of the proposed new roads, the values tend to increase. Carried out an agent simulation to compare the proposed roads with the radial roads proposed by the new special configuration. We have noticed that for the ground floor, the roads overlap. For the case of the level dedicated to the exhibition, the roads <coughs> correspond. As a synthesis, thanks to the values of connectivity and visual integration, we have been able to visualize the graphs of the global intelligibility. We can see that the museum space, especially the ground floor, has become more eligible to the visitor than it was before. And this proves that the correspondence between visual connectivity and visual integration. As conclusion, we can see that the solution proposed in this research fits perfectly in recommendation to correct malfunctions at the scale of the special composition. This solution was also taught for the post-COVID-19 period. Therefore, we propose a new special configuration which adapts to the museum's design pattern and which will have a positive influence on the behavior of the visitor in the road. This suggestion can be considered in normal circumstances. It will not only improve integration and visual and connectivity, but it will also for refocus the visitor's attention on the exhibition once the museum road is no longer ambiguous. Space syntax will be crucial in determining the present status of the location as well as validating the purpose. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you very much uh, for the nice um, trip to the museum in Algeria and uh, the question which is uh, make everyone thinking about what's next. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful presentation. Um, the second uh, presenters, it is for the research under the title of assessment of factory design requirement of uh, pharmaceutical factories buildings in southwest of uh, Nigeria. Uh, it will talk about assessment of factory design requirement uh, pharma, pharma uh, such as factories building in uh, thousands of Nigeria. I will share with you now the uh, presentation. Hi. Um, yes, now please. My name is Bawa John Agmada. I'm doing a presentation on assessment of factory design requirements of pharmaceutical factory buildings in Southwest Nigeria. In production, the pharmaceutical factory started uh, experiencing expansion in production around the world between the 1800s and 1910s. There were some rebuildings that were done 
um, during the interwar period, but they experienced much more rapid and international growth after the Second World War. In 1990s, manufacturing was more specialized and complex and expanded across many countries of the world. Pharmaceutical factory buildings are known to maintain serene environment, uh, especially in the production areas. Pharmaceutical factories usually have uh, dedicated facilities for the production of particular pharmaceutical products or biological operations aimed at minimizing the risk of health hazard due to cross-contamination. Variety of chemicals are used for the production of a wide range of drugs for human consumption. Therefore, there is the uncertainty and unpredictability of the quality of the indoor environmental air of these factories and they are suspected to be the cause of sick building syndrome, thermal, visual, and uh, acoustic discomforts, which cause psychological fear and physical complaints. The findings from this research will help the operators and stakeholders of pharmaceutical factory buildings improve in their operations. Pharmaceutical factories in Nigeria have gone through thick and thin, and expansion has been on the steady increase despite um, denting challenges um, around their development. As a way of literature review, pharmaceutical factories are not usually designed with windows. Even the ones that have, um, have only but fixed windows. But we know that these windows help grant access to uh, nature and uh, natural lightning and to an extent reduce the cost of production and uh, increases well-being and reduce uh, stress level. Uh, researchers have also dived into uh, two broad areas, which include the building designs that portrays uh, and improve the indoor air quality by increasing ventilation rates, which will in turn reduce air pollution. Pharmaceutical factory buildings maintain active control and restriction of the inflow of outdoor climatic uh, elements into the indoor environment of the production areas so that the chemicals, the process and the drugs being produced are void of contamination. There have been global standards for these parameters that have been found usable for this research. Lagos and Ogun states have been chosen as the study area largely because they contain high number of the highest number of uh, pharmaceutical factory buildings in Nigeria. Um, out of the 126 registered, Lagos and Ogun State have 16, I mean 57 and 16 respectively. Handheld instruments were utilized for the measurement uh, of this research. Some of these handheld instruments include multifunctional air quality dictators, sound level meters, uh, distant meters, digital anemometer, and a couple of others. For the sampling technique, 14 pharmaceutical factories were chosen through purposive sampling, inclusive and exclusive criteria, and non-response rate. The method of data collection included measurement of all the parameters in about 15 points in all the 14 pharmaceutical factory buildings within an interval of three to five minutes, and this was carried out when drugs were being produced, machines were working, and the workers fully occupying the buildings. Results and discussion. The data was analyzed using descriptive analysis after comparing the outcome of the data collected with the globally recommended standards for factory design requirements. The assessment of this factory required design uh, Requirement compliance of pharmaceutical factory building was carried out by assessing different cases and comparing the same through the ideal scenario. This was aided by undertaking a worker's productivity reliability test and testing other parameters that concerns factory requirements as will be seen on the tables below. The tables will show the result of reliability test, highlighting the mean and standard deviation of the responses of the factory workers Factors that determine workers' productivity were also measured to determine the factory uh, 
to determine how the factory design contributed to the productivity of the workers. This are some of the uh, tables showing the number of the units, showing the reliability test using the combat alpha that showed about 75% reliability, which was good enough for the analysis to continue. And then this is the table containing the analysis of the standard of the mean and the standard deviation of the questions that arose, uh, questions such as the size of the production area, whether it was enough or big enough for moving around, whether uh, the production area was uh, enough to accommodate the machine and the workers, whether the floor, the walls, the ceiling finishes were suitable, the chairs, tables, and the machines were movable during sanitation. This is the table showing the scale mean, scale variance, total correlation, and the combat alpha reliability test of each of the questions. The requirement compliance of pharmaceutical factory buildings to the size of the space for the production for free and easy movement recorded about 80% uh, compliance. The headroom of the production area, whether it was suitable, recorded about 92%. The safety of the floor, the ceiling finish, uh, recorded between 90 to 93%. The comfort of the seats, the furniture, the table that was used, between 79 to 91%. The ease of movement of the production machine uh, during washing and cleaning about 60%, and then occurrence of uh, mixes recorded mixes of chemicals recorded about 19%. Eight out of the 14 pharmaceutical factory buildings that we are observed uh, we are below the acceptable standard requirement in terms of the headroom of the production area. While four pharmaceutical factory buildings had inadequate room sizes uh, per equipment and workers recommendation on the material finish of the floor walls and ceiling uh, four pharmaceutical factory buildings did not meet with the average standard uh, about 65 percent of the pharmaceutical uh, factory buildings were within the compliance range of the global best practices meanwhile on the indoor air quality with the least noticeable difference with the set out uh, standard was the re uh, relative humidity which had only about six percent uh, uh, variance with the standard which was followed by air velocity which had about 11 percent and then temperature about 12 percent this study recommends more research in indoor air quality in pharmaceutical factory buildings in nigeria to generate the most appropriate benchmark for the Nigerian setting. Thank you for your time and God bless. Um, thank you very much for uh, this interesting uh, uh, subject about assessment. Uh, sorry. Okay. I will go for the uh, third uh, presenter. It's about designing a hostel in the touristic complex of uh, original lake near uh, Tobriz in Iran. It is uh, a nice trip will be taken by the uh, Miss uh, Nariman. She will share with us her experience in, the, uh, in her uh, project. I will share with you now her uh, research. Please enjoy the presentation, please. Designing a hostel in the touristic complex of Gurijo Lake near Tabriz in Iran. Table of contents. After abstract and introduction, the location of Gurijo Lake, the necessity of creating a hostel near Gurijo Lake, the types and examples of hostels like student hostels, bachelor hostels, worker hostels, youth hostels, and the samples like Easy Hotel and Hostel of Camp in Pasad are going to be mentioned in detail. Then the designing of a hostel near Gurijo Lake is going to be shown in the pictures. 
and conclusions and references. Abstract. Guriju Lake is located in East Azerbaijan province, south east of Tabriz city, next to the main highway of Tabriz, Tehran. This beautiful region, due to its special and outstanding features, can serve for the development of the tourism sector and ecotourism of the province. The hostel is a cheap and comfortable accommodation, which provides simple and inexpensive food, accommodation, and facilities for passengers who have traveled during the holidays. There are four types of hostels, students' hostels, single hostels, workers' hostels, and youth hostels. This hostel is designed near Gurijo Lake, where all the rooms have beds, closets, toilets, bathrooms, and balconies with a beautiful view of the lake. This article aims to study the different kinds and standards of hostels and also the potential of Gurijo Lake as an appropriate location for designing a hostel. The methodology of this survey is qualitative and quantitative using reliable first-hand resources and references. Keywords Hostel, Gurijo Lake, Tabriz, Hotel, Inn Here is the aerial view of Gurijo Lake which is uh, near the road of Tabriz, Tehran. The general view of the lake these are the pictures of the rooms, bathroom plan and entrance of Easy Hotel, one of the uh, types of hostel which is in London. This, these are the pictures of the exterior bedroom, kitchen and bathroom of the hostel of camp in Pasai. Uh, the physical program of Gurdjieff Hostel is developed by author based on Neufert Architects data and also the architectural construction and rating criteria of hotels and inns in the country Iranian Cultural Heritage and Tourism Organization. Um, so we have rooms for 8 to 12 people, rooms for 4 to 6 people, rooms for two to four people, corridor, elevator, reception, lobby, CEO room, staff room, powerhouse, store, restaurant, traditional tea house, prayer room, separated for ladies and gentlemen, toilet, again separated for ladies and gentlemen, laundry room, parking for car, bus, bicycle, game and entertainment room, internet cafe, and library. This is the plan of Gurdjieff Hostel, uh, which is in three main floors. You can see that all of the rooms have their own um, toilets and bathrooms, and there is one public toilet in the corridor and the lobby. This is the site plan of Gurdjieff Hostel, and uh, uh, this is the building, and on the north side, there is the lake. There are uh, playing grounds for football, volleyball, basketball, and also uh, routes for uh, cycling with bicycle, and also some uh, open area parkings for the buses and cars. This is the poster of the exterior of Gurdjieff Hostel, designed by the author. And this is the poster of the interior design of uh, the hostel, again designed by the author. These are the various views of the lobby, the restaurant, the single room, the double room, uh, double room from another view, triple room, and rooms with uh, beds more than three. These are the various design exterior views of Gurdjieff Hostel. Given the existing potential of the country, one of the appropriate strategies for economic development is the development of the tourism industry. In this regard, the ecotourism industry is known as an important tool for tourism development. Investing in ecotourism not only protects ecosystems and the healthy natural environment for a living, but also generates significant revenue and valuation. 
East Azerbaijan province, in terms of having rich resources in this field, can take basic steps to use the ecotourism industry. The beautiful region of Gurijal Lake, due to its special and outstanding features, can serve as a stimulus for the development of ecotourism in the province, as well as the development of the tourism sector. Gurijal Lake, with its exceptional size in the semi semi-arid region with side reeds has created an interesting view and its view of the side hills has attracted many travelers who spend part of their time there like a picnic or spend the night as accommodation the shore of the lake despite the limited amenities welcomes large crowds of people with which needs to build a hostel in the short term and develop a hotel in the long term. Gurujal Lake, with an area of 162 hectares, which is less than Lake Ormia, is the most important lake in this semi-arid zone of the Azerbaijani plateau, with fresh water with an average depth of 3 meters and an altitude of 1897 meters with a watershed of 356 hectares next to the main axis of Tabriz Tehran Highway, located 40 kilometers southeast of Tabriz. Due to being in the way of migratory birds, this lake is a place of rest and renewal of energy to continue their flight and is of great ecological importance. The special beauty of the lake with migratory birds, especially white ducks, has made the travelers who travel to the northwestern part of the country and pass through this axis spend time along this lake and even stay in tents that are installed at night there. The citizens of Tabriz usually spend the weekend near the lake, especially in parts of the lake that has trees. The subject of this research is designing a hostel near Gurijal Lake. A hostel is an expen inexpensive accommodation with a bed, pillow, blanket and toilet, usually built in a dormitory style. Hostels have private rooms or dormitories. Private rooms are usually single, double or sometimes triple. Dormitory rooms uh, vary in size but usually vary from 4 to 20 beds. These types of rooms often have folding beds. Students, groups, families, young couples, university students, the elderly, etc. can stay in the hostel. In most hostels, travelers must be 18 years of age or older or with a parent. Some hostels have lockable shelves or luggage storage where travelers can store their Backpacks and luggage during the day when traveling outside the hostel. In most hostels, the doors of the rooms can be locked and most travelers usually place their belongings on or under the bed. Here are the references of this study. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful, nice trip. Uh, we'll go for the uh, second presenter, or the next presenter, sorry. It is about the factors that influence works, workspace planning and design in government officers' buildings of Lagos. It will be uh, with uh, Mr. Dibar, uh, Dibara, okay. And uh, I apologize if I miss saying the uh, name correctly. Uh, would you please enjoy the presentation? Now I will share uh, the screen, please. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alonge Deborah Oluwabumi, and I'll be presenting this paper on behalf of my co-author, and the title of this paper is The Factors That Influence Workspace Planning and Design in Government Office Buildings of Lagos, Nigeria. And so to start with, the study talked briefly about, you know, introduced the, the, the topic and then went further to review literature 
and they went further to carry out a, a, a um, the methodology in carrying out the data to find out what is existing currently in the Nigerian offices. And finally, deductions were made and conclusions were drawn. And so to start with, space planning and design of an office workspace is critical to each employee's performance and productivity within those workspaces. And so the planning and the design of those workspaces deals majorly with the shape, the dimensions, the layout of the different elements that surround it and the people, importantly, who work within and so the aim of planning and designing the office properly helps to improve work performance, both in quality and quantity, and achieving ease of use of the various workspace elements. And so for the purpose of this study, these elements have been categorized into four. Workspace planning design, employees engagement, collaborative capability, and organization management. And so to start with a brief history of of how office spaces evolved over the years shows that, you know, in ancient Egypt, the hierarchy of those offices were very strong and centralized. But between the 18th and the 19th century, office developments were began to be rectilinear. It was linked by a central corridor and they were designed around a, a, a central core or an atrium. However, the rise of technology in the 19th century led to the creation of new office design. You know, the offices now became more funky, they were colorful, they were cooler, and there were a variety of spaces to work from, which now introduced or which signaled the best of the breakout space in the modern work. And so a suitable office design must be able to provide adequate floor area, adequate workspace sufficient and adequate common spaces, access and circulation spaces, adequate amenities and specific work environments to enhance how these workers work within their spaces. Therefore, there's a need to focus on how these office spaces can be made more effective by utilizing them. And so like earlier mentioned, that the components that this study tried to look at were four. And so on that workspace design, factors such as openness, privacy, office sizes, enclosure accessibility, workstation type, were what was considered for Factors under employee engagement, the study looked at factors that enhance customer service, their profit, that factors that drive profits within the workspaces and you know, factors that help productivities of the employee. And so under the third category, the study looked at factors that help to enhance interaction and communication, factors that help to enhance knowledge transfer and to be able to create new ideas and new solutions. And then on that organization management, these are factors that help to create a psychological work, safe workspace by the owners of the organization in order to help to improve the previous three factors that have been identified. So the, the, the study was quantitative in, in, in nature and it made use of a questionnaire survey to be able to find out what exists currently in the offices that were being assessed. And so the questionnaire survey was divided into three sections that discussed demographics of the respondents, factors that influence workspace planning, and the third one looked at the perceived level of importance of the identified factors that were being assessed. And now the results of the study showed that you know the proportion of men to women among the respondents was quite good. There was an evenly spread, you know, mix between both men and women who work within these offices. And so both genders, there was, a, there was a good spread between both the male and the female. And even in work designation, cut across the various cadres, you have people who worked as senior staff, you have people who worked under junior staff, and, you know, a, about 13.7% fell under categories of others. They were neither senior or junior staff. And then in terms of number of years, so it shows that a lot of people have worked quite some years. And so in view of all of this, it shows that the characteristics of the respondents were reasonable enough to deduce and for them to be, for the study to be able to provide appropriate responses to some of the questions. Now the study went ahead also to generate what is known as utilization rate. 
Now, this has to do with the frequency of use of those spaces and occupancy number of people who use them. And this table has been able to depict, you know, in terms of numbers of hours that is being spent, how they are being occupied. This table is just trying to this. Now, the study also went ahead to find out problems that were being identified within those workspaces. And the, the major problem was in terms of workspace density. This has to do with the population and the number of users in these workspaces. Now, the study has, it has been able to show that um, there, 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 there are a lot of people that, you know, that, is, that work. However, they are constrained within their spaces because some of these spaces have been overutilized. That is in terms of the number of people who are supposed to use them. So this is one of the major concerns that the planning process has to look into in terms of even spread of the number of people who are meant to use a particular office with a period. And so in terms of the level of importance of factors, the first 10 factors rank high, and among them are enclosures, number of windows, uh, um, ability to personalize workspaces, natural lighting, artificial lighting. These are factors that rank most important to the employees, and these factors have to be looked into critically to be able to have a very good planning process for offices, new office spaces, could be designed. And so the outcome of the analysis of these workspaces reveals that there is no concrete pattern to the planning processes found within all of these offices. Now, this suggests that the key design attributes of the workspaces may support or even impede on the activities that takes place within the offices. And so the key planning processes that have been highlighted on the right side of the slide, you know, have shown to be very important in achieving a workspace that will enhance the performance of the employees. And so this, this, these key factors are openness, density of function, furniture arrangement, flexibility, enclosure, number of users, and realization spaces. And so these are the factors that led to the, the planning process framework. Now, the factors that have been highlighted in red are the four key factors that must be put in place. That is, what requirements does that space need? And you know, you have two arrows: the physical factors and functional factors. These are factors that have to do with things that are being required for that place, for that office space to be functional. And then it goes down to being able to identify the problems and how those problems will be resolved. And so this has to do with the characteristics of the activity that takes place within the workspaces and the decision of the management for them to be able to find solutions within the problems that may arise within those workspaces. And then the next thing is workspace utilization rates. Now, this has to do with, like I said, frequency and occupancy rates. And this goes vis-a-vis -vis the work activity that takes place within those spaces. And finally, workspace problem identification for organizations to be able to identify what are the problems, what was the office designed for, and what's, what, what, is, what, what is the preference of the users. This tool has to also work hand in hand for the workspace problems to be able to be identified and for those problems to be solved. And in conclusion, the workspace cannot be designed to be a one-time final and permanent ergonomic support for all office staff, but rather it needs to be adaptable to, to be more supportive to users. And so this study recommends that the overall design and space planning of the office space should keep users in mind and be flexible enough to adapt to work changes. Thank you so much for listening and thank you. God bless you. Um, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful presentation as well. Uh, we'll go for the uh, second, uh, sorry, the next, I apologize again. Uh, the uh, next one is talking about importance of HVAC system uh, selections and reducing energy consumption uh, of buildings uh, root, um, in building root roofs case study office buildings in London. I will, if you allow me, I will share with you the uh, presentation now. Let's share. 
just a second. Yes. Okay. Hello, all. Welcome to my session on HVAC energy systems retrofit. I'm Baran Tanrıverdi. I'm a principal building physics engineer and a PhD student in Yıldız Technical University Building Physics Department. I'm delighted to be participating in the conference and will talk about a part of my PhD study today. I will introduce the importance of HVAC system selections in reducing energy consumption of building retrofits. I will do it over a London office building case study. I hope you will find it insightful. I first want to talk about the decision-making process on the topic. I'm sure most of us already seen the building energy hierarchy chart in somewhere before. And passive systems are the main driver in the recent energy efficiency studies. It's unlikely to new buildings improving the building performance with passive measures such as orientation, messing and fabric thermal performance is sometimes impossible sometimes hard to achieve, sometimes unfeasible, and mostly very expensive in existing buildings. So it comes to the point that active elements such as HVAC and lighting systems needs to be improved to achieve further energy savings. In active systems, HVAC systems are responsible for the 45 to 60 percent of the total operational energy consumption and 2 to 27 percent of the total embodied carbon in new buildings. These observations make the HVAC system focus a stronger case, and now I will introduce a performance intervention methodology on this basis. Traditional modeling approach can be a time-consuming exercise due to the simulation runtimes when it comes to test thousands of simulations. For the study I developed, a two-stage analysis methodology to test the design interventions in the existing buildings. At the first stage analysis, existing building information, which is defined as a baseline model input, modeled and simulated by an energy modeling tool capable of early energy simulation. Sensitivity analysis and calibrations is progress with the existing building metering information from various data points of the building. And the end results extracted as the early lows to feed the stage two analysis. Then these results introduced to the bespoke developed equation-based modeling script, which is a tool developed in an algorithmic modeling environment as fully parametric. The tool is only for office buildings at present but modularity allows an easy integration for different HVAC systems and different type of buildings. Tool starts iteration, the combinations with the desired inputs from the system parameters library and the early load from the calibrated results. It calculates the annual energy consumption, cost and CO2 emissions for each tested option. In the study, I use ISV dynamic modeling software for the first stage analysis to test the data and calibrate the model results and use Grasshopper, which is a rhinoceros add-on for visual scripting at the stage two analysis. This study focuses on 10 interventions in total and various parameters under those interventions to calculate annual energy consumption cost and CO2 emissions. The interventions are thermal heating air supply temperature, terminal cooling air supply temperature, fresh air air handling unit heat exchanger efficiency, fresh air air handling unit supply specific fan power, heating plant type, number of heating plant, heating plant operation, cooling plant type, number of cooling plant, and cooling plant operation. The case study is an A-plus office building in London, which is constructed in 2013. It has a gross internal area of 5,800 meters square with two basements, one ground floor, and eight upper floors. 
main HVAC systems, which introduced as the existing baseline system, are connected to a district heating system, which supplies the whole heating demand of the building. On roof, there are two air-cooled chillers, serves the cooling demand of the building. Air distributed through chilled beams and fresh air supplied by three air handling units with CAV box control. Due to the design limitations of the project, only interventions related to heating and cooling plants, upgrade to the thermal and central air handling unit systems for energy consumptions, and the supply temperatures are tested in the study. And in the table, all system types and intervention range and the number of iterations can be seen. In total, 6,912 interventions tested in this study. Results are summarized and represented in the following three slides. The chart represents the impact of each combination through a parallel coordinate plot that allows to see the impact visually. Trade-offs are analyzed to see the actual impact of each intervention over the energy consumption, CO2 emissions, and the cost. For each intervention, average consumptions of each input compared to have a better understanding over the breakdown. Some inputs have greater outcomes than the others, such as heat recovery, fund consumptions, and the plant types, which could save more energy, carbon, and cost. However, it's not limited. In the study, also the best and worst performing scenarios tested for understanding the range of benefits can be achievable by HVAC improvements. The study proves that noticeable impact of energy saving potential through HVAC systems in existing office buildings. Equation-based modeling approach enables to test bespoke options when needed in a shorter period of time compared to full-scale energy models. With the given interventions, HVAC systems could able to save 31 to 46 percent energy and 23 to 26 percent operational cost. In the given constraints, Heat recovery in air systems, even if it's only for the fresh air, is highly effective for energy saving in office buildings. With 70% heat recovery, you can save up to 18% energy, reduce the CO2 emission by 20%, and operational cost by 10%. Air source heat pumps can save up to 31% energy reduced to CO2 emissions by 45% and the operational cost by 6%. Even if it's not authenticated in the study, air source heat pumps can further save potential in initial cost and plant area requirements due to the capability of doing both cooling and heating with the same units. Last but not least, impact of number of plants and plant controls allows to save further energy and cost in existing buildings. The tested 10 interventions is only a part of the holistic HVAC modeling approach, and there is further saving allowance with other components. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> And now we end up with the uh, five uh, presentation uh, in this session. And I believe that if uh, we can open a discussion, if some, uh, anyone would like to raise the questions for our dearest five speakers uh, today, please, uh, floor is open, please.
can I can I start sharing one questions for the group of the Algerian Museum, please? Um, if they are here? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your uh, for the interesting uh, presentation for uh, Algeria, which is uh, a nice environment and uh, uh, a respectable uh, museum. Just one question about your presentation. You went through the open syntax and so on. Uh, did you consider the material? I believe that within your analysis uh, uh, and the space syntax, uh, did you consider the uh, material in the um, while the presentation and your design, or you just um, can you focused on the uh, space syntax in your in your analysis, or could be in a future uh, studies maybe? Yes, thank you, uh, Doctor, for this uh, very uh, interesting uh, question. I want. It is developed in the thesis of uh, Dr. Reed. And with my colleague, we try to pass from the theory to the practice. So the challenge was uh, an operationalization of the theory on the ground. And the case of museum was the most appropriate. Uh, we have been visitor and COVID-19 and even during the time of uh, this crisis. So uh, for this first tip, I just proposed uh, I'm sorry, but it might be technical problem for the internet maybe, or it is only from my side or from the speaker side. So I don't know. My network is not uh, stable. So uh, I said that uh, our uh, proposition uh, mm -hmm. can be su subscribed in um, uh, the first step of uh, uh, um... Can you switch off the camera? Maybe if you switch off the camera, the internet maybe will be uh, more quick, little. Yes, please. So so I said that uh, this proposition uh, is the first step of another uh, uh, steps, I guess, in the future. So uh, this, in this step, we try just to uh, the museum. And uh, I guess that in the next step, we will develop uh, the field of materials and um, our exhibition museum yeah thank you very much maybe still the internet is not stable but anyhow anyhow we appreciate your uh, kind reply uh, professor jose please floor for you please Thank you very much, dear Professor Algonaimi, and, and congratulations to the five um, colleagues who are um, sharing with us their own, um, I would say, research process. Um, especially because uh, I, I see, I see in the whole picture of these five uh, comments, maybe the the last one is a bit different, but I see always an important concerns about the quantitative uh, elements of the, the process, design process. You know? Always in, in, I will say, in more or less, in public use buildings, even the fifth one with the offices uh, building as a case study, you know, and even in the, uh, going, going, going back, you know, the, the, the problem of the museum's uh, functional organization. Uh, I well noted from your side, Professor Gonaimi, the, the point of the um, materiality and, and, uh, and, uh, and how these things can be um, interfering or, or um, um, interacting with um, the environmental things. Uh, more social elements in the first one with our dear Selma Sarawi, uh, where it was more important, you know, the, I would say the, the social um, 
performance of the of the users and the reactions of the users when they are going i don't know if for the first time or not this is not clear for me you know but in the end all of them has uh, has have done um, an important contribution for one thing which is okay let us quantify some of the factors uh, we need for the for the um, architectural design i will ask myself and maybe this is a, a kind of sorry for that um, provoking all the authors for a, for, for having some um, ideas and how important is the quantitative elements in the process design. So um, I, I give you examples. We have seen the pharmaceutical factories elements with uh, um, Oliwabuni, Oliwabuni along, I think, uh, what, uh, it, what it was a, a very important uh, aspect from an environmental point of thing, you know, qualities of the air, temperatures, and all these things. We have seen the hostel in, in Iran where uh, it was, I was expecting other, other things, you know, because of the qualitative, uh, um, I would say, properties of the uh, sound, uh, um, of, the, of, the, of the landscape where this hostel would be and is, in fact, in my opinion, you know, located. Uh, but then patterns for designing offices buildings in Lagos. I don't know, for example, if the post-COVID uh, situation is taken into consideration. Because probably so many things have changed, especially in the in the public offices buildings, where you know the public um, institutions are. Uh, it, I would say, in this case, in all over the planet. They are more integrated in the needs of changing even the procedures, the working procedures, the, the way of, of, of uh, doing this kind of, um, I would say, interactions with the last users uh, at the end. Uh, where is, in your opinion, the right point of these quantitative uh, uh, aspects to be taken into consideration in the whole holistic design process? Now, how important is this kind of uh, research? Very interesting ones in an important uh, factor where usually the architects are not so um, friends of, of, of doing this kind of things, but they are very important. So this is why the importance of your contributions. Please, please, uh, Narmin, please, uh, Selma, please, Baran, please, uh, Aloba Wini. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Jose. Are you receiving me? Yep. Yes, yes, please. Yes. So, uh, I, uh, in the field of the museum, in my thesis of, uh, of a doctorate thesis, uh, we can feel that. Uh, we are working on um, a topology of uh, space. It's a new definition of architectural space. So architectural space is often defined as the space uh, say that. And then with the uh, with the ambiences, we can give a new a definition of space and this uh, kind of definition will include temperature, light, uh, luminance, uh, all the uh, sensations if I can say that perceived by uh, the person and the definition of uh, space we can uh, give um, uh, another dimension of space, different uh, uh, new uh, and uh, perception of uh, of uh, um, so I think that. Uh, uh, the, the quantitative elements are important, but they can't be used uh, 
without uh, the or the the sensations of uh, the user in this case. So if we can combine the two of the real uh, I can, I can, if we can see uh, definition of space, but if we use just quantitative element, we will not have uh, uh, a real uh, definition of uh, space. Yes, Selma, this... thank you, thank you very much. But uh, I, I, I interpreted your your answers because I was not sure if I, 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 I understood everything, but Selma. Let me tell you, I think your, your thesis, for example, is, will be very important once you have one specific space, you have defined it previously the, as a, the container of different activities and suddenly how to, I will say, it, how to produce uh, an interior design for the coming exhibitions, you know, according to the different uh, performance of the, of the users and the reactions about what is happening. I think this is a very important approach and would be very interesting to understand that, uh, for example, um, uh, lighting, for example, you know, height of the, uh, for observing, we are always some kind of angle where we are able to, to see and to perceive better the contents and to receive the messages. I think this is a very important thing, but I will say, for example, Baran, because I think Baran is very, very interested in, in talking us uh, something. Uh, uh, let me provoke you, you know. What about cross ventilation in this uh, building in London? Is it an important factor or maybe not? Maybe it's a closed uh, yeah. uh, architecture and so on, please. So uh, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, first of all. Yeah, the cross ventilation uh, was not considered as a part of design in that building. It's just like fully a mechanically ventilated building. Uh, the reason for that in uh, London, uh, so especially when it's just like you are in the central London, there are some limitations uh, for uh, opening uh, windows, right? These are mainly coming from uh, acoustic consultants and acoustic issues, or sometimes it can be related to uh, the the security or some other items as well, and also in uh, most of the office buildings, uh, when you uh, design it without considering the control of the cross ventilation system, if it's not uh, an office building you design without any HVAC systems, it can be uh, like working together. Some people can open the windows and at the same time the AC is on so it would cost uh, an extra energy consumption so the cross ventilation uh, it's uh, important in our design uh, because like I'm a building physicist and it's just like the passive uh, design and strategies are a part of uh, my day-to-day -day thing but it should be uh, considered wisely in the design because it's not only related to ventilation, it's also related to operation uh, controls and uh, other systems as well. If we just like go back to your question about the post uh, COVID situation. So at the moment, uh, most of the guidelines related to ventilation is changed uh, according to our experience uh, during the, the pandemic. So now uh, the flow rates, the fresh air rates are changed like all filtration systems, like the, the mandatory ones uh, for office and other buildings uh, have changed. And now uh, all design uh, considered uh, with those like new regulations. Uh, and also uh, the, you know, the very interesting thing is uh, when we like review the, uh, the, the metered measured data from buildings, uh, the, you know, the, the charts, the graphs we see uh, for the consumption is like totally changed, uh, like due to all these like working from home and other issues. So yeah, it's a bit different to what we had. And 
yeah, I can say that like my area is uh, totally focused on the uh, quantity. I just like work on the numbers all the time and to understand the uh, behavior and what's ahead uh, for the CO2 and energy consumptions, uh, the quantitative method would be, should be more and more important. Yeah, can I, I ask a question? Would you please me, uh, Professor Jose, uh, to Mr. Paran again? Um, you know, in, uh, in hot region, like I'm, I'm now in, in Bahrain, so in hot climate, most of the six months, let's say, there is using air conditioning for the building. It's introvert. Everything is introvert. Sure. So we had some meetings, few meetings a few days ago about the problem of the fresh air uh, and how far that um, the design should be reconsidered, especially in the academic institution, about the uh, transition of this uh, COVID or other learning, about the closed environment and the fresh air to how far the need of fresh air in the assumptions, in the calculation, in the design as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wonder what is your opinion? Uh, yeah, it's it's defined totally differently in between like Europe and uh, United States. And I'm not sure in if in Bahrain, are you hot following country. the... Uh, it's hot, hot so yeah, this is the, the fresh air thing is, uh, from my point of view, is depend on the again the regulation you follow so in like the uh, in states uh, the reg regulation is like more strict and they would allow you less fresh air in your buildings and in Europe or in UK uh, the regulations are a bit like more uh, like human orientated I can say and the the requirement for the fresh air uh, is higher when you design it and uh, in my experience, I'm from Turkey. So in Turkey, we use both the, uh, the American and the European standards. So the performance of the buildings uh, in terms of the uh, human uh, satisfaction, I think uh, the ones we have with higher fresh air rates is uh, we, we, we can just like get uh, better uh, outcomes from all these surveys and everything. But again, like more fresh air means more energy consumption. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it should be in, in a balance, right? Yes. Yes. Um, for, um, if you allow me again, Professor Jose, one question for uh, dearest from Iran about the hostel. Okay. Uh, yes. In your, yeah, in your opinion, when you design uh, your, your proposal here about that to have a, a room with six or eight or something like that, um, uh, person within one room uh, how can we yani, how can we control the transition of for example if someone infected with COVID so it will be a problem that if they are uh, in one room so what is the opinion here in this one how can we control the infections between people in that case okay uh, at first i want to thank you uh, for both from you and uh, uh, dr jose always asking very good questions i want to acknowledge that uh, this uh, article is derived from my bachelor thesis in 2007 uh, actually it was my <laughs> first um, how can i say uh, practice in architecture that my supervisor asked me to design a hostel, not a hotel, because everyone knows about hotel, but hostel is different. And at that time, our um, data, uh, Neufert's data, architect's data, is the basic uh, regulations and rules and counting with numbers. And, uh, you know, uh, when we design at first, uh, either we come from the plan and the, the small parts together and then shape the uh, huge form or com come from the form and have the uh, small parts inside that. So it was a challenge for me to uh, be loyal to all those regulations and rules and also the uh, rules of um, hotels and inns in Iran, the regulation, three stars, two stars, uh, what do they have, they should have, they must have, they can have. And uh, the other thing about uh, the samples, if you pay attention to the Easy Hotel, it is in London, it is in the 
uh, center of London that uh, the uh, space is very, uh, how can I say, expensive. So we want to design a very little uh, small room for the especially backpackers, you know, the um, young people. It's especially for young hostel that they come with a backpack. They just put their important things in a locked room. They go and visit. They just want some uh, accommodation, very inexpensive and maybe food just to sleep at night and then again they go to somewhere else so in that place designing a little uh, room in a very small space is um, our main goal but um, that is uh, especially with uh, maximum two i mean double rooms or single rooms in that hotel but in mine uh, the hostel in uh, Gurujral, uh, I have considered the needs of the people which are uh, usually go and have picnic with their own tents there, but we don't have any uh, amenities or facilities or buildings there, but it is going to, it, it was planned to build a hotel there. So most of the students of Tabriz in Iran, they um, took um, from the school one day trip there, but we couldn't stay there. It's a very beautiful place with the lake and mountain and everywhere and the trees and I always uh, pity that there is no hotel here so we cannot stay at night so uh, one part of one floor of my design is for the students and separately for the girls and the boys because in Iran we have um, uh, separate gender uh, schools another um, uh, Another pl um, plan roof is for the families. So some families try to go there when they're, it's the weekend or some holidays. So they want to go and spend their beautiful uh, nature there. And uh, they can stay in the, in a, how can I say, inexpensive hotel or more comfi comfortable inn. So we have some rooms like three or four beds or doubles. Uh, those rooms with, um, I mean, four to eight or eight to 12, they're especially for workers hostels. Uh, it's near, a, for example, factory, it's out of the uh, city. So the workers cannot go and come or they have shifts, night shifts. So they have to spend some time there. So the room of 12 is designed for that. Me, myself, I, I am a PhD candidate now. I have studied in four different universities. I've been in dormitories with 12 uh, bedrooms uh, and you have to deal with another 10 or 11 people. It's awful. But as I said, this is designed in 2007. So I wanted to be loyal to that study. But as it was in Persian language, I tried to translate everything to English and update according to the even German and English version of Neufert Architects data uh, to publish it worldwide because it took uh, something like three semesters of me and I worked very strictly on that numbers and regulations and how to do that so i thought it's a pity that people don't see this design and it's just in persian language and nobody read it so mm -hmm. i wanted to translate it but about the question of jose dr jose hoja that uh, he's always asking very good questions i think we should consider those numbers because uh for example a bathroom cannot be uh larger than a bedroom it should have some limitations, but we should consider that these areas are designed for humans. So we should consider uh, which users are going to be stay there. For example, as I said, for students, it is they might come something like four or eight students at one night together spending a holiday there. They might even have fun and don't sleep because we didn't sleep at night when we are gathered with students but a family for four uh, bedrooms uh, again a smaller family three or a couple yes. double and single people with one i think i answered as much as i understand the question yes okay yeah for uh, for sake of time and i would like to thank you very much for your uh, answer and if you allow us we can go for the second session and thank you, Ms. Nariman, for your uh, answering. Uh, we'll go for the, um, uh, the uh, next presenters for the uh, uh, 
research under the title of Effects of Indoor Operational Environment on Work in Works Well Being in Industrial Buildings, the case of uh, Pharma Shiswal Factory in Nigeria. And yeah, uh, yes, okay. So I will go for uh, the uh, presentation now. I believe there is a, sorry, I apologize. Just to manage it. It's the same. Uh, okay. Share, now I'm sharing. Yes, please. John Agmada, and I'm doing a presentation on effect of indoor operational environment on workers' well-being in industrial buildings, a case for pharmaceutical factories in Nigeria. The primary objective of a building is to provide a sheltered housing that is comfortable, convenient, and safe, and even attractive to its users. Although the pharmaceutical factory is not just any other building because it houses the drug production process, Hence, it's built to be safe, to be serene, and a controlled indoor environment. Indoor air has a large share of impact on the building and its inhabitants compared to outdoor air, and this is largely due to the composition of both biological and chemical com contaminants that are suspected to be therein. Chemical com components or contaminants include um, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, asbestos, as well as construction chemicals. Uh, biological contaminants include even pests, dust, and even house plants. And it's been proven that these contaminants can cause a wild range of sicknesses, including the sick building syndrome. Indoor air quality is found to be important to the health and productivity of the building users. Uh, researchers have agreed that uh, air pollution is the biggest environmental health problem in the world. Air pollution leads to a wide range of health challenges, climatic and ecological issues. It contaminates the air with a high amount of toxic air and particulate matter in the atmosphere. Researchers have defined workers' productivity as the amount of goods and services that the worker produces at a given amount of time as relating to the availability of raw materials right tools and, or equipment, construction technology of the building where they work, the political factors, the financing, and the environmental factors. What contributes to workers' productivity is the workplace environment. And research has also asserted that among the factors that can influence work environment are morals among colleagues, increased stress, and a range of other issues. Lagos and Ogun State, Nigeria, or um, West, Southwest Nigeria, were chosen largely because of the number of pharmaceuticals which are the highest in Nigeria that are located in those states. Handheld instruments such as multifunctional air quality dictators were used to carry out the measurement. These are some pictures of the instruments that were employed for this research. Sampling technique involved the selection of four pharmaceutical factories selected through judgmental or purposive sampling. Inclusive and exclusive criteria were, were used. Non-response rate prediction after the pilot survey was, was also used in the selection of the factories. And um, all the measurements were, were carried out in 15, at 15 points in in the production areas of these pharmaceutical factory buildings. While they were fully functional, drugs being produced, workers working and machines were running. Instruments were placed on a height of between one meter to 1.2 meter of height to maintain consistency. The pharmaceutical factories were categorized into three, small, medium, and large, and the factors determining that included the number of workers, the number of drugs produced, and the size of the production hall. 
uh, correlation and uh, strength of significance were carried out between the dependent and independent variables, where, for instance, the, uh, the readings in red showed um, that there was a strong relationship and significance among these factors. For instance, uh, air velocity was seen to react with uh, particulate matter 1.0 and um, it was significant and the relationship was strong and high. The ones in blue were significant but the relationship, uh, the strength were only moderate and not that high. Um, the workers' productivity were also uh, measured through the result of the group statistics, um, highlighting the productive and non-productive mean standard deviation and least-wise value of the variables considered in the survey. Also, the, this table shows the workers' uh, productivity were also measured in respect to the, relation, the relative humidity, which was found to be amongst the highest uh, air velocity, lighting, sound, and air flow was found to be the least. The test of equality of group mean was also carried out using the Wilkes uh, Lamba test to measure the significance of each of the variables that were measured. Temperature uh, from between temperature up to sound were found to be highly significant, while from particulate matter to airflow were least uh, significant. And then the standard canonic discriminant function coefficient was also carried out using the SPS. The structure matrix was also arranged in the, in the hierarchy of their influence and how uh, they, they, they show the best predictor with coefficients beginning with uh, total voltaic organic compound to formaldehyde to the particulate matter 1.0 and uh, uh, carbon dioxide. This result implies that each of the observed independent variables contributed to the dependent variables explanation in, the, in a significant way. The highest degree of relationship was indicated by total voltaic organic compound, uh, though it was, it was negative. The canonic discriminant function coefficient was also measured and the coefficient of light, lighting, particulate matter 1.0, uh, 2.5, carbon dioxide is 0, 0.00, which implies that these variables affect workers' productivity in pharmaceutical factories, which is the presence of carbon dioxide is expected to be a 0, 0.00 in this uh, pharmaceutical factory buildings. In conclusion, therefore, the result of the data analysis showed a, a varied correlation between dependent and independent variables from factory to factory. The outcome was understandably so because all factories were producing different drugs at uh, the time of the survey. For those that were even producing similar kind of drugs, for instance, tablet, it was unlikely that uh, the same tablet was being produced, therefore different kind of chemical component and quantity was being utilized. And even if it was the same tablet, we saw that the conditions were not exactly the same, the number of workers were not exactly the same, and the, no the size of the production hall couldn't have been the same. And the independent variables such as formaldehyde, total botanic or organic compound, and the three particulate matters were a result of the chemical contaminants suspended in the uh, indoor air as the quantity in use determined the rate of contamination. The source of uh, carbon dioxide 
was mainly as a result of the workers inhaling and exhaling uh, breathing in the uh, indoor environment. Therefore, the amount of dependent variable differ from factory to factories. Workers complaint of illnesses were traceable to poor uh, design features. Thank you for the privilege and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. We'll go for the uh, next uh, paper. And uh, sorry, again, we will share the second uh, presenter. It is for the role of attraction factors in recreational shopping uh, graft uh, uh, factions, the case of Colombo in Sri Lanka. I believe it will be by Miss uh, Venica. I will uh, share now the uh, presentation. Can please share? Yes, please enjoy the presentation, please. Hello, everyone. I'm going to present on the topic, the role of attraction factors in recreational shopping gratification, a case of Colombo, Sri Lanka. These are the contents of our presentation. Moving to the background, according to many researchers, shopping is not only an activity for purchasing, but also for recreation. Shopping malls can be considered as solid components of urban space with easy access to goods and services, social interaction, and improved quality of urban living. Thus, it is important to identify and understand the factors which attracts people for recreational shopping in shopping malls. And also, mall affects the emotional and cognitive responses. Therefore, people use malls to gratify different requirements. According to Shim et al., there is an absence of literature related to shopping malls in the field of recreation. The lack of academic research leads to difficulties to satisfy the expectations of recreational shoppers. Although homogeneity can be discovered anywhere in the world, a diverse setting can be provided by the local differences and economic circumstances. Thus, there is a research need for shopping malls considered as recreational places. The significance of the research is it will help in designing and maintaining the recreational shopping places in urban context. And also, the study findings will be helpful for investors, developers, policymakers, and urban planners. The objective of the research is to examine the role of attraction factors in recreational shopping gratification. The research question is what are the attraction factors that influence recreational shopping gratification? The hypothesis of the research is there is an influence of more attraction factors in the recreational shopping gratification. Moving to the literature, consumer culture theory is adapted for the study as it strives for the general understanding of a particular phenomenon and it is related to consumers' perception in relation to meanings, symbols, and experiences. According to Hirschman and Colebrook, there are two perceptions in consumption, utilitarian and hedonic. The value of utilitarian is towards an accomplishment of a task which is purchasing, while the value of hedonic is more biased towards fun and liveliness. The studies of Jim et al. and Backstrom interprets that recreational shopping cannot be explained by utilitarian or hedonic concepts alone because it should be accepted irrespective of the initial purpose is utilitarian or hedonic. These are the attraction factors found from the previous studies. Considering the mole attraction factors and gratification, Funk shows that a shopper's subjective values, expectations, perceptions, and motivations in the process can intensely influence the shopping involvements as well as leisure participation. It is assumed that consumers' happiness in mole motivates their objective to revisit, encouraging the frequency of trips, and automatically, their purchase intention. Steen checked that 
the gratification shopping motive is positively interconnected to sales design. The atmospherics of a shopping mall can make a contribution at the satisfaction or the dissatisfaction of a patron by influencing his or her perceptions. Let's move to the materials and methods. Colombo is taken as the case study area since it has large shopping malls and it is the commercial capital of Sri Lanka. For the selection of shopping malls, several criteria were considered. With the field observation for verification, two shopping malls, namely one Goldface and Colombo City Center are selected for the study. A mixed method is adapted for the study where a quantitative survey followed by a qualitative interview is employed with more emphasis to the quantitative part. In the quantitative data collection, a questionnaire survey was conducted where the attributes were asked in a five-point Likert scale based on their importance. Snowball sampling method was followed. The minimum sample size required for the factor analysis is 160. However, to eliminate errors and to get a decent sample for the regression analysis, 220 representatives were examined. The young age group of 18 to 40 is targeted. In the qualitative data collection, an in-depth interview was conducted with 30 shoppers to understand the real meaning of the attraction attributes. In the method of analysis, the quantitative method of analysis includes exploratory factor analysis, correlation, and regression analysis. An exploratory factor analysis using principal component analysis with orthogonal Verimax rotation was conducted in SPSS. The correlation analysis was done to see the casual relationship. The correlation with gratification and the correlation between each factors were tested. The regression analysis was done to see the influence of each attraction factors on gratification. In the qualitative analysis, narrative inquiry was followed. Here, the actual meaning of attraction attributes and the relationship were explored. Let's move to the analysis and findings. These are the attributes selected for the factor analysis. Before going to further analysis, KMO measure of sampling adequacy and Bartlett's test for sphericity were checked. The KMO statistics falls under the range of marvelous. Thus, the sample size is adequate and the Bartlett's test shows the sample size is significant. Some attributes were removed based on the removal criteria. Finally, 16 attributes supported factoring. The number of factors need to be extracted was determined based on the script plot. After checking the script plot, it is identified there can be five factors extracted. The five factors were named as ambience, convenience, facilities and management, safety and security, and socialization. Cronbach's alpha test for internal consistency was checked and it resulted all factors are reliable according to Nunali's recommended level of 0.6. More lighting, temperature, and interiors are coming under ambience, convenient mall location, recreational space, relaxing benches, and cleanliness are coming under convenience, lifts and escalators, floor plan or layout, facilities for elderly and dis differently abled are coming under facilities and management, security against act of terror, safety for children, and safety for ladies and elderly are coming under safety and security, malls are a good place to meet friends, good place to relax and spend time, and good place to good place for window shopping are coming under socialization. In the correlation analysis, there was no high correlation identified. Four out of five factors showed 1% significant positive relationship with gratification. In the regression analysis, predictive variables, ambience, safety and security, and socialization reached the standards of statistical significance. These are the factors influencing gratification. Thus, certain validation was found for the hypothesis. As you can see here, the outputs of exploratory factor analysis were identified as meaningful in the narrative inquiry. Further, an additional factor called fun and entertainment was found. Let's move to the discussion and conclusion. 
The study reveals six small attraction factors, namely ambience, convenience, facilities and management, safety and security, socialization, and fun and entertainment. Ambience, safety and security, and socialization are significant predictors of gratification, while socialization is the most important factor influencing recreational shopping gratification. The findings of the attraction factors show some complements as well as contradictions with previous studies. In the recommendations, a strong recommendation will be taken into account the attraction factors considered by people when the purpose is recreation. This is the time to rethink and redesign the urban public spaces as well as the old shopping malls with the attraction factors that people are demanding. Town planners and mall managers need to address the future needs by considering the findings of this study. Developing high-end malls is related to the quality of life. It also means social upgrading of people. Developing world-class malls will be more profitable for the potential tourism destinations. And the research area can be expanded by focusing on different age category of consumers. These are the references used. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we'll go for the uh, second, uh, next, uh, sorry, next presenter. Uh, we'll go for the uh, rule, uh, sorry, the lit, uh, literature review for the correlation of storefronts, visibility, and store at, uh, uh, attractiveness uh, by uh, Ms. Uh, Nadia. I believe she uh, has her presentation here. If allow me, I will uh, share it with you now. <clears throat> yes, uh, please enjoy the presentation, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Nadia from Universitas Indonesia. Today, I will be presenting about a literature review of the correlation between storefront visibility and store attractiveness. The issue comes from a fact that technology and digitalization has changed the way people shop. The shift comes in terms of shopping activity, where people prefer shopping in e-commerce than in in-store shopping. In this graphic, uh, you can see it, uh, a survey conducted by Rakuten Insight in 2020. It describes that shopping frequency in e-commerce is always higher than shopping malls. This means that e-commerce has become a threat to physical stores in general. To adapt to the changes, we need to improve the user's shopping experience during the in-store shopping. Duono's research stated that there is three superiority of in-store shopping, which are the ability to touch the product, the presence of instant goods, and direct ownership right at the moment. Uh, these three benefits of in-store shopping were examined, and the result showed that built-up environments entertainment activities and shopping experiences cannot be replaced by digitalization. Therefore, the feasibility of built-up environments becomes crucial to the sustainability of physical stores. So we want to address that conventional storefronts are not enough to compete against e-commerce. We need a more feasible storefront to increase the occupancy rate of in-store shopping. But in reality, uh, the first storefront visibility has to be attractive enough to attract customers. We understand that currently there is no single research that examines this matter. So we aim to ask, what is the relationship between storefront visibility and store attractiveness? To answer this, the method we are going to use are defining the keywords, looking at previous studies, and hold a discussion about the finding ended by conclusion. Uh, there are three keywords, storefront, visibility, and store attractiveness. Uh, the word storefront has been known since 1850 as the front of a shop or building facade. It is also uh, an urban visual element that can shape human perceptions. An interactive storefront can provide visual stimulation. Experts also agree that humans and buildings proximity increase the opportunity to see or enjoy the building. 
So we define storefront as an interactive and accessible building facade to the city's highway, which can be a stimulant for human activities. The second is visibility, which comes from a Latin word, fide, that means to see. Building visibility is said to make the memory of a place stronger and can be a control tool to regulate human behavior. These, uh, several researchers have used 2D and 3D visibility measurements in various discourse. So we define visibility as the appearance of an object from a certain point, which can influence human perceptions, behaviors, and purchasing decisions. The last keyword is third attractiveness which means to draw along in Latin. Uh, all researchers agree that store attractiveness affect consumer behavior. So we define store attractiveness as a representation of visitor behavior showed by traffic, which is related to physical and psychological aspect of the store environment. The previous studies about storefront uh, have used many methods to measure storefronts, either qualitatively through factorization, observation, questionnaire, and comparison, or quantitative ways like mobile eye tracking and automation. All studies agree that interactive storefront can impact customers' perception and behavior, but they only focus on the interaction of humans and building. They do not describe why it happened why it did uh, a transparent storefront bring more customers to the shop. This is the gap that we stress. <clears throat> then uh, previous studies about uh, store attractiveness was mostly measured up, uh, subjectively using factor analysis, uh, correlation, and also regression. The factor itself were extracted from subjective variables, as you can see that all the diagrams are all subjective variables. But the issue here is the fact that previous studies only related store attractiveness to consumer behavior. We think there is a gap here. Uh, a storefront need to be visible first before the consumer can be attracted. The existing research never correlates uh, storefront visibility to consumer behavior. And the last one is visibility. Research about visibility has been conducted since 1979 by using many methods. It has been examined in qualitative and quantitative approach and widely used in geography, landscape, urban, and architectural study. But it is only high research research that examines the study or the relationship between shopping experience and rental price by using visibility. Uh, a little explanation is that the first measurement of visibility was conducted by Benedict by using one source of light uh, to develop isophysic map. Then Gibson studies uh, visibility in ecological approach that the observers can move when seeing something. In 2001, uh, Turner developed a visibility graph analysis by representing the movement by point. Uh, then it was evolved again by Yilu and so and also Lim by the presence of depth maps X, uh, VAA and VGA. But none of the studies are developing a formula for visibility value. Only Ramadan's research developed a formula that uh, visibility value is the visitor's ability to view the store area or store uh, store volume. This study was then continued by Harinisa in 2021 by proving that uh, store visibility is positively correlated to the rental price. Uh, however, the existing body of research has defined visibility as the combination of store area and traffic frequency. In reality, um, store from visibility affects store attractiveness and subsequently store attractiveness will affect the rental price. It has not discussed the correlation between store from visibility and store attractiveness. According to previous research, we learned that storefront is related to visual design. Therefore, it impacts human behavior and visual design and human behavior influence each other. We also learned that uh, visual design visibility is related to human behavior, which in turn also influence layout visibility. 
visibility had also measured qualitatively and uh, quantitatively by lots of researchers. The experts agreed that store attractiveness is a result of human behavior. So the gap we want to address here is because there is no single research that combines the three uh, and examines the relationship between them. We find that visibility can be used as a method to explain the relationship between storefront and store attractiveness. As a concept, visibility begins with the observer's ability to see an object, and it can be seen both statically and dynamically. Uh, although previous researchers use uh, a point to represent human movement, but we realize that uh, humans uh, do not have a 360 degree field of vision and our visual quality uh, depends on distance. So we position ourselves to agree with Ramadan and Hironisa that uh, the visibility value is seen as a subject based matter. As a conclusion, to adapt with the shift in shopping activity, we argue that a relationship between visibility and retail price has been conducted by Hironisa need to be more specific. We have to complete the missing body of research that uh, storefront visibility need to be attracted uh, need, and need to attract the, cus the customer before it influences the retail price. Uh, here, we are not aiming to provide a methodology uh, to provide a new methodology in visibility value, but to separate it, to separate the visibility and visitor traffic variables. To wrap it up, I'd like to say that this research contributes as a literature study that can be developed for practical and academic purpose, either in qualitative or quantitative analysis. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, today I will be thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Um, uh, we have the second or uh, second presenter, yes, Miss um, uh, Sumeya. She is going to present for us. Uh, Professor Jose, please, do you like to ask a question, please, or to add something? No, 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 no. I, I, I only was uh, applauding because I like it very much. Sorry. <laughs> it's very similar. Yes. It's very similar the the icon, but uh, it was only a, a applauding. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, yes. It, Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes. Maya Rahmani. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, Ms. Somaya, she is here. She would like to share her uh, presentation. Uh, uh, in her research under the title of Energy Efficiency Benchmarking Review of Key uh, Policies, uh, Genesis uh, Program Development of North Algeria, Case of Algeria. Uh, Ms. Sumeya, you can, uh, you can share your uh, presentation, please, from your side. Yes, please. Um, excuse me, you have to um, do the same. Uh, you are repeating the same mistake which I did it. Please share with sound, please. Can you stop sharing and then share again with sound, please? Please, would you show me how to share to the sound? Yes, yes, share with there is icon sound, just do take in this uh, icon, please. You can find it to the uh, left side. As well, yes, sir. I suppose. Hello, good. 
committees speakers and attendees. This is Rahmani Sumeya, PhD student uh, in Gidawan University, affiliated to ETAP Laboratory uh, in Algeria. I'm going to present our work titled uh, Me and uh, Dr. Kaula Dalal and Dr. Mohamed Hamdi. Uh, the contribution is titled Energy Efficiency Benchmarking, a review of key policies, agencies, uh, program development in North Africa case of Algeria. Uh, so this work is about the diagnosis and analysis of key policies in uh, Algeria and the energy efficiency benchmarking and discuss the gap in the timeline and most effective indicators uh, to reach higher levels in the originated system. So to introduce this work, we should pass by the context of uh, this study, as shown in figures, uh, the global environmental indicators uh, to key develop, uh, took uh, lower ranges versus the growth in the construction industry statistics. This rises the proportion of threats per human activity, uh, especially the changes in land use, which led to an important ecological footprint values uh, in uh, the next figure. Uh, due also to the rapid urbanization and industrialization and uh, the fast growth of construction field. Moreover, uh, the energy consumption in global built environments attended the 36% between construction industry and the building sector, uh, where the residential sector attended uh, the highest percentage with uh, 22%. Uh, our case study is from Africa, uh, spe specifically Algeria, uh, which is a developed country. Uh, we held an analysis approaches and a comparison approach uh, to, uh, to another country similar uh, with, a, with a similar uh, history and politically, economically and ethnicity um, situation from Asia, which is Malaysia, uh, that jumped from a developing country to a developed country according to the World Bank report. So the deal with uh, energy efficiency benchmarking, uh, we should overcome the barriers of uh, energy efficiency gap, uh, which uh, are specified in a literature review uh, with economic market failures, economic market barriers, behavioral failures, barriers, uh, organizational barriers and the institutional barriers which uh, is the which is the point that we are going to um, focus in it in this uh, work uh, which uh, caused by political institutions include regulatory uh, problems and lack of policy coherence and control codes. So the objective of this uh, study is to diagnose the agencies, institutions of energy efficiency and energy benchmarking in Algeria also in Asia and clarify their measures and charges, uh, extract the institutional modes and scales through the analytical uh, framework, also define the gap uh, that contribute to the delay of African countries' uh, uh, buildings efficiency, case study of Algeria. As uh, a method, well, we have um, chosen the energy institution, institutional process uh, and divided it into uh, two main steps, uh, two main approaches, the analysis one and the comparative one. For the analysis approach, we uh, have uh, we are going to analyze the key authority institutions through the standard bodies, energy authority, building inspection offices, and conveniences. Uh, for the comparative approaches, we are going to compare an African country with the nation one, a developed and a developed country. Uh, uh, Pass through uh, the same path, and we are going to uh, analyze. Um, we are going to compare the institutional um, structure and extract the gaps in timeline, setup, and development. For uh, the method and uh, the materials, uh, we have um, ser uh, a series of tables. A series of uh, tables uh, that uh, are going to uh, uh, specify the specify the agencies, institutions, the summary of the years and the units, uh, goals and uh, faces in both Algeria and Malaysia. Uh, as a result and the discussion, we have uh, we have introduced we have introduced a typical Sankey diagram for the institutional uh, modes and scales uh, as a typical analysis framework uh, through um, through the modes uh, the modes of uh, institutions, uh, technical requirements, legal frameworks, and institutional setup to the types of uh, institutions uh, from industrial, commercial, and research and development. Uh, jump into the scales of contributions with the building inspection, compliance and uh, control and compliance, also the energy authority and uh, finalizing 
and at last application modes whether mandatory voluntary or mixed as uh, like we can see here the samples were typically governmental in both uh, sectors so, um, whether industrial commercial or uh, research and development uh, the gaps uh, found are the remarkable gap in timeline slow grow up in the exist of the existing agencies and institutions the absence of development of control and compliance scores uh, also, the absence of, super, of, of supervision calls to apply regularities and develop them. The graphs has shown the remarkable first gap in timeline for the case of Algeria, uh, where typically related to the political situation, the black decade full of terrorism actions and uh, an unstable social life. Uh, for the second gap uh, in the uh, timeline between um, 2004 and uh, 2019, the reasons were economically, uh, the economical uh, crisis, also a civil manifestation and an unstable governmental statute. For the institutionalization theory, uh, the Algeria institutional uh, um, situation are uh, situated in the red spot according to the institutional logic theory and the Malaysian one is uh, in the green one uh, gathering all the scales and modes of institutions. To conclude, uh, the brief review on agencies uh, that's held in this um, that's held in this uh, work uh, shows the responsibility of organizing the regulatory of energy efficiency in Algeria um, and, show, and shows that the development line of this sector is quite slow according to the chronological diagnosis. Uh, the pinpoint of authority institutions and agencies that are helped to implement the energy efficiency in the national buildings field clarify that we have in Algeria a poor energy field cause according to foreign experience in uh, energy efficiency and benchmarking that assured the control and the compliance of the regularities. The remarkable gap in time and results that contribute to the delay of Algerian buildings efficiency the, uh, to the international railway of, um, to, toward the sustainability is resumed in the slow grow up of the existing agencies and cores, also in the development of other cores that can contribute in applying such regularities and develop new ones to accomplish national and international goals to remain sustainability and protect the plants. It is frequently suggested that the cause of control and the compliance should be injected in the energy efficiency regularity sector, so the existed the regularities see the light according to the protocols. The normative research in energy efficiency sector rely on the evaluation of the applicable regularities so it could be developed and work long to better results. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Would you please, can you stop sharing, please? Yeah, very good. Uh, we'll go for the uh, second, uh, next uh, presenter. Uh, sorry, okay. Uh, would you please go for uh, enjoying the effects of developing information technology on 26th century library uh, architecture? Uh, please go ahead. Hello, I will present about the effect of developing information technologies on 21st century library architecture. The information has been recorded for storage, protection, forwarding, and use. Information research has started to be collected in different places like a collection. The development of reading space according to the period is shown below. Information and communication technologies is started to develop from the second half of the 12th century. It was first integrated into library management system from 1960. After the 1990s, individuals start to access information from all sides of the library. At this point, Rai Oldham must define the concept of first space for libraries. After IPLA defined three new roles for libraries, learning center, cultural center, and information center. The new roles created an opportunity for libraries to renew and adapt. The opinions of libraries, academics, architects, and users working on a good library design have been directly and indirectly affected in the formation of new design criteria. Firstly, urban location and accessibility. Libraries should be located in a place where everyone can easily access them. Disability, aesthetics, 
in an image, libraries should become the symbol of a new kind of the environment in the, center, in the center of urban life and culture. Offering different activities, the role of a um, learning center and the concept of third space reveal the necessity of different learning environments and social cultures today in libraries. In their access and routing, because libraries are multifunctions and complex, circulation should be easily monitored and vertical circulation should be visible. Space organization, when blaming the space, the horizontal and vertical agents to connect them should be maintained. Access to collections, access to information research of local and different cultures should be provided in libraries. Learning process, libraries should be space that supports individual and collaborative learning. Possibility is handled in three different dimensions. Economic dimensions, it is to reach prosperity with economic development by creating brain power, which is the material unit as such as in the 21st century. Social dimensions, everyone should benefit equally from social service such as education and health care. Environment dimension, it aims to protect and research and balance in the ecosystem. Smart, comfortable interior elements, the library interior elements should be of territory that will provide comfort conditions for everyone. Spatial impact quality, in library design, attention should be paid of the visual harmony, acoustic and climate comfort, which affect the performance of users, physical, leisure, and physical. In this study, we will examine how new design criteria are added in the international library buildings opened after the 2000s. Firstly, second, um, Sandai Mediatek, designed by Toyo Ito, was opened to the public in, in Japan. The table shows layout of functions by followed. Toyo Ito has separated all functions within the library Expect for the conference and administrative office with interior element and cart. There are 13 different city created the last two are vertical circle element. Different materials are used on the facade in accordance with the functions and climate comfort. Everyone can access the library, which is located in the busy city center. The library building is distinguished by its transfer cubic volume. In addition to the information and learning space open to everyone used in the library, there are computer technology and, and social cultural areas. Different circulation points are created in the open plane design. Functions are separate between clothes, main entrance, library, information and communication center, exhibition areas, and workshops. The library collections are present to the user on open shelves. There are reading areas, meeting rooms, and open workshops areas within the library that support individual and collaborative learning. The library building supports sustainability with its functions and an architectural design strategies. Diversity is provided in the interior elements of the library. Expect for the separation of the sign functions with curtains Attention has been paid to visual comfort with color harmony in the interior. Acoustic and climate comfort are provided with architectural design techniques. Secondly, Library of Birmingham um, was opened to the public in United Kingdom. Library is mean and has connected to the repertory theater. The Shakespeare Memorial Room, designed in 1882, is integrated into the library is at Citrotunda. National light and ventilation are provided inside the library with the book rotunda and the underground outdoor performance area in the library square. Different facets in the inter interior are materials are used for acoustic comfort. Everyone can access the library, which is located together with the social cultural area in the city center. It distinguishes itself from other buildings with its modern facade design and use of color. A multifunctional program with the social cultural function, which includes different education and activities area, is present in the library. The book rotunda of the library building is a central uh, circulation point. 
More functions of view distance, they are located on the ground and on the floor close, the, uh, close, the, close to the ground. Collections are openly present to users between floors. Open study and sitting areas, group rooms, meeting rooms support both individual and collaborate work. The library building supports sustainability with its functions and design strategies. Diversity and comfort are provided in, the in three elements of the library. Visual, acoustic, and limited comfort is provided by color harmony in interior and architectural design of the library and it is technical details. Finally, Dopi Library was opened to the public in Denmark. The building is part of the plan to revitalize the former industry report area and incorporate the history report into the city. The building <coughs> located by the sea benefits from the natural cooling effects of water the air. With the compact form, has load in is reduced as much as possible. Solar panels and lamps are used. The library building is located on the late rail system in a busy city center. It is distinguished from the surrounding structures by the form uh, of an ice pool on the raised ground. In addition to the library, reading and study areas, social cultural space are also included. There are circulation elements at many different points in the open plain library. Functions are divided into main entrance and libraries, administrative units and libraries, and finally rentable offices. The collections are open to the user with reading, studying, and sitting area. Project and learning rooms, open studies area, and rentable office in the library are suitable for individual and collaborative learning process. The library building sub, uh, supports sustainability with its functions and architectural design strategies. Diversity and comfort are provided in interior elements. Visual, acoustic, and climate comfort color harmony in the interior is provided by the architecture design strategies of the library. When we come to the findings, in the table, you can see the evaluation of the new design criteria. It is understood that the three library buildings examined have designed that contain with the new design criteria. In this context, new functions, new rules, and new design criteria emerged as a result of the digitalization have revived a new vision in libraries. As a result, those libraries with the support, social and educational learning and teaching model reflect a user-oriented design project and make positive considerations to the urban life with their economic architecture. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we'll, uh, let me start. Uh, sorry, stop uh, sharing. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for uh, the, this five interesting presentation. Um, and I appreciate uh, your uh, different topics, but most of them are very interesting. And uh, I'm wondering about the future of the pandemic, what it will be done, especially for for example, for Colombo, for the library, uh, to how far the impact in future, especially that WHO through the responsibility for the architects about doing the indoor spaces and uh, most of the buildings are enclosure and so on. So they uh, said about the responsibility coming from the designers about uh, the indoor and the help in spreading the viruses. So we, we believe that there will be um, a lot of changes like uh, Professor Ataya today morning and Professor Hussein, uh, their discussion as well. Uh, floor for you, we have about uh, three minutes to end up our session or more, less, less than three minutes. Okay. <laughs> so uh, floor is open. If anyone would like to ask any questions, please, or to explain more if it's uh, something, please. Yes, please, Professor Jose, please. Yes, sorry for, for being so um, repetitive, you know. I, I mean, um, very, very, very interesting session, even because of uh, at the end, 
almost all the, the different uh, uh, papers are, are merging on one side. It's not only the quantification factors, in this case, more qualitative even. Visibility, attractiveness. Uh, curiously, the, the, the factor of the mall centers, as you referred, Professor Albonaimi, especially, you know, the, the capacity of these mall centers to transform our concept of public spaces, which is very curious. They are develop, developed in, within a, a private space, or at least uh, private management spaces, you know, uh, but they are considered today as a public spaces where we have lost the, the one of the important sense of the of the public spaces, which is okay, free, free in terms of I don't need to pay for, for being there or I'm not obliged to consume. Well, this is an, an, an very important factors in so many developing countries, as you know quite well, you know. I I am um, um I am very, very, very concerned about one thing in the last uh, um, paper about the uh, type, the library uh, typology. I think it's uh, Mrs. Uh, or Miss Seda um, um, had a very interesting approach where at the end the conclusion could be even the typology, the library typologies are very, very different. First of all, we lost the, the typologies regarding to the, I would say, to the cinemas. Suddenly, the cinemas were transformed in another kind of uh, architectures. Today, probably, the libraries are with us with uh, this, uh, this device, oh, the, 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 the cell phone uh, devices are, are our new libraries. I remember quite well uh, how important it was to have a very powerful, um, I will say, literature review when I did my PhD, but it was Less last century, you know. Today, uh, the, <laughs> I mean, all people has a lot of of, of information. Has I will say so much information, and they are overwhelmed because of the quantity of information they are able to to get in only one point six seconds or even less. But it is a very important question, you know, how the the transformation processes of the. Um, of uh, Seda's paper uh, regarding to the libraries, because at the end, uh, Birmingham Library is everything according to the pictures I saw, except the the conventional factor, uh, the conventional uh, role of a library. And then I have a doubt. Don't worry, please, uh, Professor Gonami, because of the time. But I, I I will I am very curious about one thing, which is uh, the the paper presented by. Uh, uh, Dr. Sumia Rahmani, that where um, um, uh, she compared Malaysia with Al Al Algeria, with uh, Algeria, Algeria, you know? I mean, uh, I am really uh, surprised. Why this, which are the criteria for, for in this case, comparing these two cases? Are uh, geographical criteria, climatic, because energy is an important factor related to the climate. I would like to understand better, and and I would like even to to provoke the last uh, the last uh, lady, Mrs. or Miss Seda, in order to to understand what happened with the libraries or what will happen with the libraries. But let us start with Malaysia and Algeria, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, contribution, and I appreciate your. Uh, question. So the criteria of the choice of the case of studies between Algeria and uh, Malaysia, they have um, a similar uh, historical background from colonization to uh, economical from um, like Malaysia. It was a, develop, a developing uh, country before, but now according to the World Bank report, it is a developed country. So Algeria is on the same, hopefully we are on the same path to Malaysia. So it is like an example for Algeria to, uh, to work uh, toward the international railway of uh, uh, energy efficiency development. I hope you have received that. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you very much. You know, this is your point of view. I continue to have my doubts, but of course, you are the specialist in this case, and I am only a learner, you know. So it's the first time I saw this comparison between Malaysia and Algeria. 
but but uh, I can understand that could be very important. The problem at the end is sometimes we are losing our capacity <clears throat> to to select. <clears throat> We are so, I will say, uh, with all my respect, uh, Ms. Sumia, I will say that we are so um, uh, forced by the numbers. And sometimes we are not looking at, even from a cultural point of view, surely the energy we are, uh, we are uh, consuming in one country or in another culture would be even different, you know? But of course, with all this, uh, I will say, uh, restriction or I, I will understand that the, the economic factor in the end, as this is what you managed, it uh, could be similar. So I don't have anything to, of course, to, to highlight in this case. But I thank you very much because I learned today something more, you know, Malaysia and Al 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 Algeria can be compared from this perspective, but this is an important thing. And now, uh, Ms. Seda, please, I don't know if you are here. I am here, sorry, and could you uh, say yeah. that yes. again, um, I'm speaking in English little. No, what I wanted to understand is which is your vision according to the interesting work you have done about the future of the libraries. How can you extrapolate results to your region, to your local context? This is my my perception, you know, we are today in a very, a very, very highly developed in the in the global scale. We are able to understand what happened in Mongolia yesterday. It was for me, it was impossible uh, in, in, in for so many years, but we are able to know. But now, uh, how uh, can we uh, extrapolate the, the results from Mongolia, for example, you know, or for Birmingham library, to the libraries you need to, to develop in your country just now. It's, it's a, a, my curiosity, you know, so, so sorry for that. I am, in my opinion, new roles and new functions, it has became an institution that revitalizes the city and supports the society. Mm. So um, I think um, a new identity has emerged in front of first library. And library building is very important for society, city. Yes. Yes, um, uh, Ms. Seda, one question on, oh, yeah, 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 sure, Professor Gonaimi, please, please go ahead. Yeah, Sorry, no, no. because we are a lot of time, Professor. I apologize, but we have to. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> it, it, it's it's going on. Me uh, say that we will talk, and I will I will do the the question by the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Gonaimi, with your important contribution, keeping the rules and so on. Thank you, and thank so you very much. Yes, yeah, thank you for all, and for the co-chair, uh, Dr. Selma. Thank you very much for your support, and thank you, Professor Jose. We need to close the session now and we appreciate your efforts and thank you very much. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you. Salam alaikum. Mm, I, I think the impact of information and communication technologies on information research and social structures, new roles have been defined for libraries. And this station, the new, new roles, necessary innovation in the function, functional and architecture formation of libraries. And um, that's, um, that's why libraries start to be renewed and Libraries have been centers of learning and culture, as well as being information centers. Yes, that's all. Thank you.
who are the dear Seda. Meanwhile, uh, the, the, the coming session is uh, arriving in such moment. I don't know when. Can you uh, try to answer me this thing, which is, uh, do you think that we will be able to recover the pleasure of touching the books? I mean, uh, which is the difference between touching the books and not? I, I remember when I was a student, I was in Sevilla, and I had the opportunity to touch books from the 16th century. And uh, believe me, when you are smelling even what it is not possible to do by, by internet, uh, okay. the books, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's an incredible thing. On, only a, a curious question, nothing more. Meanwhile, okay. the other session is arriving. Mm. I think in the book, uh, reading the books continue in the future. Mm because um, um, is, um, is it different um, reading to um, books and reading um, pet, um, mobile phone uh, computer in it is different uh, pleasures and um, I think um, writing, book, uh, writing book is um, very important work. Yes, um, I think um, read, continue reading book. Okay, but uh, again, the, the change of the typologies, I think this is the important contribution from your side. I would like even to, to understand from the different uh, colleagues out of there, at the moment, you know, for example, Nardin is, I think, PDF books and online references can be available in a large amount online. But accessing the original Ancient book, which is sometimes just one, is quality. Well, Narmin, can you please uh, develop this uh, idea? It would be great. Um, actually, I mean, I have a tablet full of uh, books. It's something like, I don't know how many thousand books, PDF books. It's just PDF books because I love books. And I love carrying my tablet with myself, going traveling and uh, having so many books with myself. But one of our neighbors, our old neighbors gave me a book. It was written in uh, 19s, I think. Uh, a French book that is translated to Persian and it's just one, it's almost something like yellowish. And I think I am the only one who read it. It's another kind of pleasure. And I read it until four or 5 a.m. That book, the pleasure of touching that original book is something else, as you mentioned. In the library, sometimes you don't have access to some for example, historic or holy like Quran or uh, religious books, you cannot touch them. You cannot even access their, um, how can I say, their interior data because they are very tangible and that they care, they, they are in the museums or very special cares not to, um, the people don't, um, how can I say, vandalism or humidity or these, these things. But PDF books, you can have the scan of the same book in the internet and all the world can read it. That's some benefit. So we have some positive issues and some negatives. With the PDF and the scans, so many applications, you can just put your mobile phone on a uh, traditional or, for example, Italian book that I'm a very basic learner. And uh, the Google Translate translate that to for me to the English, so I understand what it says. But if I go to a museum and it is in the Latin or in a language that I don't know, I just um, stare at the manuscript and don't understand what it says. So the technology and the um, updating with the new applications and the, the new technology and science, it is always good and we have access to many books, sometimes even free. Uh, but again, the pleasure of touching that ancient old book that is just one and you have access, it's another kind of feeling. This is my personal opinion. I will come I to hope get it, dear 
Ms. Narmin, I will come to Tabriz, to your hometown, so to, I will <laughs> touch the that book as well. <laughs> So. <laughs> yes, I am, I am in Tabriz. I am in hometown. Miss you so much. Miss you both from uh, Cyprus. And I hope that after COVID, I travel all around the world. You can see from the background of my wall, that's the pictures of the historic buildings all around the world. That's the biggest wish of me to be able to uh, have a backpack and travel all around the world not 80 days, maybe 80 years or however. Thank you. Thank you, dear Dr. Naimi. Thank so, you. First of all, it's vicious. Uh, I think session, the other session, Dr. Shema and Dr. Tamir Fulat who are here. If you want to transfer, dear Professor Dr. Madrigal, if you would like to transfer the session to Dr. Shema and Fulat who come here, Yes, sure, sure. I, I don't know where is uh, uh, our no, colleague. Okay. It if, is not, okay. I, if not, I will continue. I don't have any problem. Dr. As Shema you is here. Dr. Shema is here. I, uh, ah, very good. Perfect. Thank you, dear Professor Matrigal. It was interesting uh, uh, contribution. We really appreciate that. Session, Arabic session is in session C. Professor Dr. Islam and uh, Salah uh, will be there. And now we are in session uh, A, continuing with Dr. Abdul Salam Shema, which uh, they get the responsibility of session J. Uh, thank you, dear Dr. Shema, uh, accepting our invitation. And Dr. Kamiar, uh, also, I would like to thank you. Uh, within a short notice, you accept our invitation. The floor is yours, so I'm going to mute myself. All right, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. It's good to uh, finally join you. I will be uh, sharing the session with my friend, Dr. Kamyar. Dr. Kamyar, can you hear me? Yes, I'm here, you broad and clear. I'm uh, very happy, I'm very glad to be here between all of you and especially with my colleague, Dr. Abdul Salam Shema, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank right, you thank also, you. Uh, Dr. Manuel. Dr. Jose, nice to meet you. When are you coming to Cyprus? So, you mean me? I will come. I will maybe very soon I will be the first with you. and. So, all right, thank you so much. Um, let me share the program so that we can have a little bit of a introduction. I hope you can see my screen, right? Yeah. All right, so the session that we'll be sharing, me and uh, Dr. Kamer, is uh, Architecture and technology slash behavioral studies. So this is a session that will be shared. And I wonder if we are going to have one, two, three, four. I think we're going to have five presentations, which three of them are we have the link, while two of them, if the authors are here, so when we are coming to them, they will we'll give them the opportunity to share their screen and present their, their work since they couldn't manage to submit the, the YouTube link. Dr. Karamir, I would like to start with you if you're going to say some few words about the, the topic, which is architecture and technology on the behavioral studies. If you have some few words that you would like to say, then uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you for this opportunity actually about the architecture technology today, especially in a last decade with the coming of this uh, parametrical design, we are now they will witnessing of how we are able to integrate the different technology with uh, architectural process and even the design process. Even actually, I'm just look just some of the title of this uh, 
presenter here and we have also other topic that it's very interesting now they how you are can integrate internet of the things with architecture and uh, in order to develop the a smart architecture more smart architecture and how you would able to actually control monitor your building in the in order to make it more sustainable and even its resiliency so we have actually lots of opportunity nowadays and i hope you are witness a good presentation during this session thank you all right thank you dr kamia actually this is a very interesting topic and this is a top this is a topic that is not uh, new actually you can trace this back to let's say industrial revolution because that's one of the moment one of the defining moments to find that uh, the integration of architecture with technology and i really like how behavioral studies came into it that means there is a psychology into it because at the end of the day it's all about perception and the uh, uh which is which can be subjective or objective depending on the circumstances so i think this is a very interesting topic so um since we started late we we'll just go straight to the point and we will keep uh, since we have a very small number of presentations so we we'll quickly go to the presentation after that then we can have a session of a general discussion with everyone okay so I would like to call the attention of Dr. Fatima Effect. Are you here? Yes, I'm here. All right, so I will end this and I'm gonna share your um, slides, okay? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Hi everyone, this is Fatma Ipekek, Assistant Professor at Yashar University, Department of Architecture. So I'm going to share my screen now so that we can watch your presentation. Can you see my screen? It is yes, clear. Yes, yes, yes. Thank right, you. So I hope you'll be able to hear. Today, I'm going to present my. Can you hear the? Hi, everyone. This is Fatma Pekik, Assistant Professor at Yashar University, Department of Architecture. Today, I'm going to present my article titled On Atmosphere as a Phenomenon in Architectural Aesthetics. So, first of all, I would like to begin with the argument of my study. The aesthetic perception of a special atmosphere is related to the sensory experience we have in that space. Although this experience is led by a multisensory understanding, the dominant sense is generally the sense of sight in architectural spaces. What's perceived and evaluated aesthetically by the data provided by the sense of sight comprises the composition of the spatial atmosphere in visual respect. In this visual rendition, composition principles as objective criteria play an important role in affecting the experiences aesthetically in the evaluation of space. So the aim was to compare and understand the relationships between architectural spaces and composition principles as objective atmosphere generators. In methodological respect, I made a literature review to provide a base for the analysis theoretically and a case study comprising the examples having visual organizations created by the composition principles of freedom, contrast, and unity in variety. The cases to discuss the visual qualities provided by these principles comprise Le Corbusier's Villa Stein, Ludwig Miss van der Rohe's Barcelona Pavilion, Mitchell Kobe's Down, and Carlos Carpa's Bryan Cemetery. In a certain space, within a certain period of uh, time, the interpretation of an individual 
about this very space as a result of the individual impressions depends on the procedures of mindful physical interaction between the space and the individual, says Gerald Berman. The effects of form, light, color, and visual texture play an important role in communicating with us through our sense of sight and thus in perceiving the genius, essence, or atmosphere of the space. The architectural space of modernism was designed to perceive, to be perceived dominantly by the sense of sight, which has dominated the consecutive tendencies through the century as well. Mihaly Palazma states in this discussion like that the dominant sense of vision figures strongly in the writings of the modernists. Le Corbusier's famous credo architecture is the masterly correct and magnificent play of masses for together in light unquestionably defines an architecture of the eye. Space talks to the experiencers by their senses, one of the layers of which refers to the visual capability. Creating an architectural form mainly comprises solid word scale and proportion plays, assisted by the changing and stimulating effects of light, color, and visual texture. But these plays cannot be set randomly. They require a very strong relationship network organized between them interactively with strict rules to facilitate the perception of those plays in a composition. Thus, we may claim that the visual composition of space is mainly led by plays with the principles such as rhythm, contrast, and unity in variety. At this point, the following questions may come to mind. Why are the composition principles used by the architects or why do we need to search for their use while trying to understand space? These questions are combined in the perspective recognized the discipline of architecture wholly or partially as an art branch, on the other hand. In terms of the analysis, uh, I may begin with Villerstein and rhythm relationship. Villerstein is the pure example of providing rhythm by utilizing regular geometries and straight lines, as also stated in Colin Rose's rendition comparing the Corbusier's villa with a manierist counterpart designed by Andrea Palladio. The facade geometric division in the vertical reading of Villerstein corresponds to a symmetrical rhythmic set comprising four, one, two, one, and four units of the whole composed of 12 units in total. In the horizontal direction, there is a symmetrical balance provided by another rhythm composed of four, two, four, two, and four units of the total length covering 16 units. By the help of these vertical and horizontal axes, we can establish a grid showing us the rhythm provided by the sub areas divided on the facade. As the second case in Miss van der Rohe's Barcelona Pavilion, we may figure out a relationship based on a contrasting play between architectural language, gestures, and visions. The play is a metaphoric dialogue between the building and the sculpture named Down, designed by Georg Kobe in the same year, to be placed on the water element of the pavilion, to be reflected lightly on the building while being a heavy stone sculpture. The concepts with opposite meanings, such as light, heavy, hard, soft, strong, weak, firm, brittle, and transparent, opaque, are expressed by the world of forms as different as possible from each other. The curves of the sculpture against the straight lines of the building, the organic form of the sculpture against the sharp planes of the building are at work. The down, on the other hand, uh, the, the, on the water and the building are personified as the headliners in this scenario in a strong figure and ground relationship regarding the gestalt. Originally made of heavy material stone, the down will encounter an image that rejects her weight when she looks at both surfaces, her reflection on the surfaces of glass and water in opposite directions, that is, the only likeness she has is of her own reflections. Is the third case, one of the impressive examples of the use of this uh, unity uh, and variety composition principle is Carlos Carpa's Brian symmetry. In the project, the variety is mainly provided by the changes in geometry and form of the sub elements, defining the space physically. And the unity can be found firstly in the selection of material, concrete, and therefore the sameness of the texture and color through the project. The repetition becomes another tool to bring unity in design as we can perceive some of these repeating elements by their circular and redundant geometries. The relationship between the concrete trace and water formed on a redundant line with intersecting circles leading us to the redundant tomb of the Brian couple and the terrace organization with the concrete curvilinear traces focusing us to the tomb is explicitly given in a geometrical intertwinement. 
The redundant and structural languages can also be found on the facade, which is also projected into the interior organization of the building. The circular openings serve as exterior and interior vistas, and the redundant straight lines frame the building. If I try to summarize the results that we may interfere from those analyses, we can claim that rhythm can be formalized as a system, systematic changes in the repetition of a spatial element. The changes can be given in size, location, position, form, geometry, texture, and color. Namely, when the principle of repetition merges with the principle of harmony and proportion, rhythm can be created and become legible as we see in Wittgenstein's great phase having rhythmic qualities. In contrast, the opposite or complementary perspectives, directions, light effects, colors, geometries, forms, and texture qualities lead us in display to understand the contrasting qualities in a symbiotic way. That is, to apprehend the existence of a feature, we need to need the apprehension of its opposite quality together with it. In the structure of this contrast, this symbiotic existence may create a specific narration with attention, which may increase the memorability of the space as we may also narrate the life of them in a relationship with Barcelona Pavilion. In unity and variety, while some of the features of a space are changing, at least one of these features should be repeated similarly and continuously to set a unified language to ease the comprehension of the whole. The relationship between the part and between the parts and the whole should be constructed in a balanced way to prevent a visual cacophony and randomness in the the uh, perceived qualities of design is perfectly achieved in the Bryan Cemetery. As a conclusion, we may assert that aesthetics is perceived by many contemporary architects as a notion having tension because of the subjectivity of the evaluation criteria and the intangible character of the term. Since modernism, the architects have tried, uh, have designed a new set of rules to provide a visual quality and legibility in their designs. This new rule, rule set has mainly depended on the new perception of space and the new architectural understanding based on the sense of sight. In this new understanding of spatial organization, the visual play has been provided by the composition principles guaranteed by the, geometri the geometrical formulations. In this way, the concept of space has become formalized and aesthetic perception of it has been transformed into a mechanized process based on a specific reading hierarchy. In the frame of this paper, I try to look at the effects of freedom, contrast, and unity in variety via the selected cases. So the visual qualities of spatial atmospheres, senses, or genie provided by the composition principles point out that there can be objective criteria in the aesthetic aspect of design. Comprehension of this objective side may release the architects from the burden of the subjectivity of aesthetics. Thank you very much for your listening. If you have some questions, I will be very happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Fatima. This is a very interesting uh, topic, which I personally like. So uh, we'll come back to, after we finish the presentations, we will get back to it and try to have a general uh, discussion about it. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, the next one I have there around is uh, Dilara Ertash and Ayesha Cyril. Are you here? Yes, we are here. All right, very good. Good to have you here. So you, um, you submitted your presentation. We have the link. So I'll try to open Thank the link. Okay. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. All right, very great. Yes. Uh, the boys. Hello, the title is Presentation okay. The Importance of Light in Stephen Hall's Perception of Form. Is the audio clear? Yes, everything fine. Yes, yes, yes. All right, very good. 
So I'll start it from the beginning. Hello, the title is Presentation The Importance of Light is Seven Host Perception of Form. Contents Introduction When the change of architectural form from past to present is examined, it is known that light affects the structure visually and functionally. The essence of seven host design is also daylight. Who uses daylight in his designs to create? create various environments according to the function of the space. In this study, it is aimed to examine the importance that Stephen Hoy gives to the effects of natural light in the perception of form. In this context, the functional and symbolic use of light, the perception of form and contribution of the sustainable effect of the light to the design are examined through three different museum structures of the effects of light on the formation of architectural form. Architectural form is the connection point between mass and space. Texture, color, material, change in shadow, and light are qualities that clearly express architectural form. Natural light affects design, space, affects design, space, space design, porosity, and structure with Seven hole and daylight. Based on experience in form and space design, seven hole uses light as an architectural element and material. Since experience is in, influenced by light, all attached great importance to the use of light. The diversity created by the light emerging at different times of the day in horse buildings creates different experiences. Hall thinks that the sunset must be seen, understand how the day passes in a building. As a result, he used three important basic principles when using seven horse daylight designs. These principles were used in the evolution of the sample structure. First, daylight usage. Second, uh, contribution of daylight to sustainability. Third, effects of daylight on form space perception. Uh, first, usage of daylight. Uh, Hall uses the ever changing qualities and special effects of natural light. Hall uses the direct light as functional and reflected natural light symbolically, symbolically in his design. Second, sustainability of light. Uh, Hall uses sunlight for heating in winter and cooling in summer in its structures. He benefits from the use of orientation and daylight in his designs. Third, perception of form space with the effects of, effects of light. Hold phenomenologically provides the experience in space with, with light. Light emerges as a factor that provides a sense of spatial depth and defines, defines the space. Hold thinks that the place exhibits poetic, poetic features. Uh, material and research method. In the study holds principles of using daylight, the way daylight is used, the contribution of daylight to sustainability and the effects of daylight on the perception of form space are investigated using three different museum structures. Location of museums. Kiasma Museum of Contemporary Arts, uh, located in the Hirt Hilt of Helsinki, the museum is the focal point of important buildings. The museum is located on a triangular island and extending to Tolevai, and it is part. In this area, the most important urban and architectural axis of the city intersect. This location has been effective in shaping the form of the building. Images of the museum. Daylight, daylight usage. Light has been used directly and indirectly in the space, both functionally and symbolically. Contribution of daylight to sustainability when the structure is located in an area where the light is low. It is aimed that the structure reflects the light and the daylight are constantly used by taking advantage of openness. 
effects of daylight on form space perception, and the sense of depth in the space and the definition of space are provided tonight. Uh, second Museum, National Museum of Arts. And the building, the block buildings are posi positioned on an on a long linear line on the eastern edge of the museum block in accordance with the, with the sloping nature of the site. Most of the space required for the block buildings was resolved underground. The new structure was designed with the idea of complementary contrast image of the museum. Daylight used. Uh, light has been designed indirectly into the space and it is used symbolically. Uh, contribution of daylight to sustainability, the air heated by the daylight is stored in the winter and thrown out in the summer. Effects of daylight on form space perception, the structure with the translucent glass layers of the building the galleries re receive uh, light from different angles and interact in the perception of the space. Next, third museum, Nancy and Beach Kingdom Museum. Uh, the building is at the center of important architectural landmarks, such as the Caroline Lee's Love Building, the Audrey John Speck Building, the Cullen Sculpture Garden, and the Glossal, of, Glossal School of Art image of the museum. Daylight use. Uh, light has been designed indirectly into space and it, it is used symbolically. Uh, contribution of the daylight to sustainability. Glass tubes on the face reduce solar energy by 70%. Uh, effects of daylight on firm space perception. A continuous and intuitive circulation space is provided by the light from the galleries and the canopy room. And findings, the data on use of daylight, the effects lights on sustainability and perception were chosen as the analysis principles in the study. Uh, exemplary structures were examined by considering these principles. According to, to the study, all uses daylight in various ways according to the location and needs of structure in his design. Or constantly take natural light from the um, roof or openings in place where daylight is low. The daylight also contribution to sustainability providing the heating and ventilation of the space, thinking, thinking that the perception of form and space depends on experience. Hall ensures that the effects of likewise the user circulation in the museum in, in his designs uh, that have changed over the years. It can be seen the, besides the effects of the light, it provides intuitive orientation in the space with the spatial fluidity of the light. As a result, the Museum of Con Contemporary Art, Kiasma, Nelson Nothings Art Museum, and Nancy and Rich Kingdom Museum are examined uh, within the scope of the study. Hall st studies. Stephen Hall took advantage of the light creating various effects on the horizontal and vertical and used it both in form the specially to create soft and colorful atmospheres. Well, usually, in direct benefits from the symbolic aspect of light in museum building, the importance Hall gave to daylight during the architectural profession, the change didn't change and became his most essential material. In addition to using daylight for illumination, Hall used is for the ventilation and heating cooling systems of the space. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, it is very interesting topic, the importance of the light with yes. Dilara Ertash and Aisha Sirel. Um, the next one is uh, an investigation of the impact of the built environment and human in the context of 
Androvoki's sense of coherence theory. Very interesting topic by uh, Gamdu Nokum Subari and Hilal Todulu. Are you here? I think they are not here, the, those two presenters. I think they are not here. Okay, so, and unfortunately, they didn't have a link, so, and they're not here to share it. So we move to the next one, which is uh, integrating sustainability and users demand in the retrofit of university campus in China. This is a research by Roy Chen. Chen and Li Chen and Payan Li. So this is a research by three authors and they did not submit the video also. So I'll ask if they're here so they can share their presentation with us. Are you guys here? I think Ruchi Chen uh, is yes. here. Yeah, um, yes, I'm here. And I send the YouTube link to you in the private channel. Have you received it? Yes, yes, I can see it now. Yes, so me... hey, you, you can use this uh, link. All right, thank you so much. I'm clicking on it now. Dear Chen, would you please also send to uh, to the text message of mine so I will be able to add to the program. Okay, I will send it to the uh, public chat channel and then you can see it. Thank you. All right, uh, Roy Chen, I'm going to show you a presentation now. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay. Can you see it? It's visible, right? Yes. All right. Hello, this is Guo Rui Chen from the School of Architecture, Tianyu University, China. I will report to you on the topic of integrating sustainability and user demands in the retrofit of university campus in China. Higher education should shoulder more responsibilities in sustainable development. In China, we started systematic construction of sustainable campus in 2007. China promises to achieve carbon peak in 2030 and carbon neutrality in 2060. A living campus is like a model city. This makes the sustainable development of campus have re has reference value for realizing this goal. The table here summarizes the campus sustainability assessment tool SAT from several countries. China also adapt, ad updated its own natural SAT of campus in 2019. The assessment, the assessment system of Green Campus, ASGC. In China, the old campus comes for the majority. Although the concept of sustainability has been applied in some of the new built campus, it is really applied in the retrofit of old campus. Although the campus retrofit is complex, it is valuable to playing the campus retrofit from an overall perspective. We need to consider both the current usage demands and the principles of sustainability. The relationship between these two is not clear. This study established a framework for campus green retrofit from several campuses in Tianjin region. The Weijing Road campus of Tianjin University was selected as a case to study the guiding effect of the framework on the campus retrofit. A campus built in the 1950s was recognized by the Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural Development of China as a pilot for the overall green retrofit in 2018. The figure shows the location and layout of the selected cases. We took six local campuses as an example. Combined with the UC demands and the sustainability principles from the National SAT, and established a framework for campus retrofit. We interviewed the campus administrators and the users groups to gather the demands and the problems in the campus usage. These pictures show our field work to identify these demands. And here, the demands were grouped into eight kinds, such as campus planning, building, 
style and function and the campus safety. We also experted in the contents about the campus trophy from the national SAT. There are 28 indicators related and are distributed from the three sections, planning with ecology, energy with resources and environment with health. In order to balance the sustainability goals and youth needs, we integrated the contents of youth, youth needs into a safety indicators. The principle of the integration is to merge indicators with the same retrofit content and retain indicators that will lead to different retrofit measures on both sides. This ensures that as many features of youth demand and sustainability principles as possible will cover in the framework. Next. An online questionnaire. Was organized to identify the weights of the indicators in the framework by the method of AHP. We assembled a team of 15 experts with experience in campus trophy to practice an online questionnaire. After two rounds of the questionnaire conducted later in July, 15 valid questionnaires were finally obtained, calculated, and contained. Then we apply the assessment tool to collect the willingness of the trophy in Wei Road Campus Central University. We monitored the average number of people on campus at each four hours for a week to choose the best time collecting the research data. Finally, 460 samples were returned, of which 432 were valid samples. The picture shows the basic situation of our respondents. In the weight of the retrofit points, the elements with the highest weight are energy, campus safety, followed by the indoor environment quality, campus water conservation, and campus planning. The highest percentage of important indicators were found in campus safety, indoor environment quality, building style and function, which show that users have a higher perception of specific issues under the relevant topics. The table shows the weight of elements of distribution in the framework. A table of all this data can be found in the appendix A of this paper. In the feedback, the score of ecology and the environmental protection is highest. The scores of campus construction, building style and function, and campus safety are relatively high. Use and the scores of energy and water are low. Users give positive feedback on the architectural styles of the campus, the safety of the building structure, the safety protection measures. They give negative feedback on the usage of underground space in the campus, electricity, safety, and heat waste in winter. The satisfaction score basically reflects the actual perception of the users on the campus. The overall score of campus safety is high, but some of the older buildings in the campus have aging electrical facilities and poor electrical safety with aging heating equipment and leaking pipe network. As the trophy focused much on reducing energy consumption, and due to the subjective differences in some users' perceptions, uh, perceptions of indoor environment in winter, the feedback on the waste heat and equipment energy efficiency on the campus is generally negative. The drainage of rainwater and sewage pipes in some areas of the campus makes the rain flood more serious in the rainy season. And you can find a table of all the user's feedback data in the appendix B of this paper. The feedback in Chinese National SAT provides the basis of analyzing the differences between campus usage and the sustainability principles. The differences between the contents, such as the layout of the campus facilities, building function, 
building structural safety and building appearance are not included in the ASGC. This situation is not only due to the differences in the orientation between sustainability principles and usage, but also related to the factor in older campuses and buildings. Older campuses buildings tend to have poor performance after their long operation. Although the energy indicators have a high weight in the framework, the feedback given by the users is more focused on comfort and less concern about the energy consumption and carbon emission. The sustainability principles concerned by the users also pays more attention to the health and the comfort of use, such as the poor heating in the winter and indoor noise. The early green building evaluation system focused more on economic factors. The SGC is closely related to the Chinese system standard for green buildings, the SGB. The first vision of SGC launched in 2013, adopted the model structure of land, water, material, and energy conservation from SGB. The 2019 update has changed this structure by thrift is still an important topic. The importance of thrift in the sustainability principles cannot be overstated, but the question is how to make it manifest in the demand of the campus users. Improving the clarity of information on the campus energy consumption is seen as a good way. The improvement of energy awareness can increase users' enthusiasm for energy saving, change some retrofit demand only from the perspective of comfort, can also raise users' awareness during using. Another aspect is reflected in the expressions about the content of sustainable campus evaluation indicators and users' demand compared with the assessment indicators, which has only some words. Users tend to express their demand in a more detailed way and more likely to get clear retrofit suggestion. To some extent, this differences explains that the leading factor of campus retrofit is used demand in China. The campus is like a small model city, which includes the community, workplace, natural landscapes, and the complex social and economic context. This makes it easier to complement repairs based on the use demand and uh, then systematic green retrofit. As correction to usage problems allow us to find typical solutions more easily. Similarly, some cities have introduced guidelines for green retrofit in urban areas to reduce the trial cost of the green retrofit in larger urban blocks. This may provide a good reference for the green retrofit of local campus. However, the status of campus of universities in terms of education and population needs to be considered. The purpose of this study is to inspect the difference between sustainability principles and user demands in campus retrofit by constructing the assistance tool of green retrofit of exiting campus. To achieve this goal, six old campus were surveyed to gather typical campus usage issues. We identified the indicators involved in the campus retrofit, in the campus retrofit, so combine the sustainability indicators and establish the scope and the characteristics of green retrofit through integration with users' demand. By calculating the weight and the case satisfaction. The difference between users' demand for campus retrofit and the sustainability principles was explained. This difference is reflected in the content and clarity. The differences in content may stem from the differences between sustainability idea and users' awareness. It reflects the resistance to green retrofit of established, established campuses due to complexity. We recommend improving the clarity of information on the campus energy and developing different local 
guidance, guidelines so as to improve users' awareness and reduce trial costs. That's all. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is a very comprehensive uh, research. Thank you. Going back to our Uh, yeah, it is last presentation, I think. Vernacular architecture implementation and shopping center building design in the city of Peckenborough. It's uh, done by uh, Tree Research, Veldi Eka Sapora, Mr. Rika Chairs, and Parilinduga Ravilinio. Are you here, guys? Is anyone among you here? I think they are not here. I try to find them from the participant link. Maybe we can just share. All right, let's share the presentation. Good day, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Today, uh, how are you? Today, we will present the uh, our topic regarding the Penacular Architecture Implementation on the Shopping Center Building Design in the City of Kanbaru in the Fifth International Conference of Contemporary Affairs in Architecture and Urban and Urbanism. My name is Vivaldi Ekar Saputra, and I have two colleagues here for as uh, my colleague in the research regarding this topic uh, is. Uh, Mrs. Rika Seris and Mr. Parlindungan Rapalinis. Uh, the civilization reflects as a culture and has its own time, binding, influencing, and developing according to human needs. So we have uh, uh, the topics in the Pekanbaru city and our hometown, Rio province in Indonesia. So generally, a civilization, uh, cultural heritage is passed down from generation to generation through oral written or action. Uh, for this uh, article, we would like to tell you all about the architecture. So this is the uh, seat, uh, this is the province of uh, Rio de Riau province. At the right, uh, we have a uh, Rumah Tuan Kadi is a, is a house that Sultan Sia often to, uh, to come to Pekanbaru. So the history of Pekanbaru begins with a small village called uh, Senaplan on the banks of the Sia River. It's uh, so close to the Singapore and Malaysia. So the the trade from the uh, West Sumatra, uh, North Sumatra, and uh, from the uh, Palembang, uh, they can trading uh, through the Pekanbaru. So uh, this is uh, our objects of the research. Uh, this study aims to find the extent of implementation of vernacular Rio Malay elements in modern design shopping centers building. So we started from the phenomena of architecture in Pekanbaru. So we know uh, many modern style of building uh, already standed in the, the city uh, since 2000. And uh, that last uh, presentation already said that there are more than a uh, shopping mall center is just like look like a uh, vernacular uh, architecture but uh, actually uh, more modern style so uh, the, element, uh, the elements uh, in Malay vernacular architecture in that building uh, seems like not a very well done uh, so this is uh, the one of uh, uh, object which we will uh, research in that building. And the next, we, we made it analyze, analyze 
purpose based. Uh, there are we from in the in the one in the first uh, step we try to look the what is the function of the building in the second the large size uh, of the building and the third the single or mass building and the fourth providing the high parking facilities so the three step of methodology of the shopping center has designed that are generally flexible and modern aiming to attract people to come and enjoy the facilities inside each building in the Petanburu city. So we try, we started from the uh, learn about the vernacular architecture. Vernacular architecture is a product of an evaluation process or self-correction, which is often associated with, but not confined mm, to mod houses and touch roof indeed far from the suggestion primitive from uh, design like key intelligence through that is was one provided we know the vernacular architecture is the very uh, human being yes something like that and vernacular architecture is identical of the locality. Vernacular architecture explore the character of the environment according to the needs of residents. Yes, gotcha. uh, this is continued. We continued the real Malay traditional houses. They use wood, actually, and the primary material and has several building elements in general as follow. We see, we can see the structure of the floor uh, from wood actually and they have the rectangular shape of the window and also there are carving inside and the color of the carving has the philosophy implication also of the vernacular architecture they have also the elements of traditional Rio Malay houses we have three types of the houses uh, so many uh, Types, types of the traditional houses of Rio. Uh, we can say that uh, this is the primary uh, type of the traditional Rio Malay house. Yeah, according to this table, this mostly uh, the building in uh, shopping center, but, uh, sorry, the design of the shopping center in Pekanbaru City, the building is the base kit, yeah, because they, most of them there is a staircase. Yeah. Even the stair is not much higher, but at least this can represent the part of the Malay architecture. Okay. And then for the roof, yes, it is the, because it is the huge building and then to place the gable roof, it is a problem. Yeah. So mostly the building, uh, they use the flat roof because of the flat roof, they can use, uh, they can place the building services uh, equipment. For the exterior wall, it is perpendicular, all of them. And the steps, it is the step regarding the stairs, it is more than five mostly. Okay. And then regarding the entrance door, it is also reflect the Malay architecture, where the Malay architecture door, they use the rectangle door shape. Okay. Maybe a few of them use the arch. For the window, it is same as the Malay architecture as well and then for the ornament uh yes this is the ornament this is more significant part okay in this in the building design or in the building appearance uh most of them is use the ornaments then they choose the uh, flora okay flora and then few of them choose the fauna as well for the color yes most of the color they present uh, the color of, of the malay architecture yeah, as mentioned of, uh, by Mrs. Rika, uh, Rika before, there's, there is a white color, blue color, green color, yellow, and so on. Okay, so we can conclude that this, uh, the appearance of the building design of the center buildings in Baru City is they represent uh, the local architecture or the, the local Malay architecture sense. Okay, next we go to the discussion. <clears throat> so this is 
how we combine between uh, how they combine between the Malay architecture vernacular and then the uh, modern architecture. This should be because they are shopping center. So then the, most of the building is by private private sector. So they will talking about the efficiency. Yeah, talking about the cost and then then how to effective to implement the the ornament yeah, into the building. Okay. But we have to take consideration that several things yeah, regarding implementation of the architecture elements in the, especially the vernacular architecture elements into the modern building design. Number one is, is talking about the scale or the size of the building. Okay? It is we have to, as, as uh, what the designer have to take care about this one regarding the, the proportion or implementation of the size of the ornament into the, into the building facade. Number two is uh, we recommend or we uh, we suggest that should be use the original form of the vernacular ornaments. Okay? And number three, it is should be follow the the local or the cultural value. Yes, because what we see now it is. Some of the building is lack of understanding about the local value, uh, culture value. So it just can create the shallowing of the culture value uh, of Malay architecture itself. Then the last is, it is talking about the finishing material. Most of them use the modern material, not same as the, the uh, vernacular material where they use wood, but in, in this building, in the, in the design of the modern building shopping center, they, they mostly they use the GFRC or they use a concrete. Okay. And then this will be direct to neo architecture approach yeah, in the building design. So finally, uh, we conclude that the development of human civilization effect of the development of architecture, okay, because the architecture is very close to the human activities or human sense. And then the vernacular architecture is related to the local context, yeah, especially the environment, geography, okay, and then maybe the habits yeah, of the local people. And the architecture is go and develop from the local condition. And they're still simple using simple and sustainable technology for several generations. And we see the form of the uh, vernacular architecture, the form is the rough, okay, because it depends on the technology at the time, okay, depend on the local technology, yeah, based on how much they uh, innovate, yeah, this technology growing up depends on their needs. And then without we realize that the design of the commercial building in Pekanbaru City as well as the concept of Malay architecture. With using the neo uh, vernacular approach, okay. But unfortunately, this is the lack of understanding of the designer, okay, the local designer regarding the local value or the vernacular value. So this is need more research regarding this one by academics or by professionally, yeah, regarding the development of uh, vernacular architecture, especially in the Rio Malay architecture in the modern context. Okay, and then the last is not least, this, yeah, this part is very important part is where the government, yeah, the local government just do the generalized, the value or the shape of the uh, real Malay architecture and then make this part become more shallowy. Okay, and then this is also need the cooperation between the all stakeholders, yeah, in the Rio, in the Rio province regarding the development of the Rio Malay architecture. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, it is very comprehensive. The study of vernacular architecture implementation on shopping center building design in the city of Tecanapura. It's Mother's Day in Mexico. All right, thank you so much. I think this is the last uh, presentation for this uh, session. Exactly. And unfortunately, the last one, they were not around. Anyway, we have the first one from Fatima. We have the second one from two academicians, Lara and Aisha. We have the third one from also two academicians. 
uh, Gamzi and Hilal. Then we had the one from Gurnai uh, Chen, which there it was three of them. Then the last one, which they are not here. So this is the time that we are going to have a final round table where we are going to have some questions and answers, some discussions. So is there anyone that would like to start? Any question, any comment, suggestion? Other presenters here? I think yes, we have yeah, some of I'm them. Here. I'm just listening to you. Yeah. All right. So is there anybody from the audience? Anyone with some questions? All right. Um, I have some few comments for the first one, which was very interesting. It was on atmosphere as a phenomenon in architectural aesthetics, uh, which you concentrated very much on the, the aesthetics experience, which is very important. But I wanted to ask, because you made mention of uh, Palasma, right? Yes, exactly. So I wanted to ask maybe some uh, clarification. Palasma, I know him, he was uh, working very much on aesthetics, especially in relationship to aura. You know what's aura, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So in Benjamin Sanz. Exactly. So is there any relationship between this aesthetic experience that you're talking about and the aura that Palasma was uh, emphasizing on? Is there any relationship you think between them? Because I, I really like the topic. It's very interesting about the aesthetic experience, which is something that we are completely neglecting now. We are too much. And this is, I like the fact that you went back to modernism. Okay, mm -hmm. which that was the very defining moment that discarded everything about, let's say, ornaments, which was considered as part of the aesthetics. Mm -hmm. and that was the defining moment that uh, we started to understand that aesthetic is not only about ornamentation, yeah. which very much makes me love the article of Adam Blues, Ornament and Crime. Mm -hmm. Ornament and Crime, yes. Around 1952, he, he published that. But my question here is, is there any relationship between the aura of Palasma was emphasizing on which the aesthetic experience you are talking about in terms of the atmosphere? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Actually, in terms of the phenomenological reading by Palasma and Gernot Böhmann, even we may also just consider Peter Zumthor's viewpoint. Actually, it is the same. I mean, they are the same. In Walter Benjamin's sense, Walter Benjamin directly uses that keyword, I mean, aura instead of atmosphere. And then they declare that, I mean, Gernot Böhmann, Palasma, Johanny Palasma declare that it is the same. I mean, we are experiencing the spatial atmosphere by our uh, senses, but it is actually the same that we have I mean, in terms of aura. Aura, but however, yes, I mean, I, I totally understand that there is also something, I mean, kind of a layer, a kind of emotional layer in aura too, uh, but atmosphere, um, it is a, a bit more an um, objective in, in Gernot Böhme's sense, but in Palasma's sense, actually, it also has something emotional behind, so that aura awesome. also uh, actually, I mean, has that emotional layer I mean, personal, subjective something, we may also just find that kind of thing in aura, but actually they are using these two keywords, uh, I mean, as the same thing. So uh, atmosphere means aura and aura and atmosphere mean a sensory experience that we have in space aesthetically, which is, I mean, totally the same with aesthetic, the meaning of aesthetic, because as you already just mentioned that, I mean, it's not ornamentation, it's not only something visual, all of the senses, the multi-sensory multi feeling is important in space, but with modernism, it changed a lot. I mean, we just concentrated much more on 
the eye-based architecture, but now we are just striving for returning back to that kind of multi-sensory experience in space, which means totally aesthetic itself for today's understanding of aesthetics. By the way, in 18th century, in the 18th century, we have something totally different, as you know, in something much more philosophical and related with the judgment of beauty and sublime qualities. So it's all different than today's understanding of sensory experience, which is connected directly to aesthetic and aura concepts. So thank you very much. Thank you too. This made, this made me have another thing because you made mention of Peter Zumto. Peter Zumto techni technically is a minimalist. Yeah. And in terms of his minimalism, he's always concentrating about this aesthetic experience that I'm mm -hmm. in. Uh, many buildings that we did that says much about it in, in terms of and much experience. So this actually concretizes that there is aesthetic experience even in minimalism, which is considered to be a minimalist yeah. approach. So this is very important. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you too. Any is there anybody that uh, have question about the first presentation or comments? All right, thank you so much. Um, also, the second one is really interesting. As I said, this is a very interesting topic uh, category for me. The second presentation was uh, by Dilara and Aisha. Are you guys here? Are you available here? Yeah, they are here, I think. Yes, yes, I'm here. All right. I wanted to ask something you were you were talking about Stephen Hall right yes and in Stephen Hall you chose three case studies which you analyze based on the uh, light right it's your presentation that talks about that right yes exactly so I wanted to ask did, did you come across anything called spatial temporal experience could you ask it again, please? Did you come any across something? Because this is much of uh, related to most of the designs of uh, Stephen Hall. Spatial temporal experience. Actually, interestingly, the first presentation and the second one, I found them very much interesting and very much related to some extent in terms of the aesthetic experience, phenomenology, and uh, so on. So I just wanted to know, did you have uh, any, did you find any relationship between what you analyze and the spatial temporal experience based on Stephen, Stephen Hall approach or designs? I think there are some, technical uh, issues. Anyway, um, that is my point about it. And the last one, which was by uh, Chen. Right, Chen, are you, uh, are you still with us? I have one question yes, also about I'm the second here. presentation. By the way, I can post it to the back. Which one? For a second presentation about the lighting. Yes, and I think they have some technical issues, so they are not here to join the discussion. Anyway, we can keep it for the end if they are here. Yes. Um, Great, Chen, thank you so much for your presentation. I really love the methodology, especially the part that you are applying the uh, AHP is really important because that means you concentrated much on uh, part of... Um, Actually, uh, I am here. I'm just listening to you, but yes, there is a problem. There's a technical problem, so I cannot hear you so much. I'm sorry right, for that. Don't worry, no problem. We'll come back to you, okay? Thank you. All right. Gurey Chan, are you still with us? Yes, I'm here. Okay, I wanted to... Uh, I really enjoy your presentation, especially the <clears throat> methodology part. You took your time, go through this rigorous process 
using AHP as an uh, analytical tool so that you understand the hierarchy in it. But I have one suggestion that, uh, I mean, okay, let's leave it to a suggestion. Do, do, uh, are you familiar with the, let's say, concept or approach of biophilia? Sorry, could you repeat your question? I, I think I maybe have some problem with the network, or yeah, I cannot I can. hear you very clearly. Yeah, I can. I can. I can hear that from your voice. I said, are you familiar with the concept of biophilia, biophilic design? Design. I'm sorry. Uh, perhaps uh, not very, not not very familiar with the English word. Maybe in Chinese, there is some other vocabulary about it. It's, it's, it's actually a concept which is developed in terms of the, let's say, ecology. In ecology, architecture. Yes, in terms of ecology. Yes, 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 yes. So this is, I think one of the pioneers is one Brazilian professor. She worked on it and made it this, very old, but recently she worked on it around 2014 and made a very good publication about it and as part of her ongoing research, which is very interesting. I found that also interesting because under my appealing design approach, there are three categories. And those three categories combinedly they have 14 patterns. So those patterns can as well be as indicators. But I think it would be very interesting also if you can look at those campuses that you analyze in a relationship to these three categories, 14 patterns. I think this is interesting because it pretty much deals with environment as a whole itself. So it's, this is just my suggestion to you because you have a very good methodology. I think exploring it with another perspective, especially by appealing design, would be very interesting. Okay. Okay, thank you, sir. Right. I have also thank one you. suggestion for you. Actually, not a suggestion, it's a question about the methodology part. As uh, you use the questionnaire survey, as far as I understand, is it right? Yes. So I want to know that what is your assessment criteria? You are also talking about the uh, thermal comfort or thermal energy inside the campus, you are criticized some of the building as far as I uh, get from your presentation. Is it based on the questionnaire outcome or you have also tools for assessment of those things? Uh, yes, I think uh, we have an uh, assessment for, for it. Uh, first of all, I think your question is quite really good uh, because the assessment of the situation, the current situation of the old campus is very important, and uh, we and uh, we and and we I, and the concept of our idea in this research is to uh, you know the uh, sustainability, the sustainable principles in the standard or the assessment tool. Uh, has a gap between the usage demand in the campus. So we want to research on the gap and have a generating framework based on the indicators of from the, uh, partly from the uh, SAT tool uh, by the national government. And another we from the uh, investigation and the interview in the some typically campus in Tianjin region. So the indicators uh, partly is given by the government or the research institutions and partly we get from our research, our field research and interview. Uh, another question is about the uh, current situation of the old buildings and the old campus. Uh, I think the old buildings, old, old campus in China is a common uh, is a common situation for almost every old campus because such as the energy energy consumption 
consumption and the waste of the water, waste of the uh, heat in the winter, uh, it's almost everywhere in China. It may be the differences between the research or uh, research, uh, research or the literature base uh, between the China and other countries. In China, it's a problem, and almost I can say, uh, no one can, uh, no one will say, no one will disagree with it, because we have too many old campus built in the. Uh, built in the 19s, uh, built in the 1960s or 1950s. At that time, we used the Soviet standard to build this building, and this bu and the quality of this building is quietly poor. I understand your concern. Thank you about your answer. But still, I'm uh, going to emphasize. Actually, there is an article I'm also work in the campus. But I'm, uh, I have another approach. I'm just monitoring how the uh, thermal impact or how is the energy efficiency of the campus. Maybe I can share it with you and you can get some idea about it. Thank you, by the way. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, Dr. Kamer, I think you can proceed with your question that you wanted to ask. Lara and Aisha, I think they are available now. Are you available? Yes, I'm here. I can answer your question. All right. If you permit me, yeah. Stephen Hall took advantages, advantages of the light, creating various effects on the horizontal and vertical, and used it both in form and spatially to create soft and colorful atmosphere. So, and also I really like Stephen Hall's works and, uh, and his perspective. There isn't any op uh, opposite opinion of my perspective for him. He used the daylight symbolically, and this is really nice for the uh, future and uh, also for today. And this is really effective and sustainability for the future also. And I think Stephen Hall affects me for my architectural life for the future. And also the last thing, I hope I can also use the daylight symbolically uh, in my architecture. Thank you. I Thank you so much. I think this is uh, Stephen Hall is a very interesting figure as an architect, and he did not only use the light symbolically. I believe he approached philosophically in terms of the spatial experience. So, what the only discrepancy that I found in your presentation, or the only question I have, is. As I also showed in my presentation, yes, exactly. He is not using only symbolically. As you told, yes, he used symbolism yes. and philosophy also. But I, I still I have some doubt about those, how he used light in terms of the ventilation that you talked about. You talked about ventilation, you talked about uh, cooling mm -hmm. and heat which I have a very, uh, I have a question mark about it because Stephen Hall is somebody that is too much into, let's say, philosophy to some extent on Tyler. If you are familiar with the work of, let's say, Tadao Andu, to some extent, they share a common uh, approach toward the use of light because Tadao Andu also used light, especially when he was designing churches. And how he how he bring the light when you relate it with the with the Christian religion and the, uh, the appearance of, of Jesus. What is the special temporary experience I was talking about? And this is exactly the same thing to what he is doing because he wants you to have an experience, not only seeing the arts or the exhibition of the museum. No, the museum itself it has it is an object of exhibition and it is an object of special exp uh, experience so this is my only concern and he's a very good architect and you did a very wonderful research thank you so much thank you so much to you it was very nice for me actually yeah. i want to ask same question that uh, dr shima asked I'm going to tell you how you are considered this opening with uh, your mention about the heating and cooling element. 
you somewhere talk about it and the uh, air circulation. So how did you judge those things in comparison with the, uh, because the works that you consider is, I think too much uh, in a philosophical and uh, qualitative border, but the things that you explain is uh, something in other side. This is the same thing that I'm going to ask, which I think you somehow get it. As I understand, the hole uses sunlight for heating in winter and cooling in summer in its, in, in, in its structures. He benefits from the use of orientation and the daylight in his designs. Daylight is preferred in the museum structures to save the energy. Hall prefers lighting that distributes the light indirectly to the whole space homogeneously. Thank you, Thank you. so much. So, please, anyone with a question, comments, or suggestion? We have been talking. Namin Hoja, do you have any question? No, I think everything clear. I don't have any other question. All right, so I think this is the last uh, um, item on the agenda that we are doing for today. Then thank you, I'll thank you, dear Dr. Shima. I think you win uh, your session with the marathon. Uh, you are the, uh, the the last session that have we haven't finished yet. The other sessions B and C. They have finished, so you are the winner of the marathon of more than 12 hours. Uh, since morning, you, you are all uh, live with us. I really appreciate your valuable contribution. It was perfect indeed. Uh, the, even the, the last four one in your presentation, uh, I was, uh, I'm sure that even in master degree or bachelor degree, we have such a kind of uh, research studies. We have been expecting by the time that we, they, we uh, get their PhD, they will be real, uh, let's say, contributors to the academia. So I would like it's to thank nice them. Nice. Yeah. I would like to also thank their, uh, let's say, supervisors that they managed to develop such a kind of, uh, let's say, uh, to show such kind of ways or methodologies to them. I really appreciate and thanks them. And thank you for all of your amazing works. I, Dr. Kamir Fulatlu, I really appreciate uh, accepting our invitation to join. You're welcome. So it's my pleasure. We, tomorrow or the morning, we will continue with the great keynote speech that we have in the morning at 9. So it's to Dr. Shema, thank you for your valuable contrib uh, contribution. Your first question, since I, I thought that you were asking from other colleagues, I couldn't manage to reply to you. I will try to be in Cyprus very soon. Let's see. Uh, maybe very soon uh, I will be with you. Uh, we will yeah, yeah. In our reunion, our friendship for sure. All right, no problem. We are here waiting for you. Thank yes, you. we are here waiting for you. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thank you so you much. Have been, thank you. So please take care of yourself and see you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. See you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Have a good day. See you.